Hello and welcome, sir. How are you doing? How are you doing, Satan? <laughs> How's life? <laughs> oh, you know, it's very, it's just nice here in hell. Uh, the uh, the coronavirus <laughs> doesn't uh, doesn't exist here. It's fine. It Everything's evaporates good. before it could get down there. It just yeah. sizzles. Although, although all the all the toilet paper down here is used already, so uh... it's, that's one downfall. But uh, everything else is doing fine. Just uh, working on my comic. If we, uh, I don't think I mentioned on EFAT, but I have a comic out. Uh, Doctor Alpha in Doctor Alpha Miracle Child. On Indiegogo, it's still available. It has something actually big coming on that on that front. So if you uh, uh, if you give me a link, that'll be in the top of the description. If you want, just to oh, sure. Just give me a second here. Check that shizzle out. What's uh? What can you what can you tell people about it? What's uh? What's oh, the hype? It. Oh, it's uh, well. Uh, the uh, the blurb is Doctor Alpha is one of the most dangerous uh, supervillains in the galaxy, but only one of them. So it's a uh, it's kind of it's going in the veins of. Uh, Alan Moore's Killing Joke. It was really inspired by the Killing Joke. Mm -hmm. uh, it's and I'm a big fan of Alan Moore, big fan of Neil Gaiman, and specifically uh, Garth Ennis and Frank Miller. So it's kind of a mix of all those, but it's kind of putting a the perspective of a superhero world in from the perspective of a supervillain, and it's about it has a lot of twists and turns. It was made with a pulp fiction formula, not the movie, mm -hmm. but the actual <laughs> the genre. Of writing so i used an old pulp fiction formula to write it people said it was really good and i also have another comic out that came free if you sign up for this one uh the lady midnight christmas special it came out around january <laughs> a little late but uh, as soon as this other thing lands for dr alpha this next new project this next new installment in it i'll release uh, a new link so that everyone who backed it can have uh, a read through of lady midnight the jolly goodbye it's 10 pages long Oh, there you go. It's awesome, and it's really awesome that you're uh, you're creating stuff like that. You, uh, how do you find the split between that and sort of uh, YouTube videos and stuff? It's pretty tough. Mm. But... <laughs> well, but, you um, got more in indoor time now, right? <laughs> A lot oh of yeah, people seem oh, yeah. To... Especially now, especially now. But fortunately for me, I'm just the writer on it. I'm not the artist on it. So ah. uh, my job was to finish the script, which I did, and uh, now the art is being produced. It's good. It's good. Huh. Excellent artist. Um. Yeah, sp uh, and, and speaking of which, I feel like, I don't know, per, per whatever EFAB, I should probably just casually mention, like, yes, we're aware of uh, the coronavirus thing that's happening. Um, <laughs> be careful, I guess, everybody. Stock up on that toilet hand. paper, but maybe, <laughs> you know, not too much. <laughs> they need to open a toilet paper store, that's it. Like, that's all they sell. <laughs> just have it connected to the warehouse and it just drops in silent. I saw this, um, this like, video, I don't know if you've seen it, it was on Twitter, where... Um, these people bring out a pallet of uh, toilet paper, <laughs> and these pe these other customers just run up to it, start ripping it apart, grabbing all the time. <laughs> I think I saw that, and I saw people fighting over this stuff. They put I in mean, zombie they... sounds, and it was perfect. <laughs> I mean, here in America, it gets crazy. I mean, we had people stabbing each other over chicken sandwiches at Popeyes. So you can only imagine how uh, violent it could get over toilet paper. <laughs> you, to... you ever eat the chicken sandwich, now you need the toilet paper to finish it off. Resort to leaves, you know? Gosh. What, what, what are things coming to? That's too pedestrian. You can't use leaves. Come well, on. just have a, have a, have the kind of diet that gives you, what, what do they call them? Like phantom poops or ghost poops where they just <laughs> they just plop right out and you didn't even notice. It's just like, oh, nice. There you go. That's the solution. No need for toilet paper. Well, I mean, if you've got loads of clothes, you know, you're going to have to sacrifice a couple <laughs> of them, I guess. That's that's where we're at now. Society crumbles. So, man, we're down to the Versace. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing what what magazines is probably the first thing people would go to, right? I guess. But yeah, you'll be from what I understand. There's plenty of toilet paper in warehouses, and they just need to get them to the stores. That's all. Yeah, it's to be delivered. Yeah. So don't start using your issues of People magazine or Mad magazine, or you can use the you can use the Inquirer, I guess, but uh, save the other ones. Um, do you know anybody who uh, has it yet? Um, that's becoming a thing now. It's like, does anyone know anyone yet? Uh, as far as I'm aware, none of my friends or family have it yet. Me neither. I'm not that famous yet. I'm yeah, that we, need to get, we need to expand the network. <laughs> yeah. Have any YouTubers <laughs> of, of some fame, have any of them gone down with it yet? I'm pretty sure if they have, they would make endless videos about it. Yeah. They have like an endless stream about it, because that's how you get money now. <laughs> you could say, I have the coronavirus, and then you get uh, that gets you top billing. Oh, that, speaking of top billy, like the amount of coronavirus films that'll come out in years from now, <laughs> gonna be 
just these horror films where like it'll have that green like CGI effect on someone's hand and then they touch a wall and it stays there, and oh, some yeah. other guy rests against it and it goes <laughs> on him and then he's like he hugs his baby and it's like dun dun and then the intro goes plays. to the baby. Have you ever read uh, Max Brooks's uh, World War Z? No, I've seen, I saw the film. <laughs> I, I just thought it was it was kind of uh, ironic that because the the zombie virus in World War Z starts in China too. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing over there, China? Ch yeah. Max Brooks predicted this years ahead of time. Well, there's and... that there's that weird theory that's like, was was it a was it a weapon? Was it a weapon that yeah, was prematurely released? Like, I, I doubt it. <laughs> But uh, because they had to, apparently they had a, like a, some sort of lab there in Wuhan. Mm. That's where the, the thing originated. I tell you what, it's a good time to be a Martian. I'll, I'll say that they are laughing at us right now. Like, ha, <laughs> not getting over here. They got plenty of toilet paper. Yeah, first they send us soy. Now they send us uh, <laughs> the coronavirus. Thanks, Martians. Imagine that. Like you know how they said those little like capsules or whatever into space filled with like pieces of human culture and stuff. Imagine they just threw the coronavirus in there. They're just like, oh, you know, give give them a bit of uh, a bit of the human experience. <laughs> Aliens are like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, infects the whole planet. All of humanity is in there now. Yes, the, the good and the bad. Yeah, we had to. You know, it's it's thematically <laughs> relevant. We have to tell them about our our, our hills and valleys. <laughs> Throw like a bloody kitchen knife in there. <laughs> They're like, okay. I, I heard recently that uh, you you and I and many others are having a video made about them from the wonderful Patricia Taxon. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was told, though, that I don't actually appear in the video. She just stole my artwork to make the thumbnail. So <laughs> I'm on the video. I guess. I mean, you know, putting Satan on your thumbnail, not bad. Yeah. So, I mean, people can... Hey, look, this looks good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think the, uh, the theory right now going is that it's going to... Um, uh, you know, put put the um put the lid on objectivity. Stop us yeah, so, naughty boys from talking about it. So everyone out there who will who will listen to this in the future, uh, our our time our our time on YouTube is done. Our days are numbered. Uh, Patricia Paxson. Will it's be pretty funny because we both look like villainous characters, though. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> just cackling about objectivity. <laughs> um, if. Something was to be proven about whether or not the categorization of objectivity uh, is false or not. The fundamental that I, I think is relevant here would be that our arguments are all still there. So if they appeal to the individual, they would still be completely sound. As right. In, I mean, regardless of what whether, what connections or what uh, conclusions uh, Patricia Paxton's or Tax, whatever her name is, mm -hmm. uh, whatever conclusions she comes to in that video, uh, that doesn't take away the work that is out there already, the videos that we've made already. So. We, because I know this is true in your videos, and I try to make it true in mine. But that we uh, we put forth a premise, and then we put forth assertions, and then we put forth examples to bo boost those assertions, and those are, those create arguments. And people can look at those arguments, and they can say, "Well, that's not that doesn't fit. I don't agree with those." Or they can mm. say, "I agree with those." So it doesn't matter what label you put on these arguments, or what label you put on our uh, a final uh, mentality that sent us to make these arguments. What matters is. Are these arguments fitting to you? These do these arguments make sense to you? These arguments and, now seem and, real to you or not? And they become much more effective once you find out the individual's position on on the t the content. So, for example, I get just right into a position where he he like he, he essentially agrees tacitly that Holdo is a bit stupid, and um, <laughs> the 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 killer argument for that one is when Poe discovers the transports they're all being fueled and people are going into them. So telling him the plan at that point is no different if you're concerned about him leaking it than it is now. He can leak that regardless, you know? He can leak the fact that you've got transports that are about to leave. So yeah. tell him the plan anyway. Like, if you're really concerned about him being a mole, which, by the way, she's not. There's just no indication of that whatsoever. But let's just say you are. Um, she decides to let everybody die so that he can't find out about Crate. <laughs> like, you can't wrestle out of that one. That's just her being utterly ridiculous. And so, like he said, that didn't bother him. You know, that element. But the thing is, when you look at their own work, like he uses that as the crux of his argument mm -hmm. for Poe's arc. Like his being wrongness and his fuck up with the um, leaking information relies on Holdo not telling him the plan. So if your thesis requires that piece to make sense, and it doesn't, it should then, you know, change your outcome, right? Like your own thesis. Right. So sometimes but you need that's... to find out what these people's positions even are, rather than just pointing out how these things are silly, and they, you know, because instead they just go, oh, I, I don't care about it. And you're like, okay. 
But then you find out later, it's like, oh, you did care about it, though. You do care about this a lot. You're just telling me that now because you know it doesn't make sense. You, you don't want to be proven. You don't want to be wrong. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to have this assertion and then you'll be wrong. You just like the movie. Okay. It's not just, they're not trying to put forth some sort of philosophy. They just really like The, the Last Jedi. Which is they fine. They really like the movie. It's fine. Go ahead and like it. It's very, it's, it's a, it's yeah, action. Like. Well, not really action packed. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of visuals. <laughs> there's a lot of, it, it has stuff in it. There's things happen. There's uh, the lightsaber <laughs> clashes at one point. It may be a wonky dream, but it does, it counts. That's it's a always. series of events. It certainly <laughs> is a series of events that they, that happen, that take place next to each other. Um, but yeah, so that'll be interesting to check out. I'm guessing you guys would cover that one on your, um, I guess possibly, is it? Uh, you and Smugboy? Yeah, probably. But I've been told that she's been tr this, uh, been trying to do this stuff, and uh, I'm not sure she did one on Jack Saint or Jack made one on me, and uh, Patricia cameoed for about I think a ten minute segment inside it. Is that why you're you're gone from YouTube? Is that why? You're yeah, I was I was killed, expunged. <laughs> they are. Uh, one of the things that makes me makes me laugh is the uh, so in my Black Panther video I question uh, why he's called Black Panther in the first place, and uh, they find that one like. The, the peak of Nick Pickery. And I was like, oh man, I'd love to like just just have them uh, in a conversation for that one point. I'd be like, so do you know why he's called Iron Man? It's like, he, they, they comment on it in the film. I think he says it's an inaccurate name. It's just the one that the press sort of apply after they see a man made of metal. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Captain America, he's like this patriotic cartoon hero. He, he absorbs that personality and then actually fights and just owns the name. <laughs> and then shortens to Cap. You're like, okay. Um, Captain Marvel had this problem. I don't know if you saw that movie, but um, she's... no, I, still, I I saw the previews of that movie and the trailers of the movie. It, unless unless I can use it, I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> they couldn't. Um, they screwed it up. So she her original job was like a pilot. She was a captain. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, I'm following. Then her boss was called Marvel. Like that was the name, Marvel. And uh, <laughs> this is getting lazy. Uh, at the end of the film, when she gets her, like, you know, huge second wind and wins wins the whole thing, she refers to it, she says, I am Carol. It's really funny. But, uh, mm -hmm. not Captain Marvel or anything. And so you're supposed to assume she pulled the name Marvel, made it Marvel, and then she retains the rank from, like, years ago when she was a part of the Air Force? Mm -hmm. Like, I was really confused. I was like, why is she called Captain Marvel? Like, that doesn't <laughs> follow. And same for Black Panther, right? You're like, oh... Well, he's wearing a Black Panther suit, so he's called Black Panther, and it's like, yeah, 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 I'm I'm rolling back further than that. Why is it a Black Panther suit? Why? He just has the Black Panther suit. And yeah, and I know that people are like, well, did you need to know? It's like, I guess not really, but it's still pretty funny that he's like the only one outside of Captain Marvel that they managed to fuck this up on. It's not hard. Yeah, actually a pretty good question. I mean, they could have uh, brought in some sort of like legend or something. Like well, they had, legendary Black Panther. they had an opportunity. They, they, their god was... Bast, I think, the, the panther oh, yeah. god or something, but they never make the connection. They're just like, <laughs> panther god uh, is, I'm not even sure if, it's very confusing, I have to watch it again, but it's like the comet brought the vibranium that infected a plant that they ate and became superhumans. Also, they managed to weave the vibranium into this suit, and they based the look of the suit after a panther, I guess. But I guess, that's the part that I wanted in the film, it's just like, of course, the design was based after bust then I, I i would assume it's like why isn't that in there and that's just a casual question i'm just like why why didn't you include the part where he's called black panther and they all find it like hilarious as a criticism but i'm just like i don't know <laughs> like, <laughs> it makes sense to me but yeah fine uh, annihilated that's the thing i don't mind uh, fucking things up i point out my own fuck ups kind of regularly <laughs> I get, one of the ones that still blows my mind is that um Black Panther starts in, it's like, it's like a flashback thing. I think, it, I'm probably going to get this wrong again, but I think it's 1997, mm -hmm. or 1992, and I called it 1977. <laughs> so that makes everybody, like, significantly older, if that was the truth. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. And that's the thing, it's fine. Oh, yeah, it happens all the time, yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to get some stuff wrong today. Um, which, obviously, yeah, the, the whole reason we're here, I'll, I'll put timestamps so people know where the, where the conversation starts. But yeah, I was, um, I've watched Avatar The Last Airbender relatively recently, and uh, my fans were very distraught to find out that I was not a fan. Uh, 
I heard there was uh, some rumblings. Going some on. rumblings. Some rumblings. Yes, people. Uh, th this is one of those. We've had a few of these in the past. So, like saying that Spider-Man: Homecoming is good, saying Godzilla: King of the Monsters is bad, and saying um, Mandalorian is bad. These are the most controversial <laughs> things that have come out of EFAP. There's, there's a couple <laughs> more of them, and people, depending on how controversial the stance, people want qualification, right? Faster. Um, it right. makes sense. It's just that sometimes you need to. I want to get the format right. You know, I don't want to just like blurt out random thoughts because I think it can um, it can piss people off even more. You know. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, we've done that plenty of times. <laughs> I'm, um, I think like one of the things we concluded because about Godzilla, like uh, one of the initial sort of ideas was like Godzilla's not supposed to be like well written. It's just monsters fight each other, and, I'm, and it's just weird. I'm like, why can't it? Why wouldn't it be? Just make it well written too. You can fight monsters and <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the very first Godzilla was well written. I mean, that was it was a masterpiece of a. It was like a commentary on the dangers of <laughs> nuclear power and yeah. energy, and the dangers of going too far with science. It had all kinds of uh, themes and and context and things it was trying to say. In they wrapped it up in a giant monster, but to make it entertaining. But it was still very have well you, written. Have you seen the new one? The brand new one, no. Not the the, brand the new villain's one. motivation is humans are ruining the planet with stuff like climate change. We need monsters to get rid of all of us. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, yeah, actually, I'm not surprised that modern Hollywood would make things something like that. Yeah, they hate people. They actually I, well, hate I, people. I just got blown away by it because, like, halfway through the movie, <laughs> she realizes her daughter is like potentially going to die in a bug saw this, and like the child's dad says it. And he has like one scene where he gets to talk properly, and he's like, "What exactly did you think would happen?" <laughs> it's like, what? Do you think the monsters were just gonna like stab on all the bad men? It's like, jeez. But um, oh. it's consequences weirdly consequences from my actions. Well, well, it's, it's weirdly rational because the film, you know, is kind of retarded constantly, and there's just like that one character who's pointing it out, and he's like, probably, probably shuffle him off. You know, you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, uh, we still haven't released. We're getting around to the EFAB movies of we we've, we've got like a reactiony thing watching that film, so they'll you know people will be able to see the arguments for that more in, in depth. Um, but this one, I think I've seen uh, a lot of people want to hear what I have to say about this this, uh, this show, and I figured um, I did talk to ER mm -hmm. um, about some of my issues, and he, he did clear some stuff up for me that I had like misunderstood. But I thought, yeah, we could hang out and uh, talk a bit about Avatar The Last Airbender, if if you're willing. Yeah, it sounds good to me. All right, then. Um, so I saw it the one time, and this is going off of uh, what I remembered and then just clarifying some things through, like, Wikipedias and stuff to make sure I um, didn't screw some stuff up. Um, and obviously, I I'm coming from a perspective that I would call the show subpar. Like, if I was to put it on a 10 scale, it's like a 4, mm -hmm. um, which I know is... Very controversial. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh that's boy. something you're not supposed to say. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the thing. Like, as much as we, you know, point those out as like a funny thing, it's like it is. It is fucking. It, it, like, I understand this happens both ways. Like, if someone walks into a call and just casually admits, like, yeah, the OT probably the worst of the Star Wars films. Like, everyone else is gonna be silent for a moment and be like, excuse me. <laughs> but what was that? It's like, well, you know, they try to be as good as the sequels, but they just don't get there. No, they heard you correctly. And um. Like, all I would say about um, statements like that, until they qualify it, you could ignore it. Um, what does it mean, exactly? Unless they do uh, qualify it, and then you're going to have to see about what the qualification is, because uh, I haven't seen many videos criticizing the OT, except for Return of the Jedi. Most people don't go after Empire or uh, A New Hope. There's some uh, sacred cows <laughs> in pop culture, and uh, the original, original Star Wars trilogy, that's one of them. I mean, you can criticize. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, we did your, that on EFAP once. People were like, uh, I think, I can't remember if it was a Superchar or a comment, but it was like the second they criticized the OT, all of EFAP will crumble because that's what the audience is based on. And I was like, all right, it's stupid that the speeder ships in Empire attack the AT-ATs head on. They should have gone around. <laughs> it's like, it's the just... EFAP crumble? You, well, that's the thing, right? If someone was like, how dare you? I'd be like, I mean, you know, just... About them from behind, what are they gonna do? And I can't remember, I'd have to rewatch it, but I don't think they have any weaponry on their backs, do they, the AT-ATs? No, they don't. They just have them on that head thing that they have. Yeah, and, and some of the uh, the speeder ship things that are actually wiped out by those, and so it's just like, damn guys, you should have uh, cycled around the area and come at them 
Um, but this is the thing, I love Empire, it's like my favorite Star Wars movie, there's loads of good shit in there, but it's not like, there's not gonna be some stuff you can, you can pick out, I just, <laughs> the last thing I want is people thinking, aha, so they're just as good as the sequels, you're like, ah, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you're going a bit far. Uh, no, uh, never go that far, they're, the sequels are garbage. Oh yeah, I want to clarify, I don't think Avatar is as bad as the sequels in any way, shape, or form. The, some hyperbolic things were said, this would be the, um, the very calm discussion where we try and say everything we mean as opposed to hyperbolic statements, so, yeah, like, if, I don't know where I'd put it, so, have you seen Crisis on Infinite Earths at all? Uh, I know it's, wait, wait which one? I think they've done that as... Oh, the recent, uh, the recent CW... Oh, wait, the, the, the one with the Arrowverse? Yeah. I haven't watched any of those. It look, they all look terrible. <laughs> so, so they are by zero or or what? I guess on the scale. Like that, I'm so glad I've watched it now because I'm like, yep, that is rock bottom. They um, <laughs> they destroy time and space, but like a wizard teleports them to a place outside of time and space, and they just chill. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like this place exists outside wow, of time so, and space. You're like, that's, that's interesting. So lazy. When when, when you, when you <laughs> When you add in time travel, that's how you know you've run out of ideas, unless your whole show is predicated on time travel. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's it's mind-numbing. They break every possible thing you could possibly ever build anything with. Um, so yeah, Batwoman is like a step above that. It's still really bad, but it's like a step above. And then like the sequels are steps above that, but they're still the worst thing ever as well. Like maybe one step. So I'm, I'm building up and then, you know, there's this this nice big gap. And then we're close to, like, average, I guess. Um, and I, I just put, like, Avatar is just below the line for me. And, um, yeah, we can talk about why if you'd like. Sure, let's go ahead. So, um... See what you got. All right. Uh, so, you, you probably agree that the, uh, a lot of the stakes, at least for the end of Season 2, um, are built by the idea that if he is killed in the Avatar state, uh, the Avatar's gone forever, that will break the cycle. Right. Yeah. Um, that's that's a, as far as I remember. He, uh, they mentioned that that if he is in the Avatar state, he's killed, breaks the Avatar cycle. I'm not really sure how they know that. That was going to be but... my question, because <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. When it was first introduced, um, I think I was. I could have asked uh, if I asked Wolf or not, but I remember just thinking about it like, how would you know? Because <laughs> you'd be dead, Mister Avatar. Um, I think it's a it's a piece of a, a knowledge that has uh, just been spread around into common knowledge. And it's probably coming from who knows if it's true or not. First of all, which that's not really the the point. But it could, there is enough ambiguity there because the Avatar has been around for a long, long time. I'm really sure how long it is and canonically. I know, in, and Korra they kind of <laughs> uh, retconned it to being ridiculously <laughs> short amount of time. Yeah, but uh, in Avatar: Last Airbender, I forgot what it canonically was, but it's been a long time. It's been several, many, many generations. Uh, reincarnations of the avatar so it could be there's some scholars in the background there's there's been shown that the world is includes a lot of scholarly organizations and even from season one they included this and then uh there could have been uh someone who knew i like, can someone to put things together like we have scientists today that can uh conjecture by logic and things that this and this and this will happen if this happens it hasn't happened before it's not it's something that could happen uh, they're just putting together what might be able to happen if certain conditions are mm -hmm. met within the universe or or atmosphere or whatever. I could say the same thing might happen with uh, in with the Avatar state. There might be some scholars who are uh, very well rounded, well studied in the spiritual aspects of the Earth and the spiritual nature. Because if you remember in season one, the Avatar is st said to be the bridge between the uh, the mortal world and the spirit world. So, and the, the avatar itself is very connected to the spiritual world, of the spiritual nature of the earth, which is why I'm pretty sure he's called Avatar, because he's supposed to be the the representation of all the earth's might and power and all that stuff. Uh, so there could very well have been some guy or some scholars. Like so the, weird. The, the, the the Stephen, Stephen the name, Hawkins. Shares the name Stephen of Hawkins. James Cameron's avatar. So weird. Yeah, that I mean, was... <laughs> I, think, I do think he did it on purpose. Honestly, I think possibly, yeah, it's very possible. <laughs> he, all he, I think all he cares about is like the just the fame and the money at this point. He, he wants it to be super. That's been delayed now because of coronavirus. Yeah, because the corona, like everything else has. Uh, but I think uh, there could have been like some spiritual scholar 
mm-hmm. or some uh, nature scholar. It's weird there's, they didn't. There's Stephen uh, Hawkins or whatever. It's weird they didn't have any sort of even a throwaway line for it because there's a lot of stuff we could sort of assume that as as to how it's possible that they knew it. And I would say like oh, yeah. the the pinpoint of the criticism would be that um, the season two finale's big emotional payoff is based on that knowledge. And so it's like, oh, yeah. how did we know this? And it's just like, they kind of just do, it's <laughs> fine. It's like, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, they kind of just do. I mean, there's been so much, it's been, Avatar's been around so long, and so much ambiguity that I can, we can you kind of accept that someone delved into it somehow. There's some spiritual sage who can uh, tell us this, these sorts of things in the past. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, the, these are more just sort of getting them said. I'm really not looking for one of us to either, like, concede or, or deny or whatever, just, just to... Oh, yeah. um, explore kind of both sides how it could be better how it could be worse maybe and then just move on to another one and this is hopefully brain food for people who both like and don't like avatar and obviously <laughs> just looking for discussion about it honestly i don't think i've ever met someone who didn't like avatar unless they're friendly <laughs> <laughs> they, everyone holds it up on such a they high d- yeah uh i think maybe i don't know what it is like i just we'll, we'll get through some more of these and i'll try and explain it better like what my experience was i guess um so, Aang's been uh, frozen for a hundred years, um, right? And he wakes up, or he's woken up um, by what I think a lot of people would call like, like it wasn't like a cause and effect thing. It was like, oh my goodness, like he's he's stumbled across, which is fine. But uh, within the next few months, if my timeline's correct, he like is able to uh, sort of deal with two what I would call very, at least by the world's rules from what I understand, extremely mm-hmm. rare galactic events that like had he woken up a few months, or let's say a year later uh, he would have lost essentially, like the Fire Nation would have uh, taken over completely because of Sozin's Comet mm-hmm. um, so I guess what I'm saying is like, wow, it's really convenient timing that he managed to wake up before what they establish is going to be their only chance to take out the Fire Nation during the Black Sun and uh, before Sozin's Comet fully arrived, um, despite being asleep for a hundred years. Uh, obviously, that is what I'm talking about is the premise of the show at that point, you, you, but you, do you see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of aspects of fate, This right from the show's title, The Last Airbender. He's the one guy, I mean, it's an aspect of fate by itself that he just happens to have um, a relationship with that that monk, what is it, whatever his name is, Gyatsu or something like that. So so tight knit was their relationship that the other monks decided to separate them so he can get some training done, and his nature, by his very nature, decides to run away because he's a playful kid and he's also a kid, mm-hmm. and uh, it's by that by a twist of fate, he was caught in a storm on his way to run away that caused him to fall into the ocean that caused him to set to freeze himself, and then he happened to be found a hundred years later. I mean, it's a it's a spirits, fate, destiny. It's a lot of things that are happening in the Avatar Last Ember that wouldn't be really all that acceptable in, say, another franchise. But in this franchise specifically, it's more it's more tolerable, if not completely acceptable, because they added in these spirits, uh, the nature of spirits, nature of fate, the nature of destiny, because destiny on its own chooses the Avatar. It's kind of like a anyone, there's so many people that could have been the Avatar, but Aang was chosen specifically by fate or by destiny. And you could say that he was frozen by fate. Maybe he was frozen by destiny. Uh, he was destined to freeze. I mean, he was destined to be thought out at the right time. And then maybe there is some hand in there because destiny in the first place chose Aang to become the Avatar. The Earth is the one that controls this stuff. So yeah, those are there, I think, specifically for a reason because uh, it's to make you ask these questions. Is there some sort of guiding hand about? Is there some sort of spirit or some uh, nature or will of the earth that kind of manipulates events to certain degrees. Uh, but it's never answered. It's sort of this, uh, it's there. You might be able to imply it, but it's never specifically answered. I, Though there, there are some, some uh, evidence there, like the uh, the nature of the spirit realm and how spirits can take form and become enter the world. And there are other spiritual and metaphysical aspects that can help uh, explain that to a degree. Um, so you would sort of imply there that like uh, Destiny sort of pushed Kitar and Sokka into the into the position of having to wake him up, you know? Oh yeah. Through different things, and um, their timing was close. Because yes, <laughs> if they had waited any longer, woof. Very close. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah the, the uh, all I would say is me- mechanically, like uh, it's just 
it was incredibly important to take advantage of those two events. And obviously the um, other criticisms are put to rest mm -hmm. by the idea that these are very rare things. Like, for example, it's like, how, does every, how doesn't everyone know what uh, eclipses do? And it's like, because eclipses are very rare in this universe, I guess. Um, yeah. So in, in, in that case, then, it's just like, damn, it was lucky he got up uh, in time for that. And I, I get it, like, if, if a guiding not Jesus, but some kind of <laughs> higher force is is going to be pushing things into certain directions. Uh, I, I would say that's not preferable for me uh, in, mm. in my story, even though it happens in things I love uh, a lot. Like, I've just... Um, it'll, it'll bring in the questions, of course, like, why aren't you doing more spirit people? Why aren't you doing more Jesus? You're just sitting up there, <laughs> like, pushing chess pieces. I mean, the Avatar on its own is very rare. There's only one of them at a time in any generation and then you have the uh because of the well let's say the eastern mysticism they added in here the the uh the chinese mysticism the, the kind of uh, mythology they have in here there mm -hmm. is a lot of to, there is a lot to do with fate and destiny and whether or not you choose your own um, you choose your own or is there someone guiding your hands your ends you know they the power you go back the power of the ancestors guiding your family's destiny which is why they traditionally pray to the ancestors because if you didn't they might upset an ancestor and you suddenly you're i don't know someone you're someone keys your car or something i don't know but uh that is so much fate tied into when you add in uh the east especially eastern mysticism uh i mean it exists in western mysticism too but when you add in eastern mysticism it also adds in that aspect of fate and ancestral uh destiny ancestral line ancestral blood and so it's very easy to recognize or to acknowledge that there might be some sort of continual uh, interference by the spirits or by someone from the past. And that uh, that element is actually in there with the uh, element of the Avatar's past selves, which Aang does interact with on occasion, specifically Roku, most of all. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess Roku went off to find his own TV line or something. I don't know. But, but uh, <laughs> they he's, he, he convenes with the past lives of the Avatar. There are spirits. There are spiritual uh, spiritual realm. The Avatar is noted as the bridge between the mortal realm, and spiritual realm. So those aspects are in there. Those aspects that are tied specifically to fate. So yeah, uh, the Sotan's comet is very rare and is very lucky that they found Aang when they did, and 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 that Katara was able to break that gigantic boulder of ice with uh, <laughs> Sokka's little bat thing. Uh, his little weapon. I forgot what they're actually called. But oh, uh, the boomerang? No, that's a boomerang. I forgot. Oh, right. Weapon. Sorry, yeah, I know what it's you're talking club. about. club. I forgot what they're specifically called. They used to know, but I forgot what they're specifically <laughs> called. But she was able to break that thing on her own with her puny little arms. They break that gigantic block of ice and free Aang right when he needed to be. So it's uh, also, you have to remember that the Avatar is there so in the first place to calm certain events. Now, it's it's implied that it's possible that an, an avatar could go their whole lives without encountering a world-changing event. Roku almost did. He was really old by the time uh, his big calamity came upon him. But there usually is one, at least one gigantic thing in a generation. But the avatar is specifically there to do this sort of thing. It's put. He's put there by fate or by the, the fate of the earth or whatever you want to call it. But the avatar isn't the avatar because the earth chose him to be the avatar. Or some whatever you want to call it. That's the easy way to put it. the Earth chosen to be the Avatar. Okay, that's how it goes. Okay, and then it's rare in the, to begin with, and but there's also inherently in the aspect of fate. Well, it was interesting you brought um, up Roku because uh, so the next thing, this is when I was mm -hmm. just uh, sticking in right. the old noggin. So um, they make a big deal about how the Avatar can speak to the the past Avatar, specifically Roku, by going to um, it's like a fire temple, and he needs to. Uh, right. Enter the temple's like sacred room. Once the winter, the light from the winter solstice hits the statue's eyes, he can um, speak with Roku directly. I think right. um, the way he's made aware of that is through uh, Roku's dragon in the spirit yeah, world. Um, Enter the spirit world, and he was able to be guided there by Go Go yeah. <laughs> Roku. Yeah, Roku. <laughs> um, <laughs> Roku's animal. So yeah, so so it's like a huge deal when he finally gets to speak to him. And obviously, he learns um, a lot of important stuff from that. But then. Uh, there are other instances where Roku sort of casually shows up, and it just it confuses me a little bit. You've got, um, when Aang is out, like, in the middle of the ocean, and he's really down on, like, his motivation, Roku shows up and gives him a bit of a, an Obi-Wan style, like, Luke, let's get going, buddy. Like, you gotta do it. This is important. Um, he's in the 
uh, the finale, where well, I think it's the one before the finale, I can't remember, uh, when he's talking to, um, about killing Ozai, like, obviously Roku gives his, uh, perspective on that one. The, oh, yeah. Uh, I assume, uh, he, he would have been, let's say, in Aang's head in some degree when he, when he becomes Godzilla at the end of season one, because, like, I doubt mm. Aang knew what he was doing with that, it was more, uh, the other avatars. Then there's, um, do you remember Jong Jong, the, um, the Fire Nation, the Fire Teacher, Fire, Fire Bender? Who oh, was, yeah. He's yeah, like, that, that, was he was he part of the uh, the Lotus Club? Yes. Um, so he he's Lotus like, or... I'm not going to teach you Aang because you're too. I think he says he's too reckless or something like that, or, or weak. I think it is. And Roku right. just shows up and he's like, Hey, teach him. And he's like, Okay, <laughs> geez, I'll do it. <laughs> and it's like, man, Roku could just sort of because they made like a huge deal out of it, but then it just sort of seems that he could just show up where he wants to when he wants to. And I'm just like, man, why isn't he like teaching Aang? Why isn't he? tutoring him on loads of stuff because it was incredible incredibly important information that he got out of roku and uh when he meets him in season one and i just figured that roku could tell him all kinds of things because obviously in i think it's season three roku gives him the full history on him and um uh sozin and i guess to teach ang about just how a friendship can go to shit <laughs> kind of how it can start a war that sort of thing and I, I was just like, man, like, the amount of knowledge Roku has, and for some reason, like, they establish that it's this this well that is impossibly hard to, to actually tap, but then simultaneously he just shows up whenever he kind of needs... Sorry about that. No problemo. Uh, did you hear what I... Yeah. What was the last thing you heard me say? Oh, yeah, you're talking about how uh, Roku just <laughs> came out of uh, uh, nowhere and actually convinced Zhong Zhong to train Aang. Yeah, he also pops up in the ocean, and he pops up on the... on that... Uh, lion turtle just for the finale, and he pops up on his yeah. own hometown islandy thing, uh, to tell and uh, Ang stuff. And and so basically, like I think in season one they were like, this is a huge deal, and then they were like, kind of wanting him to sort of come in where they needed him to in different areas. And so it just got me to the point where I was like, man, if Roku can do this, he needs to just teach Ang a shit ton of stuff. <laughs> come on, Roku, get in there to be his firebender teacher. Yeah, just just train him up. I mean, what's what? Is he just being lazy? Just lazy Roku. <laughs> lazy Roku. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think uh, the Zhang Zhang thing. I'm not really sure what's going on, but it's been showing. All, it's been showing that um, uh, there's a connection between Zhang Zhang and Iroh, and there is. Uh, if you remember from the first season, I don't know because it's, it's kind of obscure almost. But remember that there's an episode where Iroh gets captured, and in, and the. Uh, in the abridged series of Avatar, it's called it, he was he was having his naked Iroh time, and then he got captured <laughs> by Earthbenders. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as an inst that's that same episode where Aang goes into the spirit world, and so Iroh. Well, let me back up a little bit. So Aang is he climbs on Roku's spirit dragon thing, mm -hmm. and he goes soaring through the soaring through the air in the spirit world. No one can see him except for Iroh. Iroh can see him, and Iroh is this. Whoa! There's a big dragon going over my head in the spirit realm, and everyone, all the, all the Earthbenders, like, "What's what's going on? Why are you freaking out?" And he's like, "Oh, no reason." And uh, <laughs> yeah. but thing is, Iro can he can see spirits, and he's part of that. Uh, he's an old man, wise old man, part of that. White oh yeah, Lotus for sure. I think I, 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 I'm actually yeah. on board with the idea that Ang could probably speak to Roku in the spirit world or whatever. It's just weird to me that oh, yeah. like they took so much time to say that it has to be the winter solstice light shining on his statue oh, yeah. in the secret room in the fire temple like clearly all of that's not right. necessary <laughs> like you can, we can talk to him in other places what, what, here's what i'm getting at i mean uh, the uh, iroh is he can see spirits so zhang zhang he being also a white wizened old man and part of the white lotus society or organization mm -hmm. or whatever it would it would make sense that he, they share similar techniques. That's that's what being as part of society might be to share wisdom, especially a society of old men like that. So maybe Zhang Zhang can also see spirits, but that might explain why Zhang Zhang could see Roku. Now back to Aang and him being be able to see Roku outside of that temple thingy, is that uh, when the winter solstice is approaching, uh, Aang was a uh, was a, as a novice. He was basically just Aang who had some natural talent in bending other elements and able to tap into the power of the avatar accidentally. Uh, so he was kind of, he was brand new. He was very, he was just told he was the avatar before he was frozen. And they're not supposed to tell you until you're 16. He was 12. And so there you have it. But then, uh, so he was a novice. He was not really uh, focused. He was just a boy. So when he went to the avatar temple, 
or the temple where he met Roku. Uh, he was not connected to his past selves yet. He was not. Uh, he was just Aang. You could tap into the avatar sometimes. So when he goes into that temple, he meets Roku, and Roku helps him connect. And you would notice that that's the time when Roku was able to actually come alive, come back to the to the real world, and start destroying stuff and beating up the priests, uh, <laughs> as you do. And then uh, the he was able to connect with Aang. And to me, that point, that part of the uh, the whole winter solstice ritual allowed Aang to. Uh, focus and connect with his past selves, with his past selves being represented by Roku, the previous avatar. And from then on, he was able to, uh, Roku could connect to Aang directly through the spirit realm. As if the winter solstice event was able to, you know, start and spark that connection in the first place, which was why it was such a big deal that he had to do all that, go to that temple, go to the whole ritual to start that connection in the first place. And then from then on, he had a, a, a retroactive a connection to Roku from then on out, where Roku just could just appear when he needed to be. When he needed all, to be. All I guess here. I would want is like a line for that. Just, just give me that, so I can I can sit on that nicely as well. But the the only other thing that's left. Oh, yeah, I can see, just, that. Um, see that. I don't see, and there might be by the way. I might have missed it, but um, I don't see why uh, he isn't telling Ang more as this as the seasons go on. Like they're desperately in need of a firebending teacher, and it's like I don't know, maybe Roku. <laughs> <laughs> like he could probably do it. And, you know, if I you were like, you can't firebend as a too. spirit, I'd be like, no, you don't need to. Just show him the techniques and give him the, you know, show Yoda the style. Like, you need to do the thing with the thing. You're like, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's a good point, because as you've seen, when Iroh teaches Zuko, he's not showing him all the time. He's just saying, it's your breath, here's the movements, and this is what you do to to do fire, you know, to and to don't be fire an Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> So that, that is a good question. It, it would be that would set up a perfect. Uh, I mean, it would kind of detract from the story, but I don't know. If it's cheap. It would be cheap because Roku's not just a firebender. He's he was a previous avatar. He could just easily have just showed Aang everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely go for it. Um, so this one, this one's a, uh, it's hard to sort of uh, box in, but uh, so Aang's got like a huge issue with killing to the point where he, he at one point says like he would he wouldn't even want to harm a spider fly that was caught in its own web i think that's his line um yeah. yet i take large issue with his like very casual response to what could be significant death in different areas of the show the the example i think is most significant would be season one with the uh the air temple war um they uh, that and the water monster one at the end of season one, but I'd rather focus on the um, the war one. He like you have this scenario where um, they are living in his his air temple area, uh, but the only reason they've been allowed to stay there is because they're providing weapons to the Fire Nation, right? Well, there's like, oh, all right, there's some ethical right. stuff here. Okay, I'm liking it. This is good. Um, Ang is told like he's he's highly aware of the scenario being like important and he knows how important himself being there is to the fire nation like because they're searching for him and so the fire nation guy turns up and he's like give me my weapons and then ang like bursts out and he's like fuck you go away and blows him away that he's like you'll pay for this and then like once he's left they immediately start planning for war and i was immediately just like geez ang like <laughs> if you would like i know you don't want the fire nation to have weapons they've already got a shit ton of weapons by the way but you're gonna put this community that's like half children in a position where they're about to, like, fight a war, and they're throwing, like, stink bombs, or whatever those things are, like, this this oh, yeah. horrifying army that are gonna execute them if they can. Um, but my problem goes further, because, do you remember they have that, like, gas deposit at the bottom of the, um, the area, and they... The, the methane gas, something like that? Yeah, like, they it smell it through one of the bottom chambers gas. of their, um, their area, and they they put rotten eggs in it, because they know if they smell eggs, they'll know that's where the gas, uh, is, I guess? And so they, yeah. they can smell it in, like, this chasm, and so they throw their, uh, I guess, like, the, the, the sort of heater thing that's, uh, applied to their balloon... Uh, into it and explodes and it like fills the screen like the entire castle is taken up by flames and then all the fire nation are just shown to be defeated and they're like yeah and i was like you couldn't possibly have done that without <laughs> killing somebody um and he he just shows no recognition of it and it's uh it's, it's very concerning not to mention by the way that if you blew it up and the castle is sitting on that deposit like that place is uh 
in trouble, to say the least, but it's structurally it's fine once the explosion's over. It's just like, yeah, it's fine. They got rid of the fight. I just cool. Um, and yeah, so I guess my, my issue there is uh, I think it's out of character for him to not only like so brazenly start a war, but to also not show any remorse after killing many, many people. I know it's a kid's show, so they're never going to show us like all these corpses that are burned and all these men screaming and stuff. <laughs> I know that. I just, I, what I, I guess what I would want is a. F I, I don't like that episode at all. I would probably remove it. It's too, um, I, I would want to, I want to focus on the whole, um, they pilfered his people's temple to make their own place. I, that was enough for me. Just going over that. Yeah. Having him deal with it. Because they don't really deal with that. He, he has the war. And then at the end of the episode, he's like, like the hermit crab that takes its shell from something else, you guys have made something new out of the place you're in. Woohoo. Credits. I was like, wow. <laughs> Well, the thing about that, uh, I mean, you you can have that, you can, you can say that. I mean, he's a, that might be a mischaracterization of Aang, a severe mischaracterization of Aang. But uh, there's also evidence that he, it might actually be in character if you, uh, if you kind of stretch it, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, here's the thing. Uh, Av Aang is still a kid. He's like 12 years old. And he has, there is, there are evidence, or there are examples in the show where he does things that uh and he just can't really comprehend the full weight of those things like uh let me see uh i know cause, well the other characters do that too i mean with the uh, katara stealing that scroll uh he's like okay well you know you stole it might as well use it that <laughs> they have that, 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 that attitude so and there's also um i think ang fights people and sometimes he doesn't really realize how damaging he could be uh it's, I can't really think of specific examples. It's been a while since I've seen this show, but there, I think there's there are times where because Aang is flawed. He's a flawed character. He makes mistakes, uh, but only sometimes when he's actually faced with the consequences does he realize how bad he has it. I mean, there's a minor example I can think of right now where he gets kind of gets a big head when he goes to Kyoshi Island and all he gets all this attention and he everyone just loves him and he kind of has a fight with Katara, the the girl he's fallen in love with. And they kind of separate because of his his uh, his flaw that he has a big head. So while I think he might be able to lead this war or in the Fender's temple, because the defending of the Airbender temple that is a huge thing for Aang. I remember he was really affected by the uh, the skeleton of the monk's death mm -hmm. and how his people were all slaughtered. So uh, that's uh, and he does have a temper, which is how sometimes he taps into the Avatar state before he was ready. And so I could see that he would become angry. I know he, from there, he constructed a war. It might seem uh, non-lethal to him. So when they, but when they blow things up, and he's like he said, they can't do anything about killing anybody. On that part, Ang probably could have assumed that they all lived; that it wasn't lethal. <laughs> and uh, he, because he, he might not understand. He's twelve years old. He doesn't com comprehend the entirety of what happens in war, and it's shown that he likes to play around. He thinks this stuff is a game sometimes. Uh, like the prison, like oh, just leave people here, <laughs> just leave people here in uh, in slavery. They'll be fine. It's not they're not, not being hurt because as Boomy, as King Boomy says, it's all about evasion and moving out of the way for airbenders. That's the airbender style. It's the airbender mentality. Get out of the way, go with the flow, that sort of thing. And when it comes to Aang and war, he might have just thought those people lived and it was okay for them to go through this ex explosion. But I would see, I would say that if he was uh, faced. With the consequences of his actions, he would feel really bad. And like you saw in Kyoshi's Island, when the when the air when the firebenders came and started burning things down, he didn't care. He knew these. He knew the firebenders were after him. He knew what that would mean. He saw what they did at the mm -hmm. at the what's the South Pole, the South Pole. Yeah, he saw what they did. He knows that the people after him are going to bring destruction. But did he care in Kyoshi's Island? No, because he couldn't comprehend it. <laughs> He's like the attention. I'd, I'd, surely like, an explosion of that magnitude. Like, there's not going to be much of a. I mean, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's probably going to be a stretch. It's probably, it might be actually, yeah, and a mistake. But I could also see Aang just not comprehending that maybe the writers thought it would be in his fitting for his characterization that we've seen up to I, that point. I just, where I he might it would not be see super or interesting comprehend. to have the. Because everybody condemns the dad's character. And I was like watching, I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I think that I'm on his side. Like this place. Well, which dad? The, the guy who's making oh, weapons or? for um for the Fire Nation in oh, order to have his community the, the stay in the Air Temple. I'm like, I mean, yes, it's yeah, that bad that you're giving them <laughs> more strength, but I mean, 
if your options are that or die um you know maybe that maybe that wasn't the option and i think that that episode yeah, he's, he's could have focused on that episode. idea and then also mixing in the whole like taking something for your own uh and especially like i feel like that probably should have been a couple of episodes of ang um really because like i was I, I don't know that was probably the peak of my investment when ang was like super pissed off of them for what they, they, they've plugged pipes into all of the artwork i was like oh my god this is this is this is this is gonna create some tension <laughs> but um yeah the other part to that that sort of bothers me about that episode is that um the fire nation know that ang or that the, the the airbender is there like they would have had a lot of visual confirmation mm -hmm. obviously um so either they conclude that he is there, and so they'll send multiple, you know, factions to, of, of their own forces to get there and to get him. Or uh, they get there and realize he's not there, but they, they still would have, they'll take the place back. That's a place where they were defeated in warfare I, I, by this enormous, absurd explosion that obviously they can't pull that <laughs> trick again. Um, so I guess my point is like, uh, Ang leaving them like is to their doom but they show up in season three and i was like oh i guess they're okay yeah they do uh i, I think the implication was that in the um since ang led them to victory and they they learned how to fight back and learn how to essentially war on their own that they were able to hold off the fire nation from from there because i don't know well, the way they, they rearranged they, their they could only uh, do that explosion trick the one time though right yeah yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's probably what they, they wanted to imply. They never went back to it. They never showed the aftermath. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what they probably thought, you would think. that they could. From then on, after Aang, the wise avatar, taught him how to fight back, they were able to continue <laughs> fighting back. Do you remember the uh, the Black Sun episode very well? It's the one where the, everyone loses their... Or all the firebenders lose, lose their yeah, yeah. Uh, bending ability. Do you remember their assaults... And, begins and um they're surprised that the fire nation lift a a net in the water so they can't travel past it do you remember that uh i don't remember that episode specifically too much too well oh well i mean obviously i'm not gonna lie to you uh i'll, I'll just tell you you could you could make of this from every what you what you will but so our team is heading toward attacking the fire nation and they're in the water um and as they're traveling across the fire nation lift this huge net and um, oh yeah so f first thing in my head i was just like well you can cut steel with water so you can obviously cut a net with water that's not probably not gonna be that hard um but then they set the net on fire the the fire nation do like that's <laughs> even more threatening and i was just like will that destroy the net like but okay fine yeah, let's that, assume the net is just would... flame retarded no wait simultaneously flammable but not destroyable i don't know <laughs> um surely you could put out the fire with the water bending like Katara, at that point has been shown to like cause tsunamis, so like I I don't see like make rain and everything. Um, but they're all like, oh god, what are we gonna do? And then they engage with their submarine plan, which then again, my head, I was just like, why didn't you open with this? That's like stealthy and really effective, and it'll just like drop you all off exactly where you need to go. And I just don't see why a fire net was the thing that <laughs> that screwed them up. I was just like, huh, that uh. And you know that's obviously the, this is a rather big climax. This whole scene, the uh, the Black Sun episode. Um, yeah, well, you know, fire's scary. Okay, as Frankenstein let us know, lets us know all the time, fire bad. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, I mean, when you're assaulting a, a fire, I'm not going to. I don't think I can really defend that really well. But <laughs> but uh, the, the the thing when you're assaulting a firebender uh, castle or citadel, and you think they have no fire. Uh, no fire bending ability, and they give you fire anyway. That might be uh, disheartening, or that might damage the morale. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, so... I'd be like, I wonder how they did that. <laughs> Wait, I think that was yeah. was that before the eclipse that they pulled that out. They might have been before the because it happens during the battle, I think, right? Oh yeah, um, that's right. So, well, it, like an, so yeah. they don't waste any time. So they might have done that. I don't Maybe, know. yeah. Um, do you remember <laughs> the anthology episode with like I think it's like five stories in one episode? The bossing um, say yes. Has uh, the bossing say yeah. Yes. Um, do you remember? Because when I was watching it, I was like, "Oh no, uh, Ang needs to get all the animals in the area out into like a a, a zoo that he's gonna create." Um, and he and he does this thing where he blows really hard on his um, arpa flute thing, and it like essentially gets all the animals in the area to like single file approach wherever <laughs> he wants. And I was thinking, like at first, you're like, "Oh, that's, there you go, neat." 
that I was like, oh, damn. So Aang knew that he could do that. <laughs> like, do you know how many animals they fought across these three seasons in total that he just never uses that against? <laughs> do you remember the, like, army of weird beetle things that they fought? Um, oh, yeah. Just like, damn, bro, <laughs> use that shit. Get them all to walk single file off a cliff or <laughs> something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think obviously they were trying to have some fun with an anthology thing and I was just like, you just gave him a superpower, I wouldn't have done that if I were you. Yeah, maybe he just learned it, maybe he just learned that trick, I don't know. <laughs> maybe he works on oh, well, domesticated animals. Oh, season two, and I think there are examples of season one and three that have like, animal related uh, enemies to do battle with in some way, shape or form. I don't know, I, th I think the Tales of Boss you can say isn't really something you, uh, you think about too much because I mean, after he makes a zoo, there's no repercussions. He just he just destroyed all the stuff. He, he freed all these animals. Isn't it? They made a brand new made zoo. A, he made a zoo in wartime. It's like <laughs> it's on the outside of the wall. Like, <laughs> outside of the wall. You like you like who's going to go see that thing with your family? Like checking out the elephants and so and then the fire nation just show up with a second drill. You're like, oh, <laughs> we should go inside. You better have an earthbender out there. You know, yeah, and save all the animals. Just leave all the animals to die. Then okay. But there's no repercussions. No, it's not against the law. But what I was to say at that time was it was pretty. Uh, they cracked down pretty tough. You know, uh, the, the the Earth King invites you like Lao guy. That sort of thing. They had Dai Li. Yes. Uh, you you step one side. The Dai Li was actually named after the, the Chinese. I think secret secret police um, leader or something like that. One of those things. Uh, so that's why they were so. Uh, there was there were the bossing say, secret police, and it was really under a strict control. From that guy, I forgot his name. The guy who led the the Dai Li, and you, there's no repercussions for that. Just you know, just stealing all the animals <laughs> in the kingdom, making you zoo think, outside. You'd think they'd be pissed, wouldn't you? They'd be like, "Hey, you zoo hey, maker." There needs to be some arrests going on. Yes. Okay, you just uh, this is stealing big gigantic animals is not against the law. It's against the law here. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be against the law in like mar fascist bossing say? Um, <laughs> nothing happens though. This nothing. It's it's fine. It's just fine. So th this one's a little... it's enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's an <laughs> anthology. I, I, I thought to myself like, yeah. you, just, you didn't need to do that. You should, you could have just find a different way. Get those animals out there. You got loads of options. It's fine. Um, so, uh, if you remember, we're told that in the Avatar state, um, Ang is like hyper vulnerable. He's, he's at his most vulnerable. Right. He's like a glass cannon. He's most powerful, but also most vulnerable. The implication being yeah. that if he was like, I guess, punched really hard. It might kill him instead of just hurting him, that sort of thing. Um, and that's why the stakes are like at the highest when we find out that it'll destroy the Avatar cycle too. And so when he's zapped by lightning in his back, I think the audience is supposed to feel like, holy shit, is it all over? Like that sort of moment. And then Katara yeah. is able to heal him because she has the Healy Juice that was established season... <laughs> was that season one or two? I can't remember. I think it was... Yeah, season she one. She had some special... Right? Very special healing water she had. Right. Like Which, you know... If that was the only thing, I'd be like, okay, that, yeah, mm, fine. It's, it's kind of like you, you got to have your cake and eat it. You got to show the audience the worst possible thing ever, him getting killed in the Avatar state. And you got to have him survive. You're like, all right. But that's not <laughs> my issue. Um, Kitara let Jet die. <laughs> She has. Heal. Yeah, I mean, forget that guy. <laughs> she, she, Let him die. Who cares? She has like super Healy juice that can bring people back when they've apparently like because Ag was almost essentially deceased while he's on Appa, while Jet was mm -hmm. like, "I'll be okay." And then Toph is like, "He's not gonna be okay." This thing, the uh, something I really liked, by the way, was Toph could detect he was lying when he said okay. that. I thought it was good. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. That was good. yeah, Katara is like, she's like, uh, I don't know if she's tearing up or anything, but she's really upset because. She does her standard water bending, and she's like, she, I don't think the, she's going to be able to save him. And I was like, use the super juice. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, super juice probably can't save someone if they've, you know, received mortal damage. And then I was like, oh, no, it can. That's like its point, is that it does a super heal. I was like, oh. I just thought she, I just thought she didn't want to. <laughs> oh. I, just thought, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, she might have liked Jet or whatever. Like, there were enemies well, I mean, at one he time. Was, though, he and... was uh, doing the hero hero stuff at that point, right? He yeah, was, he, he was yeah. saving them. I mean, he was saving them, but he wasn't really part of the main cast, and that stuff is rare. So, I mean, you're on your own, Jet. <laughs> I still think that's an indictment on her character. I've always, I've always thought she was the kind to like. She would save someone even if she would save Ozai, even if like, if if he was like screaming in pain, she'd probably help him. 
Good old Katara. Uh, with, 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 she didn't say Jet. I think uh, <laughs> maybe. Uh, I mean, it, she, I think at that moment, Jet was in the middle of battle. Like there, were, he was helping hold off the Fire Nation or the enemies or something. And there was there wasn't really a way to get over there and heal him without dying in the process. <laughs> That's why he was uh, sacrificing himself. As, as far as I remember, that has been a while since I've seen that episode. Uh, Long Fang, Long Fang, that is his name, right? That's his name. Long, yeah, something uh-huh. like that. It's Long Long Fang, the guy the, who controlled the Dai Li. The Dai Li, they were fighting the Dai Li. That's it, right? Right. Yeah, well, because um, he was killed by an earthbending technique. I think we're supposed to assume that the Dai Li are at least partially dealt with, because what happens is a uh, Long Fang escapes, or at least he's about to, and then uh, Ang is with Jet on the floor, and then uh, the rest of our characters come in from the background because they've. I'm assuming dealt with the daily at that point. They sort of just arrive. They they were gone for like ten minutes. I don't. It's, it, they don't show like a scene of them being like, "We can't get to Ang. We gotta fight the daily." We're just <laughs> supposed to assume that they are. Um, and so, you you push through to to they arrive. Everyone's there and everyone's very because it's it's Jet's team as well. Like his his ragtag group of guys who are like, "Oh no, we'll." They like will take care of him. I think they're tearing up because they know he's uh, he's not going to make it. Yeah. And so it's like a quiet moment, and and Katara does try the standard healing. And I, I just it's it is funny the idea <laughs> that she's got the the cure, but she's like, I don't want to use this on you. <laughs> like it's, it's a really valuable <laughs> I mean, resource, buddy. It, it's really rare. I mean, I don't I don't blame her. <laughs> Oof, that would be it's see really uh, that would be great potential though. Like to have that ethical quandary. Like someone points it out to her, and she knows that, and she has to like sort of reconcile the fact that she chooses whether people live or live or die. Yeah, I mean, it would have been better if they if she kind of had a, a PTSD sort of moment where oh, she goes totally. back to that flashbacks of that. I just I think they kind of they might have forgotten that they had that juice at that point. Oh well, yeah, probably. I mean, <laughs> that's a really good chance that there's they have, they right off they have to do a lot of stuff. They have to juggle a lot of characters at that point, so they might have forgotten and only remembered. When Aang got zapped by lightning, then again she she loves Aang, oh, and she might well, I, I have gotten think that. They, uh, they introduced water. it specifically because they knew that season two payoff was coming. I think that they always intended to put Aang in basically like the worst position, but they were like, as long as we've it's got possible. this sort of, we we've keyed it up, we've let people know we've got a thing that can heal people. Like I can't remember how they describe it, but it's just it's super heal juice. All I thought of it as, so I was just like, uh huh. <laughs> and they might have just had a. Katara think that too. Like I, I have this super, super heating water, and I can't use it unless maybe she because she loves Ang. She really cares about Ang. She's a very caring person, in general. But she really loves Ang, and she mm-hmm. might her mentality might have been I can't use this unless Ang is in trouble. Or herself, she I might imagine. like Jet, but she, yeah, because she like she might like Jet. She loves Aang. I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Sorry, Jet. <laughs> Off you go. Yeah, I, um, you're, you're out of luck. Yeah, look, sir. The other thing I remember about uh, Katara, so do, do you remember when she uses bloodbending to save Aang and Sokka, and uh, the old lady awesome. is like, that was fantastic. she's like crying, because cool. I think she considers it to be essentially unethical bending. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, it so, was forbidden, I think. When so what bothered me is when her, she and uh, Zuko are gonna hunt down the person who killed her mum, and they have a theory on who it is, and she just runs straight into blood bending him, right? And you could be like, oh, "That's motivated by the fact that she thinks that person killed her mum." It's like, okay. Um, when she's they find really out angry. when they find out he's not, she's like, "That's not the guy." She just like drops him and moves on, and I was like, "Damn!" I would have thought she would be like. You know, taken aback by the fact that she's just committed to what she considers to be a really horrible act on an, you know, quote unquote innocent person. She's he's not he didn't kill her mother. He's just a guy, and she seems to have a huge issue with doing it to just people in general. Um, and so I was like disappointed she wasn't, uh, like shocked at herself in any way. She's just like, all right, moving on. It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- I think she was really. Angry at herself for being that angry, if I remember correctly. She was, uh, it was just. Well, she has sort she of got, a when moment she got at the end it. of the episode, but at that point in the episode, yeah. it's like, I just think someone's missing there. It might, maybe, might be a little flaw in the writing. Because uh, they, uh, they, they focus so much on her being angry, and it was played off as if she was being, she was doing the wrong thing. I think Aang was like, he said something along the lines of, don't do this. He didn't want Katara to do that. Uh, of course, Zuko being, I guess, uh, yeah, Zuko being at that time the Lancer, he's taking the place as the Lancer in the little band. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the opposite of Aang. 
so he's the more aggressor. He's he's willing to kill. He's willing to do, he's willing to do everything that Aang isn't willing to do. And so it was Aang was the angel, Zuko was the devil in that in that uh, scenario, and Katara went with Zuko. Uh, so it was kind of played off as something she was doing that was wrong. And they dress up as ninja, all that good stuff. And so there was they're sneaking. They're not being honorable anymore. They're no longer the honorable heroes once they start doing that. So it was played off as. This is bad, Katara. That's oh, why sure. the tension was so high. And I like the whole, uh, like, sort of dabbling, and then, you know, but but I think, like, it, the the way you sort of do it, it's like the true character stays on point, as in they they can only go so far before they're like, yeah, this isn't me. And um, it affects her so dramatically, bloodbending to save her friends, and she doesn't do anything horrible to the old lady, she just stops her, right? She doesn't, like... Yeah. Which is why, if I was a friend of his, I'd be like, yeah, hey, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Look, I know it seems horrible. <laughs> But what you just did is, like, really good. <laughs> so you're all good in the book. But she's obviously crying, and I found that to be quite, like, an impactful part of her. But then that that scene later... what I guess what I would be looking for is that once he dro she drops the guy and realizes it's not the right guy, she should, like, have a moment and then carry on. But she's just, like, moving on. And I was just like, oh, man. That should have been, like, really yeah, that was kind impactful. Of, that was kind of strange. <laughs> um, oh, and of course, um, despite the fact that I think the bloodbending puppeteering episode is really neat, it's probably the scariest one out of the selection, I suppose. Um, or is this kid show? You control so. people's blood. You yeah, no, this is a, that's what I mean. This, if this show is R-rated, man, whoa, <laughs> like, we'd be, I'd be excited to see like, what's, what they... What's, what's, what's stopping Katara of, like, bending people's blood out of their eyeballs or something like that? Oof. Drain all their blood. I, I would say we hope her character is the reason why she wouldn't do that to people. Because I think there was an instance where they were, like, sucking the water out of plants and killing them and stuff. Yeah. I wasn't even with the moon. So what's the... I don't think so. I don't think so either. So what's stopping? What would be stopping Katara, for example, from just sucking all the blood out of somebody and well, using it as a, as a blood whip? The hope is that um, <laughs> she wouldn't want to ethically, right? That's because Jesus. Ethically, the, yeah. The, the old lady didn't wouldn't care. No, She'd the old lady wouldn't give a fuck. She would. All day. She would do it. Uh, so about that scene, um, Katara is getting puppeteered until she is able to block the puppeteering, and then she is able to apply the puppeteering to. The old lady um mechanically i was just confused i was like why is any of this happening this way just like suddenly katara can block it suddenly the old lady can't block katara doing it well obviously she must have uh siphoned it out of her brain you know like ray, ray did to kylo ren oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um but i think uh i mean katara is shown to be she was the only one in her village to be able to waterbend she was already sort of a i guess you could say well, a prodigy it wasn't that because they killed the others. I, I, yeah, but she yeah. was the only one left in her village. So, and she was really obsessed with it. She was really obsessed with being able to um, water bend. She was learning on her own, so she kind of got the basics. I think she got training since then before that part. So, also not just training, but you know, trial by fire is the best teacher. <laughs> so, she might have been able to um, gather some sort of idea on how it's done. Okay, so this is how I bend. This is how I bend water. How would I bend blood? And she, I think the old lady even told her how she kind of does it. Like, I think she says that, okay, the water in your blood, I was able to do that. Now, Katara can make the necessary connections and try it on her own. Uh, I think that's what they're kind of implying there. Oh, I was actually kind of, I'm on board with the idea that she could, you know, like how force users seemingly don't really use the force on each other. And the assumption is that if one of them was to use a force push on one of them, the other one would like, you know, force anti put like, they'd be able to counter it, so they may as well go for lightsaber skill. Yeah. Uh, and obviously we see that in uh, Revenge of the Sith, where they, they both try to force push each other, and they basically cancel out until they both blow away. Um, so, like, a bloodbender being able to bloodbend you probably can't as soon as you figure out how to counter bloodbend. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, so they, they cancel each other out. But then she manages to do it to the old lady without her being able oh, to stop right. her. Oh, right, okay, yes. And so I was like, That's oh, your point. So okay. she... Why was the old lady be, being blood bent if Katara could block her blood bending? You'd figure right? she could block it back, right? Oh, I think it was because at that point, is she, the old lady was probably in shock. How are you able to do this? She's in shock as the audience is. And uh, she wasn't able to block it as as well. But I mean, yeah, 
She should have been able to block I mean, it eventually. She's, you know, once <laughs> once it's closing out, she's happy about it, right? She's like cackling, but like, haha, you've become potentially unethical, like me. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. But uh, up to the point of it her... first happening, she is like, what the fuck? How are you doing this? And I, 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 I shared her sentiment. I was like, how is she doing that? <laughs> <laughs> I think as as the series went along, they played katara more and more like a, a prodigy of water bending mm. especially when they went to uh, north north pole i'm not i necessarily necessarily agree with that but that's kind of what they did they kind of just kind of out of necessity well, I because mean, they, there might be a fate element there. there too right because ang bumped yeah. into what is essentially the prodigy of water bending the prodigy of earth bending and um a traitorous fire nation person that can obviously jump yeah, over the side who is the brother of a prodigy of firebending? So yeah. <laughs> they, like, it was one more, one more distance of connection. But there's still a connection to a prodigy there. So yeah, this element of fate. Yang himself was a prodigy of airbending. Uh, Katara, they played her up eventually as a prodigy of waterbending because she caught on pretty quick too, and she was able to, I think, uh, put up a good fight against the North Pole Master, and then uh, Toph as a prodigy of earthbending. So yeah, element of fate. That he would come across these very powerful young benders in their uh, in their respective fields, except for Zuko, of course, because mm -hmm. uh, everybody hates Zuko. He just happens to be the brother of a, a fire bending prodigy. <laughs> well, um, this next thing I want to show you, I'm actually going to try and pull it up, um, but I got to be careful because this recording is going to try and be on YouTube, so I need to be careful about copyright. So I'll do my best to get around it. But um, so context-wise, you remember how. Um, sort of Zuko and Iroh's story in season one is that they are perpetually trying to get to the Avatar, but unfortunately they are thwarted or otherwise defeated, and um, Ozai considers Zuko to be a failure and Iroh to be a traitor. Yeah. And so we right. find out as the audience that um, they're going to capture them and bring them to the Fire Nation at the beginning of season two, and they tell mm -hmm. them, hey guys, we're going to be going home. How about that? And it's like, oh my goodness, really? Oh, yeah, it's in Azula. It's in Azula do that, right? To the yes. Um, yeah, okay. When no, we no know, joke. interestingly, the history for Azula is that she was always someone that uh, Zuko didn't trust. And so I was, you know, this <laughs> scene, I'm going to, let me see what this looks like. I'm going to try and screen share with you a second. This is, this is going to look funky for people watching she, this. Don't, don't, don't panic. She's really people. good at lying. She's really good at lying. <laughs> um... All right, so can you can you see this? Yeah, I can see it. I can see it. All right, so it's gonna it's gonna look weird on the people who are listening to this. If you if you got it on visual, the reason it looks like that is because I'm trying to screen share with Literature Devil. But uh, the added bonus is copyright dismissal. Like I don't think anything's gonna be picked up. But so Zula's happy to see them here, because she's very close to getting them on board, and then they'll be um, well prisoners at that point. Uh, and we're yeah. we're filled with tension because these guys we actually quite like them, and we don't want them to be tricked. So. And they got a nice touch there. Iro, Iro's not trusting this shit because he's he's pretty smart. He's on point. Iro is well, he, he's he's Iro, so of course he Very knows wise. everything. I'm so glad you decided to come. So like we're we're doing okay. Do you remember what happens in this scene? Uh, that she uh, brings him up there, and. I think Iroh just, uh, he takes a stand or something, because I well, don't so think they go with her. <laughs> let's let's pretend to be in, a, like, a cool little little boardroom right now, and we're right in this scene. So, I tell you, we need to get these two to realize this is a ruse, because we don't want them to be captured by the Fire Nation, we want them to, they're going to be on the run for this season. You're like, alright, so ideas. First idea I have would be something like Iroh looking suspicious. We'll establish that he would know full well that something's up, this is weird. Because I'm on board with that, I think that's good. Then have maybe a few of these guards without helmets, like the one to the left, right there, you can see his face. Have them sweating, like they're really uncomfortable. And you could be like, why? I can't remember what else that's in, but that... Oh, um, Captain America Winter Soldier, they do that in the elevator. Uh, oh yeah, he saw. He sees that they're sweating and they're nervous and everything. Yeah, which is a really good giveaway. And then I think you should have maybe Zuko poke Azula about being so nice. He's like, why are you... Why are you being like absurdly nice? And then like I would have, you could you could have dialogue that involves like I thought f I would have assumed father would consider everything that happened in the previous season to be a failure, and then you could have Azula be like, no, she, he's impressed like with how well you've done, and then you can have our characters realize like impressed like this is someone's someone's up. Um, I think there's a lot of ways you can write it, a lot of good ways, because this is a really significant moment. This is going to change their path throughout the whole show, and I'm just gonna show you what happens. Here it is. Guard the princess! Raise the anchors! We're taking the prisoners home! You're 
<laughs> the part that gets me <laughs> is his face. He's <laughs> like, oh, Drew, <laughs> like, what have I done? Well, Maybe I can show He that. just messed up under under Azula's command. He's he's dead. Well, of I course, mean, he's, he's, just he's the captain. <laughs> like, it blows my mind he could possibly make this horrendous of a mistake. It's like, the whole point is that they don't discover that they're prisoners. <laughs> like, he's like... <laughs> We're taking the prisoners home. What a strange thing you need to say, you know? And, uh, yeah, I burst out laughing when I first heard that, because I was like, of all the ways you could have constructed that scene, you had him blunderously Oops. state. <laughs> like, well, that's the thing, right? She goes, <gasps> and then he goes, oh. <laughs> like, I... <laughs> I'm I'm dead. Well, <laughs> I had a good life. Oh, fucking, I would fire that guy. <laughs> I'd like, be like, useless. Um, I should have gotten a better captain. I don't... <laughs> but yeah, you know, that kind of... I don't know what, what they were thinking with that. There's so many ways you can sort of write that scene, and they just sort of went, ah... <laughs> that guy just says that, I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it probably would have been a better way. But I mean, there's a... <laughs> there's a they At that point, they thought they've won. There's no way. There's no way that they've uh, they couldn't get them. Uh, so in his mind, you know, in his mind probably just clicked. And said, "Okay, we got them. Uh, send the." In his mind, he probably thought like, "Okay, Iro, as of the, right now, Iro and Zuko are captured. They're under our command. They are our prisoners. Please take the prisoners down to the the prison place in the ship." The prison and he's like, place. Oh, <laughs> they don't know the prisoners yet. My oops. <laughs> oh, I'd slap him. Um, he's, he's a, a, it's I mean, the it's, it's the like, oops totally part of it that makes it so funny to me. Yeah, oops. <laughs> <laughs> At the, the brig, yeah. The, I don't. Yes. Do, do those Fire Nation ships have a brig? I, I don't know. I think they probably think they're they Fire Nation. They must have at least something. <laughs> they capture yeah. people constantly. <laughs> um, so the, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it was human error that saved their lives. It was kind of cheap. Uh, but at least, at the very least, they had Iroh very, being very suspicious. You know, well, that's the thing, they, that they, they were doing the so captain... well. They were doing so well, and then they did that. I was like, oh, you fucks. <laughs> you couldn't have tried you a know, little harder. It, if they didn't have the captain say anything, you know, Iroh, it was implied that Iroh probably would have pulled something because he's really awesome. He could beat Azula easy, probably. Uh, but yeah, that was, it was dumb. They got lucky because of human error. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would have, I would have fucking. Just had I I would I would settle for that Iro just being too suspicious and he goes no we're not going on that ship and then I don't know someone grabs them and being like yes you are and then you know fight can erupt that way I'm cool with that it's just the way they did it was funny the idea the concept the very invention of energy bending is brought to us like moments before it's incredibly important to the plot yeah. um, I found that really dissatisfying. <laughs> I mean, they, they built it up. I mean, they built not the energy bending itself, but they built it up as a uh, as a kind of an alternate uh, hero's journey, kind of like not a hero's journey, but a development, an arc, and it's something they they were looking for because Aang was wrestling with his morals because so, he has to. There's no way out of this, as far as you can tell, without killing Ozai. He has to kill Ozai because Ozai will not stop. He can beat Ozai. Uh, he can face Ozai. But Ozai is way too powerful, and even if he defeats him, he will not stop. He'll continue. He's too charismatic. He's too in control of everything. He's too powerful of a firebender just to keep under lock and key. He has to die. And it mm -hmm. seems to be the only place he can, the only place he can go. And Ang goes on this like journey, and he's trying to wrestle with himself. How am I supposed to do this without killing Ozai? And uh, the the uh, he actually encounters that big dragon turtle thing. On his on his journey, and the dragon turtle imparts wisdom. I mean, yeah, it comes out of nowhere, but it's again part of that uh, fate where the avatar comes in and goes on a journey, searching for for an answer to a question, or searching for an answer to his morals, and searching for an answer to a question is very. Uh, it's kind of the central to the, the Buddhist philosophy. Just uh, thinking and pondering and sacrificing. I think what if I don't I remember this correctly, but didn't Ang spent a long time on a long journey with almost dying before he encountered the dragon turtle when he encountered the dragon turtle that's when that's when he gets the knowledge on how to spirit bend uh the, li talking about the lion else turtle and yeah yeah well, uh the lion turtle teaches him about energy bending right yeah yeah that's it yeah lion turtle teaches, teaches him energy bending and i'm i'm i forgot what happens right before that but i think ang was on like the brink of death or he had gone on some journey by in, in isolation 
Um, he was like Dragon Turtles saved his life. Uh, well, that's another thing that sort of struck me as really odd. He's like, he's very panicked about taking on Ozai because everyone's saying he has to kill Ozai, and he doesn't want to. Obviously, yeah. as part of his philosophy and his his people, his culture. Um, and he sort of he's like half asleep, and he wanders off. And he w swims over to this island that he spots, and then he falls asleep on the island, and the island moves him out into the middle of, like, the ocean. And so all of his friends are like, oh god, he's gone, he's... what do we do? Like, <laughs> and there's someone else... That, so the whole thing is really odd to me, especially when we're that close to the, the climax of all of it. It's like, he wandered yeah. off, this island showed up. What would the island have done if he, was, he wasn't near a body of water? Like... I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I think it's like something about drawing him to the the lion turtle because those lion turtles are supposed to be those gigantic like controllers of the universe or something. So <laughs> uh, my, they might have they have a might have a spiritual connection to the avatar. It's, it seems to be uh, what that might consist of, especially since they teach spirit bending. Hmm. Uh, so that seems to be like an aspect of fate where they can draw in the avatar. They have a connection to the avatar's wants and the avatar's will. Uh, at any moment, and um, as as we saw, the Avatar is drawn to the Lion Turtle, and Lion Turtle saves him, teaches him how to spirit bend, which you mean, kind you, of uh, you say energy helps. bending, right? Right, or is that I, I don't know? Are they saying the same things? Spirit and I, energy? Because I remember I don't remember. It might be. I can't remember if they refer to it as spirit bending as well. well the, the, obviously, the whichever point whichever the is, one is where it takes away his bending. Yeah, yeah. The, the <laughs> point is it allow like that to me was a huge issue though. The uh, the quandary of those two options and then he's provided a third one that like fixes everything for him yeah to me that i mean if i were being objective which i i guess i should be at this moment that's kind of cheap i wouldn't like that i don't like that i i really like the idea of ang wrestling with the idea of killing ozai and is he going to do it how's he going to get out of it and he's handed a third option to get out of that uh quandary yeah I but think... i can kind of accept it because it's just it kind of it plays into the world and the culture. We've got a few options. I've got a favorite one out of these, but I'll I'll go through a couple. So one, they kind of some of a brutal, right? So let's say he kills him, and then they leave us with a changed Ang. And like the problem with that one, as a writer on the staff, I'd be like, I don't know if we can do this because yeah. it's very tough to have a happy ending. This there. is for kids as well, so we got to be really careful with our yeah. messaging. Like the idea is like sometimes you gotta kill a person. <laughs> Like, I don't, maybe. <laughs> so, okay, kids. Sometimes you just have to commit murder. Okay, sometimes it just has to happen. So then another okay. option was is... he could break his arms and legs, and like it's brutal, <laughs> it but he's alive, and he's like, oof, that's still hard to translate for a kids show. And I was like, so this is my favorite one. He neutralizes him, <laughs> like knocks him out, whatever, puts him in a prison, and you get the scene right that happens with like basically all superheroes and villains that do this. He's like, this I'll place will next time. Well, this, Ang. the whole like this won't hold me forever, and then Ang will be like, yeah. and once you get out, I'll be waiting for you. Yeah, I mean, th then it wouldn't have been f as final as it was because taking his earth bending, I mean, his, his fire bending away was pretty final. Oh yeah, he essentially killed him. He, he's a he's pretty useless. He's, he's just a guy. Now. That was you. He and Ozai in particular. Like, if you took away Iroh's bending ability, it probably wouldn't have been that detrimental to his life but ozai is totally different ozai is this he's all about power all about being the best and strongest firebender which is why he preferred azula over zuko and treated zuko pretty much like trash like he didn't exist and so yeah taking away his firebending capability is essentially death you killed the man ozai uh, you killed his spirit and his uh you shattered everything he yeah, thought was yeah. important in life so that's pretty bad and right? you get why like but uh they didn't want to introduce it any earlier because i think we'd all be like well that's what he's gonna do and the question wouldn't be should yeah. i kill him or should i not it would be just energy bend him okay and yeah. you could, i think it, you wouldn't, it wouldn't come in that. as a savior you could have been like you have to have a you have to get him into a position where you can do it and you have to have a big fight and then you know all that stuff but yeah, they just sort of just like use that new thing you got yesterday and <laughs> just win. Because that's something else. Well, he had that... to fight Ozai still. He had to beat him into submission before he could actually. Use yes, it. which is another thing that I take, I guess, personal issue with. Um, so what I did like about the show was several. When we're talking a lot of episodes. They will be like time to train, train time. We're doing some training in the in and amongst different <laughs> stories. That's good. You get, I think you may have heard that there's some characters that don't require such things. And they can achieve stuff. <laughs> Some anyway. characters just don't, they just don't need training. They're just gods. And so, right from the get go, you know, um, 
the Godzilla creature at the end of season one, it'd be like, okay, so his training isn't why he can do that. It's because he's accessing the, the Avatar state, combining with the Koi fish, the power, spirits, that all, all that thing. Um, and so I've got that in my head, and I'm like, so he's training earth bending, air bending, fire bending, and um, uh, water bending because he needs them to defeat Ozai. Okay. <clears throat> why wouldn't he just need to get a a grip on the Avatar state. What was, what's the relevance of all those other things when the uh, the Avatar state is what annihilates Ozai? Like, he, you know, he has all the elements floating around him. He's just this ball of like fuck you energy and just like uh, re destroys him. Like, what I guess I wanted to see was like he uses the water whip to counter a move from Ozai. He um, he uses like the the all the different moves that he's sort of been taught over the season and defeats him that way, like no Avatar State, especially because what I liked was they were kind of building this whole like Avatar State is what is like a final resort and, and he doesn't even like it because it's not him anymore. It's more a collective of people. And so yeah, like if he can, I think like a climax would have been really awesome to have him almost go into the Avatar state, pull back, and then beat uh, Ozai's own way without actually having to use it. Um, but instead, he, That'd be interesting, yeah. he goes full Avatar state and sort of destroys him with the incredible <laughs> powers that are all being provided from, you know, thousands of years of history from all these other Avatars. Like, yeah, that's fine with me. I was just like, at this point, I'm like, man, that intro is kind of funny now. It's like, he's, you know, his, his airbending is great, <laughs> but he needs to trade all the other things to defeat Ozai. It's just like, does he, though? <laughs> like, it doesn't really, you know... It might have been more of a because because he can't be in Avatar state all the time. Uh, oh, of course, because uh, uh, usually the uh, the Avatar is usually in a, not in the Avatar state, and you have to the throughout, fight. throughout the to show. Fight the they're always like, "You've got to get this right for when you fight Ozai." Like this yeah. is the the big thing for Ozai is the going to end the war once you yeah. figure out a duel. And I'm just sitting there like it's more <laughs> for everything else. He needs to learn all this stuff. Yeah, I think uh, maybe. Since they did that, it might be more of a spiritual thing as well as being able to defend yourself outside the Avatar state. But you know how the um, the Buddhist monks, they practice martial arts as a form of meditation for a spiritual enlightenment and to discipline their minds and bodies. That, that might be as part of the reason why the Avatar is like that, is why they have to train traditionally. This is a tradition, thousands of years of tradition, where the, the Avatar is trained in all four stats, uh, elements. Uh and they, they tend to be prodigies in all four elements. It's, they can grasp it really quickly because they have they can already uh, subconsciously access uh, all thousands and generations of of knowledge. Uh, but then they have the avatar state, which is seems to be just raw power, and they might be able to manipulate one thing or another. But it seems to be that uh, I don't know. The, I'm not sure if this is actually stated or not, or even implied, but. Going through all four elements, training all four elements, might be a uh, spiritual thing that where they meditate and focus their mind and body. The avatar focuses the mind and body so that when they are in the avatar state, they can control it a little bit more. They have a more, it's easier to manipulate the world around them as they are in the avatar state, as they battle in the avatar state. The fact that he became Godzilla, like, I just feel like once he taps into the Avatar state, <laughs> Aang isn't even there anymore. It's all of the thousands of Avatars together. This I think that is implied, yeah. It's, it's a it's all of them together. That's why I think when he speaks in the Avatar state, he even has that multi-voice yeah, effect. The spooky, like, you will bow yeah. before me sort of voice. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a Benil before Zod sort of thing. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I think it's it might be because, I, the way I took it anyway was, for that reason that you you train and your training allows you to tap into the avatar state easier or able to control the control yourself more while you're in the avatar state because he's, he's done some pretty brutal and terrible things while in the avatar state even laments over some uh so that's what i got from the need for training that he needs to train so that he can uh control himself a little bit better and more and be more effective in the avatar state not just go murdering everybody yeah, I, I just, I didn't really feel it when I was watching that. Like, I didn't, I always I separate, like, Avatar State Aang from Aang. Like, the, he moves to a different, just, situation entirely when he's, when he's doing that. And I just wish that, um, yeah. Ozai was beaten without it. I guess. And, and I guess the other element of this, I don't know how you, how you feel about it, but, like, 
being pushed back onto a rock that hits him in his spine where he was hit by the lightning reconnects his chakra and allows him to enter the avatar state to me is insane mm -hmm. i mean the the thing about he was chucked by lightning which is actually part of the the human body we have a, a lot of electrical things in front of our minds mm -hmm. and we we move by electrical shock so and to me the lightning specifically might be uh and lightning is close to spiritualism in that sense you could kind of take the lightning as being able to disrupt one chakra and so the where it hit there might be a, a disconnect of where the chakra is and so when you have a when you have a connection when you have when you get hit there it might just be like a, oh, a tap and reconnects to, it for a little bit to clarify I don't, I don't actually have an issue with that specifically like the idea that he's got a chakra at the bottom of his spine he's hit by lightning near mm -hmm. there it separates it and if you were to yeah. give it a sharp hit back, you could probably reconnect it, like a dislocated shoulder. I can I can swallow that. <laughs> the part that I can't is, like, he's in a fight that he's about to lose, and he can't access the <laughs> Avatar state to save him, and he falls back into a rock that gets it back. Like, I was just like, wow. <laughs> like, fucking hell, that was close, wasn't it? I think there's just, uh, that part was just, you know, you're running the mill contri protagonist contrivance. <laughs> And just I, I, I know feel like we could have. I just prefer the whole like he's trying to not use it, you know, uh, because he doesn't right. want to, because he knows he'll annihilate Ozai, and he doesn't even want to necessarily, because all the other avatars are like, yeah, kill him. So once he becomes the avatar yeah. in the avatar state, he knows that it's out of his hands almost. Everyone um, just says, "Kill this, kill Ozai." What are you doing? Which like, which makes you wonder how he speared him in the avatar state, actually, if he is a collective of a thousand minds. I think it's because of the training, uh, because he was able to, by that time, he was a master, more or less, of all the elements, and he was, he went through a lot of challenges and tribulations, and he was able to focus his mind and body a little bit more by, but enough he to, was essentially a different person. Like, enough to overcome them? Yeah, I mean, he, he, they might be uh, all avatars and very, very skilled avatars, but they're still spirits. Aang is the one who's alive. So well, then again, his actually, dominance, his will him, became stronger. Sparing him is perfectly logical when you have access to the energy bending thing. Because this is the thing. I didn't, yeah. I wasn't, I, I'd have to rewatch it, but as far as I was aware, they only imply that's something that can happen as a result of the energy bending. And that when we see it, we're like, whoa. Like, it's not like the Lion Turtle explicitly says, you can use this to stop people from firebending. <laughs> I don't think he says that. So, um, if we knew that was the the thing, we probably, I think all of us as an audience would be like, do that. Yeah, do that. Do it. Do that one. That's yeah. a good option. And so him not killing Ozai, I was just like, well, yeah, why not, right? You can just, you can just new, new to him. I would, you'd think the avatars would be aware of that possibility if they span all the way back to the uh, origin, you know? Right. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think again, I think the, I wasn't the, I'm not sure if the lion turtles were the ones that gave people bending or not, but uh, well, they are in Korra. <laughs> but the thing about Korra is. I think we want to not gonna, consider Korra, right? Yeah, like, in the same way that <laughs> if someone said, Star Wars sucks, uh, and we're talking about the OT because of the sequels, I'd be like, we're not, that's not, we're not, no. <laughs> um, I guess the example kind of would be if you try to justify some kind of mistake in the OT with the sequels, mm -hmm. you then have to take all of the weight of the sequels and all of their shit, right? So it's just like, eh, we'll just, right. we're going to ignore the whole thing, it's fine. Because Korra, right. uh, I don't, I don't want to watch Korra. <laughs> if if the Avatar fans the consider book. it to be the TLJ of Avatar, like why the hell would I go even near it? <laughs> I just heard nothing but bad stuff from Korra. I saw the first book; it wasn't it wasn't too bad as far as I remember. Although mm -hmm. I, rem I don't remember much, which might be a, an indication of how good well, it was. You remember, right? She's like mastered three elements bending when she's like one years old. She, she was like, yeah, when she was like a, a kid, she was already bending all the elements on her own. I guess she learned them in a room, listened to her podcast or something. I don't know. But she, like, she's, she just bursts out of her room already slinging fire and lightning and, or maybe not lightning yet, but fire and, and uh, earth and water and air. Oh, I just, I, I've seen all the clips from uh, Eeyore's videos of Korra. <laughs> when uh, <laughs> she has all of her bedding taken away from her, uh, but they didn't take she, cause she, she doesn't know how to airbend, but she figures it out then, once she's had the other three taken from her, as a huge climax. And it's like, he didn't just block that one off too? Like, wouldn't he just block them all? Why would he... Okay. And then she just gets them given back to her, I think at the end of the season or whatever. They're just like, ah, there you go. She's the avatar. <laughs> Why not just cut off everything, you know? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> fucking... I, like, I don't even... This is like, I don't even want to watch Korra. I think my brain will explode. Um... 
<laughs> All right. So, you know, do you remember Gen General Zhao? Season one. Which, which guy? Oh, you mean the, was he the one that was He's uh, like the season Zuko's one villain. opposite? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, Zuko's opposite. He was the one that like took over the, uh, killed the koi fish or something. Killed the, he killed yes, the moon. Yes, yes. So, okay. um, he found out about the coming eclipse and what eclipses do to the Fire Nation when he was in the library in the desert. And he burned mm -hmm. all of the information because it reveals the Fire Nation's weakness. He doesn't want anyone finding it. It's like, yep, that makes sense. Um, it's right. surprising that very few firebenders seem to even be... Like, as far as I'm aware, it's literally just him and the people he has told, which is very few people. Um, you'd think... Because this is, this is going to get complicated, right? Try and stay with me because I even confuse myself. When they <laughs> discover, Sokka and Aang discover that um, the Eclipse is the key to taking the Fire Nation's power away, they need to find a day when that happens again, right? They need to So they can prepare for war. And um, Sokka says, like, we can't check every day. That's ridiculous. And he's like, no, no, no. We need to check from today up to Sozin's Comet because that's the only time frame we can use because Sozin's Comet is game over. So we got to get it in that time zone. And so they search those days while the building is filling with sand because um, Toph is trying to prevent it from going further into the ground. But obviously the, the owl has opened up, uh, I guess, windows and stuff to let sand from the outside pour in. But it just right. like it's it, this is a nitpick. It just stops pouring when they start searching all of the uh, the the days. I was just like, hmm, <laughs> this is fine. <laughs> um, so so they search and they find an eclipse. Like if you're telling me that these eclipses happen once per one hundred years, they were lucky as hell to get that one between then and Sozin's comet, which in universe time I want to say is a couple months. I can't remember exactly, but it's it's a small amount of time simultaneously because if you wanted to say to me like oh well you know they get an eclipse every every couple of months so it kind of makes sense that they'd find one it's like yeah but then everyone would know right because every couple of months all of the fire nation would be like damn my fire yeah, is gone it wouldn't be that big of a secret no so it wouldn't be that big of a secret at all i know that sounded jumble but probably find my issue there right <laughs> i guess it's uh try to straighten it out yeah, like uh, they go to that little map thing. I think it was a map or something. It was the big. It was a planetarium thing can, um, twist. Yeah, planetarium. That's what it was. So they can like switch through and see every day what the what the stars and things are doing, and you can see the comet coming in. Uh, yeah, that's pretty. It's pretty lucky. <laughs> it's, it's pretty lucky for the other yeah. thing that was interesting uh, is like, they first find out about an eclipse because they they type mm -hmm. in whatever. Uh, they because Saka picks up this half burnt parchment. And they use the date on the parchment, and they search for it, and it was the previous, or whenever the last uh, uh, eclipse was, and that's what tips them off. They're like, ah. And so I was just thinking to myself, like, damn, Zhao, the whole point was to burn any evidence, and you fucking just didn't <laughs> with that one. <laughs> it's like, well, fuck it. The, I don't know. They're gonna messed up there. Yeah, like, because I would have just... I'm surprised the owl allowed <laughs> him to burn down the whole fucking portion of the library. That owl was angry uh, at them. <laughs> <laughs> just for finding stuff out, right? But with him burning down all of the library, the, the, I just picture the owl being like, you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, dude. <laughs> um, yeah. You think that the owl would make would take better care of his stuff? Oh, I think yeah. he would eat Zhao. Only... He'd be like, you piece of shit, burning my books. Yeah, there's there's no one in, and there's no one in that library. What's the owl doing? He's <laughs> off playing Nintendo? I, lo no I love the there. idea that someone's like, just reading, and he's just like, you okay? You all right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what you read? Sitting right next to him, like, <laughs> by, by the fireplace. <laughs> Nothing. Whatever your name is, who, the guy who knows ten thousand things. I'm just reading. Uh, this, you have some an excellent collection of porn here. Okay, you don't want to look over here. Oh, sorry. The sacred library pornography. I just reading. remembered as well. Uh, the the only other thing I wanted to mention about that final fight with uh, mm -hmm. at the end of this season three. Um, mm -hmm. I thought it was really cool that he used the seismic ability that he'd learned from Toph. To counter, oh yeah, uh, uh, Ozai. But I, I remember. Th so this was something I was going to bring up as a positive, and then I was like, "Why did he do that?" Because obviously, if you're facing someone, you won't need that, um, because you can see them moving, right? Um, uh, and and you check the seed. He's in the air with his big old powerful elemental stuff. Ozai uh, is on like a platform, and Ang lands with his back to Ozai. Like, I have no idea why he does that. And then Ozai goes to do a thing and, and it activates the seismic thing. And I was like, why? 
Like, I, you wanted to give a reason for why he'd use the seismic ability. Why did you make him turn his back on the Ozai at the peak of the, like, climax of the battle? That was just such a weird thing for me. <laughs> but, uh, I always we... thought that, that part where, where Aang turns his back on Ozai was, the, was like an act of dominance. Where, like, uh, I don't care about you. You're so <laughs> insignificant to me. That's going to turn your back. I want to turn my back on you. you well, you can't I, mean, I guess it You're works, nothing. right? Because he, he locks him down and then energy bends the flumps out of him. Yeah. I, was, I was surprised that, um... Rock stops him. If you remember, Azula breaks out of uh, Rock handcuffs just by using fire. Yeah. Uh, so I'd be surprised mm -hmm. that Ozai, on the day of Sozin's Comet, he didn't even fire breathe, like, which is, I'm pretty sure he can do that. I'm pretty sure all of them can do that, actually. It's like a. Especially when Sozin's Comet is in flight, because they can also fly, right? I, or he can fly. Actually, I'm not sure, because to me, that fire breathing, you know, this uh, bring out like a dragon, with well, what Iroh can do it, because. Iroh is Iroh. He doesn't care yeah, about yeah. being uh, undignified. Well, but um, Ozai is all about it. dignity. I mean, Ozai is all about dignity, though. I mean, I can see Azula doing it because she's really practical. But Ozai isn't really as practical as Azula. He's really about all about char charisma and showing off, which is why he became the Phoenix King in the first place. So I, well, I can see Azula doing it. I can see Iroh doing it for different reasons on both of their ends. I can see. I can't really see Ozai doing the fire breathing because that seems to be too brute for him to. Uh, <laughs> to I mean, if, unbecoming if you're in that situation, though, right? Like you're gonna have to go. I mean, he might, it, have, right? might not even have ever have learned. Like, oh, my bro my nasty brother does that. I'm not gonna learn how to do that. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was still surprised he didn't try and break out. I guess. Um, with the, the yeah, I mean, he might have been really defeated. I mean, he might have been so because his his the whole thing with Ozai is his ego. It's huge ego, and uh, he probably. I mean, I know I keep saying probably, but this seems to be fitting with his character that I can't believe I just got defeated. Hmm. I thought I could beat the Avatar. And I've seen villains fall into this. this shot. There's a trope for it where they become, um, I think, Radigan from uh, that one mouse detective one where he goes from oh, elegant yeah. man to rat to this disheveled monstrous thing because he's oh, being dude, defeated. He's, he's scary at the end of that film. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I that, remember watching with that when I was a lot. Young. As me too. It was a fantastic, fantastic movie. I like it. I like it a lot. I especially like the fact that he lives underneath uh, Sherlock Holmes' house. Yeah. <laughs> but the villains tend to do that. It's it's been a regular thing that villains tend to go through and become a trope. And especially with, specifically with uh, villains who are egotistical or put themselves on a higher pedestal than everyone else. And Ozai is that to the T. So I could, and you could see him becoming more and more frustrated as the fight goes on because he can't just instantly incinerate the avatar like he thought he was going to be able to the power of sozin's comet and he's he's so egotistical which is and his ego destroys his relationship with azula azula basically goes mad because now he has a kind of cast her aside so he can become the phoenix king leaving her holding an empty crown and so he his ego is destroying every single relationship he's ever held dear even to the to even to azula who worshiped the man and so his ego was so immense that he became so frustrated and his, he became sloppy as the battle between him and the Avatar went on and he could not defeat the Avatar. And then by the time he's wearing those cuffs, I could see his spirit being totally shattered and in, in his mind saying, I, I, how did this happen? This, is, this can't be right. And that his shock lasted so long and with giving Aang enough time to spirit bend him, which... It will it kills his ego. I mean, I'm pretty sure I might <laughs> want to commit suicide. At that the point. ego will be dead after <laughs> that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I could. That's that's how I saw why he didn't do that. Because of course, if he was in his right mind and all powerful, and they just maybe they just sort of snuck in with Toph, and she just zapped some some cuffs on him at his height of his power, he just no, oh, just break these easily. I can defeat anybody. But at that point specifically, he was defeated and his ego was shattered. And that is why I think he kind of held those cuffs in place. He didn't really do anything. Couldn't fight back because his spirit was gone, uh, metaphorically. And then his spirit was literally gone or bent uh, soon after. Do you remember when Appa <laughs> is captured? Um, yes, he was captured by. Uh, wasn't he captured by Zuko or somebody? It was like a. It's like a Fire Nation circus thing. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. And so the problem with Appa is really he's like, I'm gonna tame you uh, because you're you're a crazy dude. And um, every time he tries to like prevent Appa from getting food, Appa finds like, this like two, he, he like ear bends food toward him and this kid uh, gave him <laughs> something to eat as well. And so, um, and then we, we move on to like this scene where it's clear that uh, the guy is going to use Appa as like an attraction. And so the first confusion mm -hmm. I had when I was watching this uh, was like, 
Oh my god, uh, he's got like chains on his ankles, I guess. Um, and I was like, oh, that must prevent him from flying because obviously if he could fly, he'd just escape. But then I realized that um, his act requires him to fly through fire hoops. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so why doesn't he just escape? Um, again, I hope I don't get flagged for copyright with this one. So the, the 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 thing is like, oh, maybe it's that dude with the fire whip. And it's like, well, I mean, Appa could just fly out right now. But instead he's like sort of plague along for a moment. And then he gets singed and he's like, ow, that hurts. And then this happens. <laughs> I love he slaps that. it down. <laughs> it just looks so funny. Um, <laughs> for those who can't see it, uh, Appa hits a hoop and the hoop just bonks the uh, the dude right on the head. And yeah, so I'm just confused. Like, Appa just fly away, right? And then I was thinking to myself, like, oh, there's going to be a reason why he can't, I guess. Um, and he ends up, like, just booting this dude. You can check this out. <laughs> Appa's awesome. Appa is awesome. <laughs> um, and then he just flies out. And I was like, oh. What an awful... Need to be here like, anymore. Why? <laughs> like, I just... It was... Like, how stupid does that circus owner have to be? I don't know. So, like, I thought that was dumb. And then you move on and Appa's, like, obviously hungry, injured. He's, like, splintered He's by tired this... tired on the road. Uh, thing well, Aang had always been taking care of him. I, no, no, no. I like I I think this stuff is pretty good. Uh, he, and he's like he's pretty ruined at this point. And he hides in like this little yeah. place. Check this bit out, right? I think he's found by the uh, Kyoshi people, right? Well, this is, so these yeah. are, these are some issues we're coming to, right? So first of all, I find this hilarious. She picks this off a bush, and she's like, "Huh, where'd this come <laughs> from?" And look look at this shot now. <laughs> How didn't you oh, see that's that? <laughs> <laughs> Seems more significant than the other thing. We're just like, okay. So they uh, they follow the trail, naturally, and they get up to Appa, and it's like, good god, lucky that someone who knows you very well happened upon you in this this area. Someone who cares about you to the point that they they deep they, they pluck those things out of him, they feed him, they rest him up, and he's back to full health. And I was just like, wow. And then fucking Azula and the two girls just show up because apparently they were keeping an eye on the fur and they saw some and they just went to this place. I was blown away. I was just like, what? It's like, I was just like, why is everyone just showing up? But you, was, you, um, you can't just imagine that the people from who live on an island thousands of miles away would just appear first. They were they they were looking for that fur and they they saw it. And they're like, all right. If for the people who you know they arrive first before the people who are actually chasing them, whose job is it is to chase them down? Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I forgot the context of that of that little scene, but well, uh, <laughs> those sorts of things, like I, I can agree, are like, small. But like in my experience, there was there's there's lots in several episodes that are they drive me down, right? Because like I'm constantly trying to get invested, and I'm just like, but how did? Oh, but why? Really? Oh, wow, that sort of experience. <laughs> Um, I guess death by a thousand cuts is probably how I would describe it. And some of these may not be very accurate. Maybe I've uh, fucked up some of these. Like I said, it's very possible. It's just that um, uh, a lot of it seems I, so strange to me. I think at that scene, Kyoshi, the Kyoshi warriors were... I mean, they're, they're already friends with the Avatar from or season one. But I think they were actually looking for the Avatar to, pro like, to protect him or something. I don't remember that episode specifically. But I think they were actively looking for Aang also. It just so happened to Stumble upon Appa. Well, like, the, because they found Appa his fur. and Aang are in very different areas at that point. Because uh, Appa's been missing for a couple of days at, at that, I think. Yeah. And he's obviously been put into the circus. And he's just sort of flying. Um, And yeah, obviously, they, they, they the show tries to justify they've stumbled across his fur. That's what led them to him. Which is more believable yeah. than simply bumping into him. But it's not like he was that far away. <laughs> he was kind of just right there. <laughs> But yeah, um, it's an, I don't. I don't think even fate covers that. But still, um, I think it's one of one of those um, your protagonist contrivances. Mm -hmm. He's just been through so much that his karma is bound to turn. I mean, that's, that's what we're expecting to see. That Appa has been whipped. He's been tortured. He's been put into a circus, and he managed to escape. Managed to fight his way free, and then he just fell into an even worse predicament where he's just on his own. He has to steal food. He has. He's just fighting off animals, and he's being. Because at the, until that point, he's kind of a spoiled, <laughs> sorry to say, Appa, 
But he's kind yeah. of been spoiled in that boy. He's been taken care of by by Aang and the gang. They've been brushing him. They've been you know taking care of him. They've been feeding him. He, all the app has to do is fly, fly him around, and the the gang just takes care of him. At that point, he doesn't have the gang. He has to fend for himself after all this time because he was frozen in there too. He's frozen in the ice too. He hasn't he hasn't been able have he hasn't have to uh, take care of himself because who knows? I don't think he was. I don't think he had to fend for himself either. When he was at this, when he was at the air temple with Aang, so this is the, really the first time he's had to. Yeah, he's been in this situation, and so we see him suffer and go through all sorts of mishaps, and we're just wanting to see him stop suffering. And finally, at the end, we get to see his his uh, luck sort of turn, his karma sort of turn, and it's kind of a a cycle in and so, in of its in and of itself. So it's acceptable to me because it's kind of a, the cycle of the story of the episode. Appa suffers. Appa's in a terrible position. He suffers and suffers and suffers until finally he's able to survive on his own volition long enough that he re he's rewarded with a turn of the fates, a turn of the karma. I yeah, I'm on, I'm totally on board with that. I would just want to make it more um, wasn't effect stuff. I would just uh, spend a chunk of time oh, yeah. trying to figure out how do we get it all to uh, sort of line up with just other events that are happening. You know, um, let's get a reason for why maybe they are looking for Appa. You know the. Uh, the Kyoshi Warriors. Um, we we can you know this we may have to make some structural changes, but I, I would totally be on board with that. I'd be like, yeah, let's go, let's do it. Because um, I like Appa. He's my I think he's my second favorite oh, yeah. character behind Iroh. <laughs> I like Appa too. <laughs> Iroh is fantastic. I love Iroh is awesome in everything he's in <laughs> until after after Mako dies. Not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of brush him off to the side. But uh, when Mako's alive, Iroh is fantastic. He's always cheerful. He always has his plan up his sleeve. He is um he's a trickster slash mentor character. Oh yeah, he's like he's like on the good guys team from the moment we meet him, and, and you sort of sit there wondering like why is this guy with the fire bed? Does he's like oh well? <laughs> um, he was this legendary general. You find out he's this legendary general who's like the most hardcore general has ever lived. Mm. But now he's just this old man who just kind of ah who cares? Just, I'll just sit around enjoy my tea. So uh, and then, uh, if anyone wants to mess with me, I'll just destroy everything they love. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's a bit. Uh, if you remember how um, Kitara's origin story, if you will. So someone found out that they were because the Southern Tribe has any waterbenders uh, captured slash killed. Let's just say killed because they get killed on sight apparently. And but yeah. another one is born, right? Or at least there is one there. That's that's all. Apparently, an informant told the Fire Nation this alone. There is a there is a waterbender in the Southern Tribe. They're like okay, so they go there, and there's like this big fight going on. But um, we find out that it, it is Katara is the one that's actually able to waterbend. But Katara's mother claims to be the waterbender, and she's like, "Take me away!" And the guy's like, "Nope, we're gonna kill you." And um, she obviously dies for her. I thought it was really strange, right? Because the Fire Nation are in a position where they want to essentially eradicate the other benders. At least that's not my assumption. Because the next bender is going to be the next Avatar will be a water one, assuming the air one's dead, which I think they assume. Um, so they're wiping out the water benders, which makes sense to me. Uh, they're wiping out the people in the Southern Tribe whenever a water bender rises or is heard about. They're like, kill it, kill it, kill it. Part that blows my mind is that, like, if we turned up, let's say me and you, we're the, uh, the grand Fire Nation Inquisitor people, and we're gonna kill that waterbender, we, sh we show up and this person just says, I'm totally the waterbender, you have to kill me. I'd be like, uh-huh. So, uh, do me a favor and just waterbend for a little bit, just so I can confirm it. Otherwise, I'll kill your whole village, because I've been sent to kill one, there's one here, I'm not going to let someone take a bullet here, Spartacus style. We're just going to get the one, all right? And, I, and it's a very definitive system. You cannot fake waterbending. And funnily enough, I think that um, we could have had it be that way. Like, Katara tries to maybe help her mother by waterbending, but um, she's a little bit maybe out of sight or to a degree, and like the mother takes credit for the bending itself. Like, she does the movement. She's like, I'm the one who's bending the whole time. It's like, <gasps> and then um, the guy you know, believes it is her and kills her. The crazy part to me was just that she just says, I'm I'm the waterbender, kill me, and he does, and they leave, when you'd think the Fire Nation would be desperately invested in making sure they eradicate any and all waterbenders, because it could be the Avatar. Okay, she'll be back. Hopefully I could stay alive long enough to finish <laughs> this up. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have no idea what's wrong with 
I have no idea why it does that. I've done so many things to try to fix that. But this continues, uh, this stays with me. I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. Well, I can um, I can cut all of the, the gaps out, so it'll be fine. Uh, fantastic. Uh... People are already, they're already used to that by now. They've seen Smudge Boys stream. <laughs> I, I, that happens at least once or twice every stream. So, uh, did you? What was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, let's see, um, I heard you talking about how it was. Um, let's see, what was it? Oh yeah, the the water bending. Why? Why they went over there? They um, they probably killed Katara's mother because she <laughs> said that she was a water bender when Katara was a water bender. Yeah, and, so like, uh, it, I'll just because uh -huh. I'll, I'll go over it again just to make sure because like the, there's a lot of parameters to it, right? So like, mm -hmm. they wipe out the air nomads, which I don't know how they do considering nomads, like pretty pretty difficult to wipe out all of them, but they they apparently stuck to the, the <laughs> temples, <laughs> whatever. Fine. Uh, well, so they wipe them out out of desperation of making sure the avatar, uh, won't destroy them sort of thing and then so like they want to keep that up they're like the water is going to be next because i think i think any reasonable person in that universe would assume um ang died or whoever right. the bender was died and so they'd be like it's gonna be a water bender next and so apparently they've been wiping them out wherever they find them because they can't breach the northern pole but they can the southern one kindly they've decided not to kill everybody <laughs> in the southern pole only the water benders <laughs> like wow that's all right, I'm surprised it's the Fire Nation. You know, you'd think they just. That's where I thought you were going. How come they just didn't kill everybody? They killed most of them. There's only like a what a like ten. Yeah, people. It's, it almost seems mean. Like, <laughs> like just being like, yeah, yeah, we'll leave some of you. So you're the Fire Nation, right? And you get told by an informant of some kind there is confirmed a waterbender in the Southern Tribe, and it's like, oh my goodness. So they send us two out to go and kill him or her or whoever. And so we, we, we turn up, and there's like this group of them, and we're like, alright, who's the waterbender? And just some person steps forward and goes, it's totally me. Would you be like, uh-huh. You wanna <laughs> prove it? Uh, that they do the thing? Or they, they wiggle their arms, nothing happens, and they're like, sorry, I'm off my game today. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> prove it. That, that tells, me, that tells me that the, the general who did that was very, very lazy. They said, alright, you say that you're the waterbender, fine, we'll just kill you and just leave it. <laughs> we'll just tell everybody we definitely did uh, that. Sir, are we going to wipe off the rest of the Southern Water Tribe just to make sure? Uh, we could. That's a whole thing. Well, that's, that's a whole day. That's what work. I would expect Ozai to do because <laughs> they're in a position where um, they're just going to keep on breeding, as you do in a little tribe. And it's genetic, right? And it can skip generations, meaning that eventually you're going to pop up some waterbenders there. <laughs> so, fuck it, wipe them out. Just wipe them out. We wipe out people all the time. We wiped out the most peaceful people of this universe, so let's just, just wipe them out. <laughs> but okay. That's the air number. They, Those people, people, people in the world, they they killed them all. So. Yeah, um, but I think it's because it was happened so recently. There's not really a defense, but it's more like something that, might, that probably would have happened if this scenario were existing in the real world or whatever. And there's probably like at that time, the Fire Nation already conquered much of the world. The Southern Water Tribe is basically nothing. They killed all their men and all that stuff. They presumed oh, of course, death. it's the danger of the yeah. Avatar rising, though, isn't it? Yeah, but well, then it said, okay. We found one water bitter down there. Uh, just send somebody to go kill it, and then, and then the guy goes. It's probably like a, a low-ranking job. Like they said, probably sent like the worst general they could. And remember the general they sent? He's now living with his mom, and well, he he's was kind of a um, loser. As far I'd have to check, but I thought he was like the leader of that particular faction or something. That was the guy who did it. He was because they find out later that there's a different leader now, and that's why they nearly mistakenly uh, mm -hmm. punish the wrong guy. But, so I mean, he's not like it, low it, rank, as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, they probably put someone who he probably been he could have been high rank because, uh, you know, there was a whole thing about I'm just gonna we have too many sons. I'm just gonna put him somewhere where he's he, pretty high ranking, where he won't cause any trouble. Because <laughs> it could have been that sort of scenario. I don't know. They don't tell us anything about that. They don't tell us mm -hmm. a reason why they didn't kill all the the entire Southern Water Tribe, which they easily could have. Sokka is the only one left that can really defend anybody. He's, is useless at the beginning. They don't really tell us any of that. So the only presumption I could take is that the guy was this really lazy or kind of like incompetent or just he just wanted to get on with his day because we just want to get done and get back because the water, the southern water tribe that's it's all cold it's not <laughs> it's not very comfortable so I just want to get back back home after where they get my rewards and everything um yeah, uh, I, something I forgot to bring up earlier. I, I do this a lot, and I'm sorry about that. Um, you know how they they get to the planetarium thing in that library? Like a, a fox yeah, spirit is just like, hey, over here. <laughs> and like, 
I, I get it, spirits want to help them out and stuff, but like, holy shit. <laughs> it really feels like a writing tool where it's like, I don't know how they get there, fucking spirit shows them. <laughs> like, okay. Unfortunately for that, I mean, if, I think this was an instance of, we need to do, we need to get them some there somehow. Uh, what what can we use? Uh, will we reestablish that Aang is the bridge between the mortal realm and the spiritual realm? Let's have a you know, have a Spock, fox spirit lead the way. All right, sounds good. I just would have had a door that requires <laughs> like, uh, you know, the whole. They do it a couple times where it's like you know you need to be a bender of certain whatevers. Um, maybe because it's like you know earth bend at that point. Maybe make it some kind of like all elements, and they have to find a way like a puzzly way to get it open, and it would explain why uh, Zhao couldn't get in there. You know. Yeah, I mean, but the uh, a door is not nearly as cute as a fox spirit. True, so. very true. Um, you, uh, it was kind of weird that that episode where they they watched the play. I was like, how did the play know <laughs> all of the things? <laughs> they that to one know very specific that, information. That one, you 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 gotta turn your brain off for that one. That's, <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's implied that they've since they've traveled so many so uh, so many places and they've done so many things along their travels. They had a, they got all the information from hearsay and secondhand sources, which like they kind of piece things together. Which I does still doesn't explain how they knew about Jet and how he died, mm. and how they, they even mentioned that oh that's that was actually not um, confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> but it does explain how they got like Toph wrong, and uh, how everything is not spot on, but hilariously a little bit off. Uh, but that's that's why. I, I kind of gathered that they went to the the play and they saw that uh, and they put the a play together based on stories and tales and hearsay that they've heard, which is kind of how plays used to be hmm. put together a little bit. I like the theory that it's the Cabbage Man. He's been giving all the information. He's always, he's always there. I, um, I really want the Cabbage Man to be someone like other than the Cabbage Man, like he's a secret agent or something, because he's everywhere. Some one day he's, he's a, a Cabbage Man. <laughs> He's a cabbage bender. Because well, one day he's, in, he's trying to get into bossing, say, and then they kick him out and they dump his cabbages. And the next day he's in, no, no, Omashu. <laughs> Omashu. Yeah. So he's trying to get into Omashu. They dump his cabbages over the side and say, get out of here. And the next day he's in Omashu just in time for Aang to dump all his cabbages again. Oh, and then man. he's everywhere. He's, he's everywhere they go. So uh, it seems like uh, it would be really interesting if he was someone else besides just, just a cabbage peddler. Um... So this one, this one's again kind of hard for me to frame. Uh, so scenario, you you got you're a team of people who don't want the king to find out that there's a war going on. This team are now aware that this this team of kids have been into their uh, underground facility, and so and they're probably going to tell the king about it. So and this is the, when I was watching it, I was like, well, they're they're earthbenders. They're just going to fill in that whole area, surely, and they do. And I was like, hey, nice. <laughs> and then. One of the characters is like, what about the drill? And I was like, what? And it was like, yeah, what about the <laughs> drill? Let's go get the, if they with the drills there, then it's proof that the war is happening. And the drill <laughs> is still there. And I was like, whoa. So to really get my point across, I was, I saw the drill and I was like, oh my God, it's been weeks. And they didn't remove the Fire Nation symbol for one, put a roof on top of the, they put walls around it. They didn't put a roof on it. So you could just see it from the castle walls. <laughs> they didn't fill the space with earth, right? You could just do that quickly. Like you could do that in a half hour if you knew that, you know, it's a danger, which they do because they took the precaution of fucking like filling in their entire holding facility and their brainwashing yeah. facility. Um, and then finally, why didn't you just bury the drill? You can actually build an area around it once it's buried to, you know, do whatever you want. Like, because there's a theory like, oh, well, they were they were uh, scavenging it. And it's like, yeah, 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 push yeah. it down, build a area, and then go go to town. But if they did that, how would they know, that, how would they prove there's a war going on? Because uh, <laughs> that was the thing. I was like, oh, they're going to have to uh, use, like... <laughs> Some kind of special, like a clever way of discovering the truth. I was like, "Oh my god, the drills to there!" Oh my god, <laughs> like, no. And then the dude is like, "Yeah, we imported it from the Fire Nation." <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? Why would you import a drill and drill your own? It's still in as well. So I thought, like, "Oh my god, is it still poking into the like main building?" With oh my god, and I was just like, "You're so incompetent." And obviously, that changes um, 
a lot of the storyline once they find that, and I was just blown away by it. <laughs> the guys bury it. I mean, they, 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 in that scenario, they've already had like a total domination. They have propaganda, everything inside the city. Even the king is inside the, you know, they don't want to believe that the war is going on. I think they even mentioned a war, and people are like, that's, that's dumb. You know, oh yeah, the, the citizens war. are either brainwashed yeah. or terrified about mentioning anything to do with the war. Yeah, and if anyone does uh, catch on... Yeah, no, they've done invite, a fantastic job guy. of nailing it, <laughs> except for that one piece of information they probably should have. So, under these circumstances, I think some people, don't some people even know that some people uh, like disappear uh, if they defy the king's Oh, for sure, yeah. The, obviously, the person they need to not find out anything is the king. And they're, yeah. they're quite cleverly like, yeah, King, go and look at anything you want. And obviously the citizens are going to be like, Ugh, like they're not going to say anything. And, yeah. you know, but if they show him the holding facility or whatever it is, then that'll, the jig is up. But they filled it in. It's like, ah. Yeah, yeah. That but one he probably couldn't. They forgot but, about I the mean, drill. If we're trying to convince that the, if we're trying to convince the Earth King there's no war going on, they're like, yeah, I mean, we, we got it from the Fire Nation. We're trying to, I don't know why, I mean. <laughs> I, he, he, I'm pretty sure that Long Feng knows the king well enough that he's really kind of, he doesn't care. He's kind of dumb. That's I, why he was able to take control in the first place. So yeah, Kingy, uh, here's your, here's the excuse you need to have in order to good in your mind that this is not going. There's nothing's happening. And you're like, oh, you just got a drill from the Fire Nation. All right, it's fine. I don't care. Good to go. I just, no, no uh, need to delve into that. There, because obviously that's his plan foiled at that point. I was just like, dude, one, one Earthbender, just drop him down there, put that hand on the ground, skidoo ba doo ba doom. At the very <laughs> least, it gives you more time. Like, just, just, I can't yeah. believe they left the Fire Nation symbol on it. At the very <laughs> least, scrub that off and put a sticker on it. You know, the smiley face. <laughs> It'll be fine. I mean, Longfang is also on the on the, the the same terms as Ozai. He's very egotistical. He he knows he controls the city, and when you're as egotistical as that, sometimes you can just let something like that slide. He's <laughs> like, okay, well, everyone. I mean, uh, and when you're secret police, sometimes it's if something is that overt, where it's sticking through the walls, is drilling through the walls of your city, then it, it's better not to hide it because it looks more suspicious if you hide it. Like, okay, there's a big gigantic mound where this drill was. Uh, it's still better than to, the uh, drill, though, right? Yeah, a little bit on the drill. <laughs> but he could say, if the best uh, to me, the best thing he did, he would he could do was the best thing he was, what he did. If he knows all the ins and outs, because he's saying, I'm give, it's give an excuse and explanation as to why this is here, rather than trying to hide it, because they can hide the facility. That's no problem. They can cover it up when they need to. What they, they, they did, the drill, however, is a little harder to hide. <laughs> it's a little bit more noticeable. Uh, especially from I oh, think well, this, this, the 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 thing that I would get, let's say the drill turned up the previous episode <laughs> I think I'd be okay with it but this thing's been there since like the half season yeah like, guys I, I mean if something. I were Long Fang I would I would find out a way how to excuse it how to explain it rather than to I mean if I were Long Fang I would explain it because it's easier I mean, they're they're the masters of the spinning story and propaganda do that's both. part of their job. I'd be like, let's hide it but, and hide it. generate a reason for why we have it in an underground facility. Let's say we're actually working on a war drill in case, you know, anything should go wrong. <laughs> and we imported from the Fire Nation. I, mean, <laughs> I wouldn't even, I would just get rid of the symbol. I'd be like, no, this is ours. It's like, really? Like, hmm. <laughs> well, I think that could work to his advantage. I mean, they're saying, because the Aang and the gang or whatever, they're saying that we're at war with the Fire Nation. What was this Fire Nation drill doing here then huh people of bossing say and the people yeah that's like, true you could see. actually spin it that way you'd be like uh, yeah. it was a collaboration Obviously. project we have yeah. a drill but maybe move it from being punctured into your own building <laughs> <laughs> stupid <laughs> asshole <laughs> they built walls around it that's the part that blows my mind it's like so you did try to hide it but you did the worst <laughs> possible job <laughs> like putting a blanket over it and that like, would oh, be better, actually. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's like, oh, whatever. It's, it's covered up enough. Okay, I don't get paid for this. <laughs> I get paid to. I get paid to spin propaganda and cool, wear this cool uniform. I don't get paid to hide gigantic drills. Okay, that's some. That's other people's work. <laughs> um, so something that didn't quite sit well with me was Zuko at the beginning of season two is told that all is forgiven. He can come home and sit by his father's side. Like that's the thing that he really wants. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Azula's betrayal is revealed by that um, very, very useful captain. Um, Take the prisoners away. Ad prisoners? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> um, as, uh, 
And Azula says, like, you're a failure. The only way you're ever returning home is in a prison cell or something like that. Mm -hmm. And obviously Zuko's, like, shaking in that scene. And I really like it because, like, that's probably the most earth-shattering news you could ever experience. The whole goal oh, yeah. of redemption has just been spat out and in the sense that you can't actually redeem yourself now. You're fucked. And Especially to the point, to Zuko. Uh, uh, yeah, and you you also have to consider that she um she's just dramatically betrayed him under her own their father's orders, which is very intense. And then she actually goes for the kill shot on him. She avada cadavers him, but uh, <laughs> uh, Iro stops it. Yeah, that's gonna be intense. Wasn't it Your sister thing? was about to kill you. Yeah, because obviously he 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 doesn't know how to deal with lightning at that point in the story, so he'd be dead. Yeah, um, he would have been. So like, I like all that apart from the stupid captain. But then at the end of season two, she's like, if you help me beat the Avatar, you can totally come home. And he's like, ooh. And then he eventually takes her up in the offer. And I was like, why would you, like, this <laughs> woman. And you have Iroh in the background being like, he says that. Th I have a problem with the dialogue in this show. He says, um, it is time for you to choose good. I was like, oh. So, thuds with like. <laughs> You know, you 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 wouldn't quite argue it like that. Typically, I don't think as a character, instead of just being so simplistic, it's like be a good. And he's like, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I suppose my issue is just that I get it. Like what the, what is being gone for here? It's the the everything he wants since the beginning, but now he's questioning all of that because uh, that's how far he's come. They make that very explicit in a lot of his dialogue. Do you remember the one where yeah. he says, um, "Why am I so bad at being good?" I think so, yeah. Yeah. A lot he, of, he tries um, to help people out, and then every time he helps people out, it ends up worse. I think <laughs> he's looking at a family portrait in one episode, and then he's like, I have everything I want, but it's not mm -hmm. what I really want. Yeah. And like, for me, I'm just like, oh, they really don't let me... Uh... I feel like it's the kind of stuff we should be saying, if you know what I mean. Not the <laughs> characters. Uh, besides the point, uh, the I find it almost an impossibility that he would in any way trust Azula, because they, they fight... Um, during season two, and obviously mm -hmm. that beginning of season two, she's like lying to him all the time. She's horrible. She tried to kill him, and then he's like almost making friends with Katara, and then he's presented, "If you kill the Avatar with me, you'll be you'll be accepted." And I'm just like, "Why would you ever trust her?" Because <laughs> he wants to. He wants it so bad. That's a, that's a pretty uh, interesting uh, flaw that people tend to have, especially with characters who want something so badly uh, that he wants to. Even though he might want to, it seems like he wants something else now. That might, he might not be, uh, he might be going away from desiring what he's wanted and desired for, since the beginning of the episode, from episode one of season one. Uh, he's presented with here's everything he wanted, here's everything he ever wanted. This uh, come with me, I'll convince you know, he, it's really easy to yeah. make the connections, but like that, that happened at the beginning of season two as well. Yeah, I mean, it's he's a. Uh, he, he even has to say that Azula always lies. He has to have a mantra for himself that Azula always lies. Because Azula is a powerful, like, a really, really talented liar. It's really hard to see. Uh, it's really hard to tell when she lies. Even though if you tell yourself that she's always lying, it's really hard not to believe her sometimes, especially when you can see a route to which she would actually be... Uh, if you, even if you don't trust her, there is a route where you can uh, trust her even. Like, it's just a route she where you can see... She's a talented liar if her reputation is liar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, she is a good, I mean, it's, you can, even if you know she's lying, she says things with such confidence mm. and such poise that it's really difficult to, uh, it, I mean, this is a scientific thing. People really, even if you know someone is lying, it's really hard not to listen to them. That's how cult leaders work, actually. <laughs> so this is almost a cult leader in that aspect. But uh, she has that charisma. She has that poise and, and, and confidence. That's really difficult for Zuko to say no to that, especially if he can kind of see how she can bring him back into the fold and get him whatever he wanted back. And he still kind of sees that, sees himself going back to the way things were, going back into the family fold. And then he, even though he does, he st still thinks that, yeah, maybe this is not exactly what I want. He hasn't made his mind up yet. Like, OK, maybe I'm, it's not what I wanted. But now that's back on the table again, I want it again. And I can. I want to do what it takes to yeah, get my, that back. My issue is just him believing it's even on the table. That's all. And my my quick fix, because I, mm -hmm. I think this works, but like you, you could probably make it better, I guess, um, would be that she gives him the offer, he refuses because he doesn't trust her, and then she hands him 
a, a letter from her, the father, and it's got like his seal unbroken or something like that. Oh yeah. And he opens it up, oh, and yeah. it gives him the offer directly from his dad. I feel like that would nail it. I mean, it would change things, but it would uh, it would change things to um. It would show a different aspect of Zuko. It would show that he was different in uh, his mental state. So that, oh no, I'm not going to believe you, Azula. You're a liar. And that's the thing, okay, I think that that's paper. good progress that he's been so far away from them for so long. He's now gone to the point where he will not believe her ever. Oh yeah. But oh, yeah. he gets, like, he's like almost like he's trumping her, but then she trumps him with the with the letter, mm -hmm. this theoretical letter. I feel like that would be pretty effective. Um, I think in the in the in how it's done originally, it shows a more tragic portion to Zuko's desperation because he's Zuko is a, he's emotional but he's very he keeps things he's very stoic at the same time he keeps his emotions inside he doesn't express things as freely so we get to see a new portion a new aspect of his emotional instability and his desperation when he instantly believes Azula who has lied to him since childhood who has betrayed him and tried to kill him on multiple occasions and it shows us the audience how desperate he is how absolutely desperate and and the hungry he is to return to life as the way it was and to get his country back, to get his role back, to get his father back, his family, his everything. And I think that's the difference between, because if he had a letter, it wouldn't be, it would, yeah, I might be able to fix it, but it wouldn't be as, uh, it wouldn't show us his desperation. But on oh, the other hand, I, mean, hand, I, would, I would have him like fucking shaking while he's reading it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's it. There's the offer. Got to gonna do it or are you gonna not do it and then you can keep I, I, Ira with the whole you know I mean, don't do it. I mean, it's a good point personally i like the way it was originally because it just shows his desperation it shows a little more tragic element to uh, zuko's character at that point that's why i like it. that's why i like it personally mm -hmm. um i thought it was really funny that after zuko frees appa he goes into like a coma and it's because <laughs> Ira says his body like being an evil but can't handle the goodman decision he made now <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to speak about psychology and how it can affect you physically, right? I'm not saying it's an impossibility. I'm strictly talking about the way that I've sort of uh, accepted all this information. So he's like incredibly stressed because he's done a thing that is just not his position to be doing typically, and so he's just like, ah. But um, I would have thought that if you're like supposed to be quote unquote a bad guy, finally choosing to do something good would give you that that sense of like, I. I had like I nailed it. I did a good thing. This feels great. That's sort of like sort of turning. But let's say, okay, fine. It stresses him out enough that he goes into this like state. The thing for me is like I really think we should have had that happen after the scene we, we sort of looked at at the beginning of season two, after his family member tries to kill him and he was baited in by his dad to go to prison. He's like shaking when he fights series like exasperated and, and, and obviously he was about to be beaten. I feel like um, going into some form of a stress coma after that experience would not only be more suitable, but um, it could be a very physical representation of like the uh, a metamorphosis, like you know, a caterpillar into butterfly sort of thing. Um, yeah. While doing it after he frees Appa, strange to me, and I feel like they did it to to put him on the shelf for an episode because it's not until the end and that he's fixed back up to normal. Like they didn't know what they wanted to do with him. What was the context for him saving Appa? Was it just so he, out of he, kindness? I think he stumbles across Appa and releases him because, uh, I guess, that's the right thing to do. Or yeah, I, I think he's hoping that it'll go back to Aang. Because that's that's the, what I remember is that he just freed Appa out of kindness because he's he's changed as a character, and uh, since that's he's kind of it takes Zuko a long time to get to this point where he's not this uh, going from a quote unquote evil side, which I think is represented by this bald. And ponytail look, but I think uh, it's because of intention. That's the difference here. What, what was the other reference you used? The one from um, what it would be, it would have been better if he went to the coma before? What was the one oh, you referenced? Uh, uh, with the 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 family trying to cheat, like uh, trick him into going into prison because he's a failure, and obviously the attempted murder on him as well. And uh, what what good did he do there? What was the uh, good deed he did? Oh no, I was trying to highlight uh, if this was stress related. Oh, okay, stress related. Okay, okay. I think uh, in that instance where you said that he he will he fell into this coma because he did a good deed. I think it's uh, about intention because it's a it's a same it's a change of mindset because in the mindset if, in season one, and I think most of season or at least a good portion of season season two, 
he is a firebender. He is a Fire Nation soldier. He's the prince of the Fire Nation. And he's been raised to fight the Fire Nation's enemies and to see them as lesser than he is because that's that's how they treat everybody. And then he's going through this journey that changes his character, his heart, and his mind. And he sees that what he has been doing is somewhat wrong on the unethical side of the spectrum. So he's when he does something for once on his own, out of the goodness of his heart, just to help someone out, well, not out of not for honor, not for uh, prestige, not to get back to his family, then that is a huge psychological difference. It's, it's a disconnect from what he was once was the prince of the Fire Nation. And it's the intention of doing something good as opposed to just suffering one psychological blow after another because he's been through that all, his whole life. This is actually something positive in his life, something new, something exhausting because his body and his mind is not prepared for that. And it's more of a spiritual thing, I think, because spiritual the spiritual element of things is a heavy part of the Avatar universe. They, they've shown that. So I, so I think it's more of intention and a difference of a, of a motivation. I think mechanically it's it's sound. I just, mm -hmm. uh, I was thrown off by it. I was just like, I would have thought you'd even be comfortable. Like he, like the, the drama <laughs> for him would be like, that felt good and it shouldn't. You know, and then Iroh is like, yeah. hey, hey, that's, you know, nudge, nudge, that's good stuff, man. Just saying. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's just a, just a thought. Oh. Um, well, Iroh knows best. He's not oh, high. yeah. So, you remember Azula turns up with her two gal pals and they're dressed in the Dai Li outfit. <laughs> Is it the... No, wait. The Yamashu... The Kyoshi? Kyoshi, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, the... They are... The, so, the, those warriors are trusted and, of course, he's like, oh, you guys can help us. And they're like, mwah ha ha. Um, <laughs> the, f like, first thing the Earth King tells them, or I guess it's the Earth King, uh... He's like, hey, they're coming up with this great plan to attack the Fire Nation during a solar eclipse where they're at their weakest. And, like, Azula just lifts up <laughs> her head like, oh! And I was like, oh, jeez. Like, because he's a bubbling <laughs> fool character. Yeah, I was the, just like, oh. The Earth King is an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's, like, you know, I'd like, I'll let him have that. The part that gets me is that um, Sokka meets them, um, <laughs> and he's, like, clearly aware, because he's obviously... Current on off again on again girlfriend is uh, Yoshi Super. Warrior. He sees their outfits and he manages to not conclude in any way, shape, or form that they would have stolen it from them. Meaning they are compromised. Meaning Suki's potentially compromised. Meaning their whole right. plan for the eclipse is compromised. Um, because she knew it as well. He doesn't put those dots together whatsoever. It it blows my mind that they didn't have a line for him to comment on the fact. Is like, oh, do you guys know Suki? They don't even have that. He just, <laughs> he just he's just like, oh, hey. <laughs> and I was just like, wow. What's going on? <laughs> Have a good day. And of course, because that compromises the whole Black Sun episode, and it's just like, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of strange. I don't know. I don't know about that one. Hmm. But uh, uh, I, I don't know the context exactly. Wait, does he just say hello and they just kind of pass in the street? Yeah, I uh, I would get you like the screenshot of uh, him seeing them. It, like all he needs to do is see them for me to be like, oh damn, you should probably comment on it now. But he's uh, he's very casual and it's never mentioned. And I'm assuming it's not mentioned because they need to be surprised that the Fire Nation are prepared for them on the Black Sun episode. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, okay, where are we going? Uh, okay, yeah, so Azula finds out that a faction of people in the Earth capital are against the Earth King, and so naturally she's like, let's maybe work with those guys. So her plan is, I'm going to get captured, and then I'm going to meet with their leader. And I was just like watching it, like, whoa, like, that's <laughs> super risky. Why can't you just instead be like, hey, Earth King, can I speak to your prisoners to try and find out what their plans are for blah, 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 you know? She's, she's a Kyoshi warrior, you can trust her. Uh, like, like, instead, her plan, and I was just like, man, what if, like, what if you were just imprisoned indefinitely? Because she's captured by the Dai Li. Um, yeah. And the Dai Li bring her to their leader, and then she manages to broker a deal with the leader. And I was just like, dude. <laughs> careful like all kinds of things could have happened as a result of that i mean azula is uh, characterized as she's kind of like ozai she's very egotistical she's very charismatic and confident and so her plan was to just get captured and be taken to the to the leader of the people if they took her to like a normal prison first off 
they she would have uh, manipulated people into taking her over there somehow. Uh, that's what she does. She she if she doesn't have to fight, if she doesn't need to fight, she doesn't need to. Then she won't fight. She'll just manipulate people with her words. She's sharp with her mind, and she's very uh, she's like a social butterfly, and what well, she needs to be. She's not really good in personal experiences, like unless it's, if it has something to do with business, she's good at it. Something to do with manipulating people, she's good at it because she's. I think she's depicted more of like a, a sociopath, sort of like a, a Jeffrey Dahmer type, uh, who just cares about her father, uh, and then. Uh, but she, I'm pretty sure she came. She went in with a plan with if she had that sort of confidence. She usually does. I just would have thought so, like. Considering a character, she would she would probably first of all just walk into the place that he's captured. She'd just be like, "Fuck it, I can go here. Who's gonna stop me?" I mean, uh, I think she liked it better as a uh, play of dominance. She tends to do that sometimes. <laughs> That's what I mean. Wouldn't that be the play of dominance? Well, I mean, she takes in, she's taken him as a prisoner, and they think she they have her on the ropes. They got her. They have her helpless, and then she, despite her helpless her supposed helplessness, still takes over everything. So manipulates him into uh becoming one of her pawns and i like the i like that line where she goes where he goes um you beat me on my own game and she <laughs> says you're not even you're, you're never even a player <laughs> or oh, poor um, long thing <laughs> i love that part it was fantastic um because she somehow ousted the loyalty of the Dai Li because she was so much stronger a, a leader than he was no oh, yeah i mean uh she convinces them all to join her cause uh, or she's uh, I mean she's more powerful than him so why not but I would follow Azula I liked Azula <laughs> until she kind of broke in the last few episodes and just went insane so yeah the in the first episode of season 3 Aang like has a bit of a crisis and um, tries to go off on his own and he almost like drowns in the ocean because he can't quite get through it and then he's given like a pep talk by Roku and the, <laughs> and the moon spirit and like immediately after he goes Full, like water bending pro tsunami mode where he's just like traveling through the ocean really fast like fucking Aquaman stuff and I was just <laughs> like how did could you did you not know you could do this before I was like okay there's a <laughs> some of these I think it's sometimes they develop these new powers or these new uh, techniques because they're in an in a situation where they need to get out of a situation right they, they uh, they're in this new place where if I don't get out of this, if I don't think of something new, I'm going to die. So to me, this is after they do tend to do pull these sorts of things after they've been trained, after they had some technique and some, some, uh, you know, they had some lessons or they've learned new things along the way. So when they pull out something like this, it's more like, okay, I'm going to use what I know, they're using knowledge, kind of like learning uh, martial arts. I'm going to use this technique that I've learned, put this together and maybe this will work. And so when they put out new moves like that, if they've already trained and learned new techniques by that point, then to me it's acceptable, especially since as I said, Aang is, an, is a prodigy in all forms, and he's, his best friends are all prodigies uh, thanks, thanks to fate or whatever. So, I mean, to me, it, it seems to be like a technique he's cobbled together out of other techniques. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm fine with the uh that sort of uh, interpretation or, or viewing i just um for me watching i was just like oh damn you could do that <laughs> yeah i understand <laughs> yeah so uh, that's that's it seems to be what the um one of the beauty the, the beautiful things of avatar is that it does so many things that would traditionally see be seen as horrific or wrong and according to writing like there's already a chosen one trope which is absolutely horrific i would suggest ever using a, a chosen one trope at all because it just dilutes everything but uh, they they use it very well because they in, they uh, in, they add it to the world as a piece of essential cornerstone foundational lore and it's the so Avatar: The Last Airbender is the one one of the few franchises I would say yeah chosen one aspect way to go did it right did it correctly all right so this one this one's gonna be weird so Team Avatar have provided a guide in Basing Se called Judy. And when she fails to prevent them from getting to the uh, the upper ring party, she's taken to the lake for brainwashing, I guess. And she's replaced with another guide for them who claims <laughs> to be you. the literal same person. And they're like, <laughs> no, you're not. She's like, yes, I am. And they're like, oh, and it's like nice and eerie and creepy. I kind of like it. But then it gets weird because 
<laughs> you find out that loads of women are being brainwashed into becoming Judy specifically. <laughs> and like the first time I saw that, I was like, why would you just have them be different women? Like one of them could be Judy, one of them could be you know Jane. <laughs> you can you can make a bunch. <laughs> Um, and so from there, uh, Team Avatar are like unnerved naturally. I think we'd all w would be. <laughs> I, yeah, um, I think they would be. Two episodes later, I think uh, the old Judy comes back. She like <laughs> knocks on the door, and they're like, "Oh my god, old Judy!" And she's like, "No, I've always been this Judy." And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then they're like, "How is this possible? How do you switch bodies? How 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 how?" And she's just like, "Nope, I'm always Judy." And there's this weird moment, like, go, you could go check out the scene, people listen to this. They, um, she, she just, like, brushes that off, and then they go, so why are you here? And I was like, whoa, what? No, we can't just skip over the fact that we've got this lady that switches bodies, like, you kidding me? Um, and then she's, like, ignored by them, and, uh, mm. she goes back to Longfang, like, this following scene, and she explains that, like, they don't trust her. And he's like disappointed and wants her to be brainwashed again. And I was like, what did you expect? <laughs> You've been giving them different <laughs> bodies. Like I like if you want to say like Longfang is a, a great strategist, they're like, okay, but I just think this there's other things you can try, buddy. It's like, oh, they just those pesky kids don't trust me even. Like, why in the world would they trust you? It was it was funny. But they, oh, I don't, they all looked alike to me. I don't know. <laughs> Can I trust? Them? <laughs> all I would say is like, guys, when you brainwash them, just give them different names and tell them they're yeah. different people. It's fine. We'll just do that. Yeah, that was that was. Kind of, I was. I think it was done for comedic effect or something. <laughs> it's it's odd because the fact that they just brush it off, they're just like, all right, fine, you're a different body. Anyway, why are you here? <laughs> like, <laughs> if I was in that room, I'd be like, what are you? <laughs> but they are in their defense. They are country kids. They they are from the South Pole. They. They don't know what actually goes on in the, in the big city, so maybe just people just switch bodies in the big city. <laughs> <laughs> Very much anybody who, who thinks that's weird. <laughs> hey, anyone who thinks that's weird, uh, they're invited to Lake Lao guy. Very yeah, nice over there. That's, at least now that's a meme I'm in on. That's, uh, <laughs> I'll know what's going on. Um, <laughs> do do. I mean, this is just, I, I can answer this myself, but I may as well throw it out mm. there. How did how did Aang and Appa survive being frozen for a hundred years? Uh, just cause. It's just definitely a just cause thing. Because <laughs> I've had some people tell me, it's like, Avatar State. I was like, Appa's not in the Avatar State. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, how did, I guess it's just, I think it's just traditional movie logic. You trapped a nice... You can live forever. It's just it's the matter of you getting thought out. Because Captain America went through the same thing. He said young. He was frozen in ice. Yeah, well, because I, I probably levy the same criticism against uh, the MCU for that one. It's kind of just like, <laughs> you don't sit... You, in, in the same way, right? Because you can get away with that, quote-unquote. But uh, mm -hmm. principally, you shouldn't get away with it. And what I mean by that is, like, we have a character who is ejected into space and he's floating around out there and then someone grabs him one day and brings him back down and he's a character again. Be like, how the hell did he survive? You're like, oh, you know. Space is, uh, yeah, space is different. No, because okay. we, we, we accept space is death, like in movies or yeah, you die in space. Unless you're like, I guess in like a, like a parody kind of thing, you can survive, you know, like that sort of yeah. inverting rules on purpose. But, um, if you're watching Jimmy Neutron and you can literally breathe in space and be good to go. But like you have like I think Batman and Robin they freeze people and then they're like they have to be thawed within ten minutes, otherwise they won't be fine. And you're like, I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, they think they think get around a lot of stuff when it comes to Mr. Freeze, because he freezes people and then they can't really have him being that big of a mass murderer because he loses his, well, they, um, his sympathetic card. I wish I had the uh, the references for you, but I remember there's several points in Avatar where they freeze people, but they leave their head. They leave like a space for it, implying that it's like you have space to breathe. And I'm, I'm always sitting there like, but, but Aang didn't have <laughs> space to breathe. Because <laughs> I, I think they don't want people questioning like, wait, mom, why is it the... They put ice all over him. Does that guy, is that guy dead now? And the parents are like, uh, <laughs> no, they're fine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> if someone gets frozen like that, I guess uh, in combat, then it might be assumed that they're dead. Mm. <laughs> At least uh, Aang put like a little orb around himself that was filled with, also filled with ice. So I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, maybe it's some weird avatar magic that allows him to be frozen. It's a, 
distant ancient water bedding technique. Whatever happened, whatever reason, that's what that's what ended up happening. So here's a question: How did the Fire Nation attack and destroy all of the air nomads in the area temples when you can only access them through flight? Uh, Aang actually asked that question. He's like, as in the first few episodes, there's no way that they conquered the air temples. Because you have to get to there by flight. And then they get over there and they're all conquered. So I guess they uh maybe they burrowed underneath somehow, or maybe um it it, it they don't really answer that question. They just you just figure out that they did. You know that they they did there's, but you don't know how. There's some stuff to work with. Being first and foremost, they did attack them during Sozin's comet passing, and we know that Ozai can fly while Sozin's Comet is passing. Yeah, so and I think Azula can fly on her own normally, just the jet boots. Can she? Jet boots technique. Yeah, she has a jet boots technique where she can uh, put fire underneath her feet. That's how she was um, able to survive a fall, I think. Huh. <laughs> Jesus, she's OP. Uh, well, yeah, cool. I mean, because I know the uh, Kitara almost kind of sort of uses a flight type thing at the end of season two. She just needs a large body of water, I think. Um, but aren't the aren't the air temples on a mountain? It could have been so uh wait well, <laughs> the, this, is, this is the thing. I was gonna say, let's <laughs> say because not all the Fire Nation can fly, we know that. Because like Sokka's yeah, plan yeah. in the finale relies on that. Um if some of them got up there, I I'm not sure like the the air people, they're pretty good at their jobs, right? They'd be able to because I feel like air would be a really good counter to fire, blast a flame at you, and you just you know, loop it back, and uh, you can use. I don't know. I just it it is interesting to me. I'm, I am curious. And then of course the whole nomads part of it. I don't know. I just I wouldn't have called them nomads. I, I don't think they're nomads anymore. I, I think they might have been nomads at one time. Maybe they're traditionally called nomads, cause, but they're clearly not nomads in the show anymore. <laughs> that's what they're I mean. Just simple. don't call them nomads. That's all. That's all. I, call them <laughs> air bugs. If you, maybe that's too on the nose. I don't know. Uh, but it's clear that the, a lot of Fire Nation people did die in the conquest of those air temples. Mm. And I could see that someone being a commander or someone, a general maybe, that the Fire Lord at that time, being so... Because that's the one person, those are the one people they wanted to exterminate. Because that's what that's where the Avatar was going to uh, come back. He was, he was going to, He's an airbender. They're trying to kill the, the Avatar. So there's a lot of motivation to conquer all of these air temples. So I could see... A, a general or the fire lord being so anxious and aggressive and so dead set on conquering all of these temples, they kind of handled the bark at it and had all of their men you know, climb the mountain and wave after wave of fire nation soldiers sacrificed until they managed to destroy all the air nomads and conquer the temple. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's just sort of like a moment of just, hmm, I guess you have to sort of figure out how you think it could have worked. It's, one of those, this space. it's just one of those mystery boxes. It's one of those mystery boxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why, why would Iroh heat up his tea with this fire bending when surrounded by refugees from for the Fire Nation's war? Like, Zuko calls him out for it, but I was just like, damn, Iroh's supposed to be like one of the smartest characters in the whole show. Why the hell did well, he do that? Well, he, well, he's wise, but I mean, he has his weaknesses too. <laughs> he just really likes good hot tea. That's something he can't really do without. But, like, it could get him and his very surrogate son killed yeah but he really likes tea <laughs> I mean, he, likes tea. <laughs> he really needs his hot tea and he thought maybe he thought no one would notice he just heat up drink it real quick mm. and uh they wouldn't be that big of a deal but uh he's that's his weakness is tea uh this is more of a dissatisfaction one as well but uh Sokka spends the whole the whole episode like acquiring his space sword and he uses it a couple <laughs> times he ends up throwing it at a platform and slices through it almost magically because it's, it's an amazing oh, throw. Space sword. And then it just falls and he's lost it forever. I was like, why did they do that? <laughs> Rip space well, sword. Sokka is the smart guy of the group. He's just a real smart guy. Uh, but he's not always the wisest. <laughs> I think in the, in the moment, it's like, oh, this is a good idea. I'll just throw my space sword and get this thing done. Oh, it doesn't come back to me because like, I'm, I'm used to using I'm used to using a boomerang. Why not like have him... Back. Just have it uh, some kind of string whip chain thing attached from like Kratos style, and he uses a, a style of fighting <laughs> like that, just so he can keep it and also be awesome. That's that's all. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I like the space losing sword. the space sword. I mean, I like the space sword too. It was a really cool concept because it was made from a meteor, 
and and they use the uh, earth from space like i think they call it space earth like is it really called earth if it's in space <laughs> uh, but it was really neat because it was this, this rare ultimate material and he got this awesome sword and it was really cool but he lost it and i think it was i think the the intention there was that oh he, he's really cool with this awesome space sword but that's not who he is and it shouldn't be who he is so that he loses it so that he continues to be awesome without this uh space sword <laughs> Uh, acting as a crutch and they, yeah, they actually call it a space sword i like that mm. like oh my space sword <laughs> um i like that uh the, so uh, when we're learning about avatars there's there's <laughs> one who's representative of like a fire avatar and he bursts and controls four volcanoes at the same time and I was just like, why would you show me that? And then also show me Roku having incredible trouble in the Avatar state trying to deal with one volcano. <laughs> or that guy knew the secrets and he couldn't tap into that guy's secrets. I don't know. <laughs> it's just because, like, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to pull out the he's old defense because that's a meme in my community. Um, but when you're in the Avatar state, you mm -hmm. have the knowledge and power i'm assuming you are vulnerable Everyone, yeah. of course but you're still extremely powerful i just like i was surprised that he was defeated by that volcano um to be honest with you it shouldn't happen again this is a brand new computer so i would be very very peeved if it does mm. <laughs> with roku i mean i think this is where it comes in with the why all avatars need training and they don't speak, specifically say this okay I, I know that but if i were to make a conjecture mm. it's that uh Maybe avatars can type into the power of previous avatars, but they can't always tap in, or maybe they they don't really tap into the previous techniques of previous avatars. At least not all of them, especially if they're like what three generations ago. Uh, which is why they need to train on their own, get their own techniques, and uh, are able to with training use utilize those techniques inside the avatar state. Uh, I can't remember if Aang ever used like a, a specific technique that uh, was used by a previous avatar other than maybe some um, like a form or a fighting style but not a specific technique like controlling volcanoes uh, i'm not really i can't remember that that oh part. well i would just cite godzilla right like yeah holy moly <laughs> how is it that an eclipse prevents firebending when the sun is still there and it still actually is shooting out some level of light like it's not pitch black but then nighttime doesn't take their power away uh, on that part, I'm not really sure. Like, it could be because traditionally, like, uh, in mysticism and everything, eclipse, eclipses are not just blocking out the sun. It's uh, It has a whole, a whole bunch of other mystical elements to it. So it it might be that the eclipse here is not just block, the uh, blocking of the sun. It might also be doing something else. Because I think it's, what, the moon, too? It's Does it ever tell you what exactly is blocking out the sun? Because usually something to do with the shadows oh well, so this is this is the interesting thing right because my first thought was it's the moon in the lunar eclipse solar eclipse whatever and so with the moon spirit and moon blah blah, blah i was like there's got to be maybe some argument there for why it's fucking with the firebenders but then i was like surely like at nighttime when the moon is just chilling out there that that would have to fuck with firebenders at that point right <laughs> like yeah, i'm, I'm maybe, sure they are depowered but i don't see why they wouldn't just lose their ability entirely if that's what it does when they get an eclipse you said the, the the only the only conclusion I could come up with on that question is that it something special happens, something more magical or mystical happens during an eclipse that never happens any other time. That seems to be the only thing that uh, seems to be plausible in that scenario. It sort of slips into the category of just like mm, that's just how it works. It's like okay, like it's not. It's pretty tough to make a functioning. Uh, I guess you could call it a magic system, right? I think some people do call it a magic system. It's very tied, very much tied to spiritual mysticism elements, so it gets um, complex when you try and sort of distill it into a mechanic. Um, yeah. But of course, the show still needs these mechanics because a lot of the drama is based on them. So it's just like a matter of just like, but what about? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> um, I thought it was really strange that like. You get these animals are teaching people. It's not that they teach them, like they give them the ability to bend. It's that that everybody is either got the ability or doesn't, like genetically. And then the animals mm -hmm. teach you how to uh, use that, I guess, potency that you have naturally. And of course, the um, 
the badger moles, I think, do earth. The oh, uh, yeah, dragons right. do fire, and the uh, sky bison do air. And then water's done by mm. the moon, and I was like, "What?" And this is the idea that the moon's gravity is obviously pulling and controlling the tides, and that people watch that and they learn how to water bend better. And I was just like, "So surely, like harsh wind would teach them how to water bend then too." And the gravity of Earth affects water. Like, obviously, it, it seems odd to me. Like, what? Okay, the other one didn't freeze. It just, just stopped working. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. It, I could do everything else. It just, not, no programs would run anymore for some reason. Oh. We, I was just talking about how, like, I guess, bending seems to work and where they got it from. And yeah, from the, only other, the animals and everything. Yeah, and the only other thing I was going to say was... Um, the Godzilla thing, I would have thought he'd be like, man, this will be super useful for uh, future battles, potentially, to save the world, but I guess it's, like, too risky to do anything with him. Because, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, he goes into the water at one point, and I was just like, could you just travel to the Fire Nation and fuck shit up? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, know. Carrie... I mean, like, there seem to be some, some contrivances there. And... Carry the fish in a bucket. And put the special water in there and make sure you only travel uh, during moonlight or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Just... um, it might be, the, might be the fact that they don't really care because they're animals. And <laughs> they don't really interfere with the, the, the uh, situations of mankind. Mm. They're just there to teach you. But they're not there to solve problems for you. That sort of thing. I mean, we don't solve, that. We don't solve the problems for the dragons. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, a lot of it's like... I, I just it's a bit I just have to do a bit of hand wavy stuff. I'm just like yeah, that's how it works. Go away. You I think it's supposed to play thing? into more like a it's supposed to play into more like the, the nature holds wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, you go into nature to get the wisdom, but nature can't really do things for you, or else you wouldn't really need the wisdom in the first place. On the uh, the day of the black sun, the the Fire Nation's mm -hmm. plan is to sort of delay them enough so that the eclipse is over and they get their um their powers back. Uh, and trick them into thinking that Ozai was in his throne room. Turns out he's not. But then the, right. the heroes conclude he's still going to be nearby because he's got to command people. And they're right about that. I thought that was so strange. I was like, surely you wouldn't want to be anywhere near the place because that's the one place they want to try and get him and stop him. And everything's over for him if he's captured or, or killed. And he's got, like, nobody to send messages to, to uh, what I mean by that is um he he doesn't everyone's doing what the plan is if you know what I mean like mm -hmm. what, what is it that he needs to do um and of course so that's that's just odd to me but then they also let a significant portion of their men remain unaware that they're about to lose their powers on that day mm -hmm. um to the point where a lot of them are easily defeated I thought that was strange I understand the idea that they're trying to essentially trap or convince these the, our heroes that they're winning when they're actually going to, you know, get countered significantly. Yeah. But like, why wouldn't you just allow your soldiers to be aware of that anyway and just have them, you know, don't waste so many of them, I guess, is, is where I'm going with that. I mean, if, if you remember what the what, what the reason Zuga got banished in the first place, because they, they, they did just that. They, uh, yeah, they were going I, to uh, sacrifice a bunch of people uh, yeah. just for the sake of getting a victory, and that yeah. wouldn't put it past the dude again. Yeah, no, that's fair. I just, it's just like, I guess if I was on the in their boardroom, I'd be like, "Ugh, really, guys? <laughs> I would rather us just drop our bed into a cannon to fire it at them." At this point, <laughs> like, at least they'll be more useful. Um, he's, he's kind of like a long shanks. Remember the movie Braveheart, where he, they're all his men are all fighting. He starts to shoot arrows into them <laughs> into the melee anyway. Yeah, that's uh, that happens in Game of Thrones season. Oh yeah, six. that's right. That does happen. Yeah, and then this this is getting very specific, but it I, I really do feel this permeates a tad through the season, but this will be like my primary sort of reference. When they are faced with Azula, uh, and she her whole goal is to delay them. That's what she needs to do until the eclipse is done so that, that she and uh, Ozai and everyone else gets their firepowers back. It's like, all right. Um, so they arrive, and if you remember, Toph immediately captures her. She puts her in, like, a rock prison. But then mm -hmm. she's burst out of the rock prison because there were two um, earthbenders, the two Dai Li, in the room as well. My first thought was, like, wait, how didn't Toph detect them? Like, that's her whole thing. 
like because they're a surprise they're 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 attached to the um the ground of the ceiling if you know what i mean like the whole room is oh, yeah. one material and and they're on the ceiling i was just like she should know they're there secondly like i don't see how she can't there's two dai li and a jumping around azula these guys <laughs> fought the entirety of like the earth capital earth benders like all of them at once Toph, is she annihilates them she's incredible and like they spend the whole scene Toph awkwardly pushing people away with rocks and then Aang just firing air blasts at Azula over and over again and like it it really bugs me because I'm like dude if you hit her with one of those what happens then she just gets back up you're firing air at her you've got to capture her with earth and he can do that he just doesn't and then they um if you remember they <laughs> go down a corridor thing and Sokka's mm -hmm. like, she's trying to fucking distract us. We need to go find Ozai, ignore her. And then she's like, I've got your girlfriend. And he like loses his shit and goes to attack <laughs> her. But she has a knife. And for a moment, I was like, oh shit, are they about to do something thingy? And then Toph just like, flick of her fingers, just captures Azula with a, a piece of rock that attaches to her hands and to a wall. And she's done. And I was just like, why don't you do this like more often? <laughs> Because to Toph <laughs> is involved in so many fights where I feel like she should just be able to do that, but then sort of just doesn't until the plot is like, it's time for her to do it now. Um, of course, that's made worse then by once the eclipse is over, Azula surprise hits them with leg firebending, if you know what I mean. How didn't yeah. Toph see that coming? Her whole thing is to be able to detect movements before like the as the moves are being made by people and so she would e easily be able to counter that by just attaching more rocks in terms of like a, a rock prison but then azula just bursts out of it as well like and, and i was just like man like azula as much as i think she's awesome i don't think she can beat Toph. like uh Toph would just you know embed her into the soil <laughs> and i just feel like Toph is depowered a lot when we're fighting against uh important I, I think, people uh, i think the other people all her friends are keeping Toph back i think <laughs> i mean the thing is, is, I, I really like Toph. she's uh... oh yeah Toph is awesome it's just i think she's so used to the, being on her own and then at that point she kind of kept her guard down and uh she kind of started trusting other people and it kind of held her back because he's you know, okay well other people can pick this up other people are going to do these things and i can't fight to my full power anymore because there's other people I have to take care of and not make sure they don't get hit by my earth bending that sort of thing so mm -hmm. it might well very well be that Toph is being held back by Sokka. <laughs> I, I wouldn't put that past anyone Sokka is totally i mean i'm not, I'm not asking back. for Toph to kill anyone i just wish she would use her uh, capture abilities yeah. more consistently i guess because like they're so op it's kind of the same for katara and freezing she does it really casually in different fights, but then sometimes she just sort of doesn't do it. Um, the best example I can think of is when she's... Do you remember the end of Season 2 when um, they're surrounded by firebenders and Aang decides to try and commit to the um, the Avatar state? And oh, yeah. obviously he's struck down and Katara's like, oh my god, and so she tsunamis to get over to him, which covers all of the firebenders in the room in that. And I was just like, wait, freeze it. As soon as... You've covered all of them. Freeze it. Freeze it, freeze it, freeze it, freeze it. Freeze it. <laughs> I'm just like, well, Katara, do it. Uh, she still manages to escape, so, you know, it's all good. It's just the... Um, she... Uh, her final fight with Azula, um, that's like a two-fold confusion for me. She spends like a million years finally figuring out she can freeze her, which I was like constantly asking her to do, and she finally does it at the end. Only she like... breathes... Uh, her way out of it, but like she like turns her side into water, and then fishes around and, and attaches like cuffs to um, Azula. But Azula, like all of the other firebenders, can melt ice by breathing outward. Like that's a thing that they all do. If ever you freeze a firebender, they can go, like they can, you know, blow out their nose or their, their mouth and um, it'll melt the whole thing. Right. And Azula's like a really powerful fire breather too, because it's like a few seconds later she starts cackling and then she starts breathing fire and they're like, whoa, and they have to get away from her, mm. obviously. Yeah, I, I remember that fight. I don't remember the specifics of the fight, but yeah, sometimes you have a, you think they should be freezing someone or using some uh, their earth bane to capture someone, and it's uh, it's in a fight. You might know the techniques and everything, and in a fight, you might be able to see through things. But when you're up against someone who's like a Azula, who's like a prodigy or a master, or is uh, puts you off your guard, she breaks your confidence. That's part of her uh, her power. And when you're in a fight. 
sometimes you can do things when you have more confidence. You can fight guys. You can fight bad guys with a better effect than you would someone who's a fellow master, someone who's on or above your level. And sometimes you just honestly, you just can't think of the technique to use at that time. This happens. Uh, it, remember, it even happens in fighting games. You're going to, need to have two masters of a fighting game together, and they just uh, I should have done this, or I should have done that, should have done that technique. So it's a uh, it's all a matter of the the chaos of battle, the chaos of melee, uh, and you can't always think about that because it's it is the, it is chaos, and it is uh, you're worrying about so many things at once, and they aren't they still aren't adults. Uh, they they are um, still kids and everything, and you might take that as an excuse. But to me, that's that's where it fits. That's why uh, I can I can accept it in my personal opinion. All right. Um, so sticking with the uh, the day of the black sun, do you remember it ends with them basically deciding like we're kind of screwed, and the despite us having our collective here, not all of us can escape, and so they decide that all of the children will escape on Arpa, and the rest mm -hmm. of the ad adults will be captured. Mm -hmm. So. I have a couple of issues with this. First of all, uh, let me show you quickly. Uh, you can easily fit a couple more people on there at the very least. Appa is an um, extremely powerful beast, and like uh, it frustrates me that they're willing to give up a few seats to no one, because <laughs> I guess they're all adults that are left, so it's, it would be awkward. And yet, yeah. episodes later, they go on a crazy potential suicide mission to save just Katara's dad, who is in this crowd right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the almost cost, obviously, uh, Saka, Zuko, and Suki, the, all three of them, and the people they meet in the prison. Very risky. Um, I think it's Suki. I think she's there. Uh, so, so that frustrates me. But then what really kind of super gets me is um, they've got Aang and Toph, and they're standing on Earth, and they're concerned that uh, they can't all get onto Arpa, nor can they all escape because the Fire Nation are coming. Do you remember how um, Toph can literally, like, and Aang, they can just burrow huge tunnels whenever they want? They go. Oh, yeah, I remember that. So, like, just go down. You're on Earth right now. Go down, cover up the top, and then just burrow. Keep burrowing until you get really far out. <laughs> um, but, and, and before anyone you know, thinks of like, well, you know, that could take a long time and it's kind of risky. It's like, you've got an airbender, you can get oxygen to everybody pretty easily, and it's better than a Fire Nation prison, especially when you just tried to essentially overthrow their kingdom. You guys are in for trouble. Like, this is absolutely worth any kind of risk. And besides, Appa can get everyone to safety and then come back. Um, Aang can stay with, obviously, the people who are burrowing and he can whistle him in. And you can take another selection of people and siphon them all away to safety. Instead, they're like, well, you're all god <laughs> too bad. It's like, wow. <laughs> and it, I don't know, it just really bothered me as the sort of finisher to this. I was just like, mm. you're going to let all these people potentially die just because you can't fit a few of them onto Arpa, nor can you use Toph, this incredible earthbender, to your advantage? Yeah, I mean, it was, a, was it a time constraint? Do they have enough time to do all that? Well, it's the thing, uh, borrowing, like... Is, is something that they do super fast in this show. They do it at the end of season two, uh, which is this is after. And um, when they're crossing the Snake Pass way, if you if you remember, their um, uh, Toph like lifts a platform for them that's like several meters tall, and it has everybody oh, yeah. on it. But, like I know they're capable of doing these things, and they're capable of doing it fast. Let's see. Well, I mean, it could have been just a. Uh, they... That matter of time, matter of they just didn't have enough um, the instance to start that burrowing or anything like that. Uh, you know, honestly, they probably didn't. Th they probably didn't think of it. I mean, I'm talking about the writers. They probably, mm. The writers probably didn't think of it. <laughs> I mean, that's, like, okay, that's, that's fine. Because like, my my thing here is just trying to explain like what bothered me <laughs> pretty much while I was watching it. I was just like, boo. And I know loads of people will not have problems with these things. I get it. Uh, yeah. And it's probably, it was far more dramatic for it to end that way. <laughs> it's far more dramatic to separate the kids from the parents and everything. Yeah. So uh, it, it's 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 more forgivable in a lot of people's eyes because the drama kind of covers it up. Oh, yeah. About that rock snake. I think it was Serpent Pass. I think that's what it was called. So they come to a, a portion of it that's uh, overrun with water. And so you're mm -hmm. like, how do we cross this? And the first thought I had was like, oh, we'll just get Toph to rebuild it, right? She's like super earthbender. 
Instead, they decide to have Katara generate an air bubble for them to walk down into the water and back up onto the surface. And I was like, <laughs> damn, that's risky. Like, compared to just making but a platform. It's so much more cool. I it, guess. Is, it is more cool, yeah. Um, it's then, far more cool. And then you have um, the, the crazy serpent attacks. It's like, all right. So they all get, you know, separated. Toph makes the platform. Uh, Katara makes an ice bridge. And I was like, no, mm -hmm. Toph make a rock bridge because an ice <laughs> bridge is slippery. But no, it's fine. They all run across it. Even a pregnant lady running across it. I was just like, wow. All right. Yeah, fine. No, I'm okay with it. I think it's feasible that uh, you can run across a frosty bridge. She, she made it very sturdy and uh, non slippery. It's fine. I, I think during um, that time, wasn't um, Toph really scared because it wasn't uh, it wasn't as earthy so as she wanted to be so, many, is, so much water around them this is what i was gonna say i have a oh no the, it's she well this is my problem right so she should have made the rock bridge regardless but they run off on the frost bridge and they don't uh look at the fucking blind girl they just leave her uh i'll pull this up for you now i'm gonna go battle it there she goes with the frosty bridge <laughs> they've all crossed over and all of them have forgotten about Toph for some reason and then they have this shot and I, I just really want to highlight this because it makes me laugh. Rich. The literal <laughs> aesthetic. Look at her. She's T-posing and she's a blob. <laughs> like what is that? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, I guess on a serious note I just can't believe that it, it was it was upsetting to me that they all made it this far without realizing Toph had even done anything. And then uh, I think again, they're so used to Toph being so on her own because that's what she her whole characterization was. She was being on her own. She was uh, trying to be as independent as possible because she was blind. She didn't like the fact that people were waiting on her hand and foot. And it's only now that finally she is vulnerable. Part of my issue is that um, she manages to protrude this rock out of other rock, and now she's like, ah, oh, I can't cross a frost bridge. It's like, yeah, make yourself a rock bridge. <laughs> so and these powers i'm just like blah, 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 why did you, 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 i know you guys can do these things it's possible she, she can't maybe she doesn't have the confidence anymore or maybe that she just can't <laughs> she just can't there's not enough earth to manipulate or she can't uh see or take enough earth to manipulate because i'm not sure if her senses go underwater if well, I mean, she's, she's touching water, uh, uh, Earth with her feet right now, right? And we saw that she was able to... Look how yeah. high up she managed to push this pretty thick platform. Mm -hmm. All I would suggest is... Um, straightening it out into one line forward. Oh, does this straighten out the platform into a bridge? Yeah, go for it. I don't see why she can't. She... I mean, I don't know if you remember, she's... Um, she is a powerful Earthbender at her best. I remember she uh, fought the boulder. And no one, no one defeats the boulder and this is tough. This whole assault, I was, um, man, our, our team are on point to the to the degree I was like, you guys should just go and attack the fire nation. You'll be fine. <laughs> also, yeah, Katara kicking absolute ass. She throws them all in there and freezes them immediately. And it's like, damn, if you only did that with the fucking important plot people. <laughs> yeah, check this bit out now. <laughs> this is such a like. Is there anyone who could beat Toph in a fight? He just turns all the stairs flat. <laughs> yeah, uh, up they go. And they make it an elevator. But yeah, there's just a lot of times where I'm sitting there like, no, do the thing. And then they don't do the thing. And I was like, hmm. I mean, it looks like sometimes it takes... I mean, every time you see someone bend, they have to have some sort of confidence. It's very... Uh, it's usually... If they're scared or emotionally compromised, it's. it looks like it's hard for them to bend. I don't know. Because have you ever seen someone bend whether they're scared or terrified? And they have to have this, like, bring well, themselves I assumed, back to... Um, Katara's blood bending was done out of fear yeah, for... It, um... and that was, that's what I was thinking. Uh, that particular scene, that she was afraid while she was being blood bent, and then she gained confidence and started blood bending back. Oh, I was actually talking about when she blood bent, who was out of fear for... Because what the woman was doing was having Sokka with his sword forward fly into Aang. Mm -hmm. Like, the point being, she was going to have him kill him. And then it was uh, the her bending the old lady that saved them so i assumed that you could argue she did that out of fear she was like no 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 no, and then you know <laughs> like the phrase bending the old lady <laughs> <laughs> guitar is so mean <laughs> respect your elders she's, she's bending up the old lady <laughs> just put her in the box uh, put her in the mystery box uh, i think uh 
the only thing I can think of is maybe Toph wasn't as confident or um, in the right emotional state at that moment to make that bridge, to utilize her powers to the full capacity. Uh, because even even that example, she seemed to be strained. She has to have um, supreme concentration, supreme confidence in her abilities to make that those stairs into a slip and slide thing. And this is back with when she's scared, when she's um, she feels vulnerable. The first one of the first times in her life, she actually feels un- incapable of defending herself. Then uh, it might might have compromised her abilities. I think that's why they set it up like that in the first place, because they they even pointed out that she's really scared and <laughs> unable to really help herself because of said fear. Well, because uh, that's the thing, right? They're at the bottom mm-hmm. of the "quote unquote" ocean. It's not that far. Of that well, they're they're on the the, the pass, but it's um, yeah. enough of it submerged, right? And so the the bubble is popped. They're all underwater, but then she immediately pushes a big platform up so that they can be rescued. I would say, like, mm-hmm. if she's capable of that under the most severe of circumstances, she should probably be able to just make up that bridge, right? And that's not including yeah. the fact that I still think they should have opened with that. I really like the the stupid air <laughs> bubble thing. I was just like, just make a bridge. <laughs> Yeah, but in their defense, it was way cooler from the right, <laughs> crossing right. an air bubble. Okay, um, you got. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to do uh, is to obey the rule of. Oh, cool. dude, I if ever I want to make anything, that I want <laughs> it to be as cool as possible, right? And you try and find every way you can to make cool because you know you don't want to go too far and end up being like, hey, what about how cool a hyperspace kamikaze would look? And then you're like, Ryan, <laughs> stop that right now. Get out of here, Ryan Johnson. What are you doing in here? <laughs> yeah, but it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you remember when, hate everyone? Uh, Zuko is trying to decipher a uh, a scroll? Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, is it the one? The, is it the very end of the series or towards the end? It is season. Th- it's early season three because it's before he leaves the Fire Nation. Actually, I think I should be able to show you this one. I remember him trying to um, decode a scroll or something, but I forgot why exactly. Is something to do with the Avatar. Roku or something? Um, so, the way it works is that um, Iroh has broken out, but Iroh leaves him a note, I think, saying, um, you need to read the history of uh, Sozin and uh, the Avatar. And at the same time, Aang is getting taught the history by uh, Roku. It's like, okay. And I, I'm, fi- I'm fine with that. You could you could call it an extreme coincidence that they're both learning about that history at the same time, but like, whatever. It's... it's uh, that's, that's that's fine with me. The part that I I have... think it's yeah, elementary. Ele- the 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 element is that it, they're it's mirroring their two journeys. Right. Like that's, so I, that's that's good. I like that sort of writing. Um, so he gets given a scroll that says on it to to like look into that history. And Zuko's frustrated because um he doesn't know where he can find that information. Um, and so this this scene happens. Well, so he's he's like annoyed he can't get the information. So just check out uh, what happens. Oh wait, I might have to pause it a couple times though. Oh. What does it mean? He angrily threw it because he can't figure out what it means, and it landed on a candle <laughs> that revealed a secret message rather than burning it. Uh, like, oh, this kind of stuff annoys me so much. <laughs> why? And I don't understand why, because what he finds out is he needs to go to the catacombs or the dragon combs, I can't remember what they call them, and he just read the dragon scrolls in the catacombs, that's, that's what this secret message says. And I'm like, if right. this is a secret message provided secretly by Iroh, why wouldn't it just say, go read the dragon scrolls in the catacombs? Like, what, what happens if that falls into the wrong hands? You'd be like, oh no, someone was hoping to read something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I was like, why have this contrived nonsense where he throws it randomly and it lands on a <laughs> candle that lights up the secret? I was like, Brrr. you know, sometimes these things happen. Okay, they <laughs> sometimes do. These things sure. just happen. <laughs> uh, he, he's, you know, there was the first was the inventor of the cornflakes, then the inventor of Coca Cola. Now Zuko found a secret <laughs> message. <laughs> um. Oh yeah, so this again. I, I guess this is like a, just a couple contrivances. So Katara spots Zuko in Ba Sing Se finally. Mm-hmm. Like it's been a whole season. She finally happens to spot him, which I'm okay with. But it also happens to be the very moment that telling the king about it means that the the disguised Azula will find out about it. She just arrived, and so she now knows where Zuko is. I was just like, oh. I think, I think it's uh, just bad luck on their part because they had so much good luck. 
<laughs> I suppose. They've had so much good luck. And now uh, it's time for the, the luck to change. And uh, of course, it ramps up the stakes. They don't have time to uh, utilize any goodness that comes out of that. You know, they don't have to utilize any uh, mm. positive that comes out of it. It's, Azula already knows. And she's already, she's already coming for him. That's what Azula does. Um, why didn't Toph's parents send anybody else after she stopped the two people in season two? That is something I've always asked. Why did why did they just stop? They just <laughs> they just give up. They seemed pretty they seemed pretty uh, protective of their daughter. And then they, <laughs> I think uh, they might have forgotten about that plot point a little bit. <laughs> and she def she defeats the people who went after her in the first place, and then they kind of just stopped. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe they maybe they learned that she's capable of handling herself after she beat some a group of tough guys. But I don't know. They they seem to be. I think because I think they learned that she was a really good fighter or something, and they still wanted to protect her, so she had to run away. So I don't know. I don't know why they didn't send any more people. I always ask that. Where's some more people coming after Tom? <laughs> Should she have a big bounty on her head by now? Yeah, because they're like super rich. I think. Yeah, um... they're a really really rich influential family. So yeah, so this the, you might be able to just help me out on this one because it just it seems so strange to me. The, essentially, the 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 villain of season two without once the the villain of season two eventually turns into Azula, but as it stands, it's a uh, long thing. Why would he like claim that his civilization will fall apart if they were aware that war was happening? Um, and to have that position when they regularly have many refugees from war entering the capital. And you might be like, well, they're brainwashing people who talk about it. And I'm just like, yeah, no, I know. It's just like, what? You're going to. So he's concerned that his economy is going to crash if they find out a war is happening, which is fascinating to me compared to the idea that you're like, I'm sure it won't have any detrimental effects on my civilization. You have like roaming brainwashing squads that puts people <laughs> in like abject fear i was just like i don't know this is so odd to me and they've been they've done it successfully but are we supposed to assume like a hundred years because it says um he's kept the 100 year war a secret on his wiki page i was just like he managed to make it so that an entire century passed and they haven't figured it out yet or if they did they were brainwashed it's like wow yeah. <laughs> he's really good at his job. He's apparently he's really, really good at Except his job. Except when it comes to drills. <laughs> There's a blind spot, okay. Um, I, don't, I don't think anyone has tried that before. That was like a new thing. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. What's, you know, what that, is this? That drills approach, uh, when it first arrives, is so slow that I was like, oh my god. Is this, did they originally... Has this been... Like, did they activate it before season <laughs> one? Like, was it like... Really slowly leaving like <laughs> the Fire Nation. It's like he's, he's gonna he's, get there. It took a while to get there. This episode was activated really, really early, yeah, but eventually got there. Um, I found it really hard to believe that the king wouldn't have been aware of it when he had the um the five five war generals who are very aware of the war. That he he like values their uh, input. I don't understand why they established mm -hmm. that while simultaneously establishing that the guy has no idea there's a war going on. They probably. I mean, they're probably like uh, manipulating the, the king on the behalf of Long Feng. No, no, no. So that, those generals got uh, knocked out by Long Feng because they're they're good guys. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so he's a. Uh, so what happened in that context was that um, he really liked, he really uh, respected the generals, but they got taken out by Long Feng. That would happen. Well, Long Feng is proven to be a fraud, and then like we plan for war, and then the five generals are just introduced. They're just like, yeah, we're just the five Earth capital generals of war and that the the king will trust whatever our conclusion is in terms of the war and i was just like what where what <laughs> like we you where what where were you guys <laughs> um and again this could be something i've missed detail wise which is totally possible for all of these things um it's, it's just that i found that really weird uh uh again this i guess so this is sorry i meant to mention this one i do that a lot with this um the the turning of water into ice and into fog, uh, water into fog, so like the ability to essentially alter what you could call the molecular process, I don't, I don't know the specifics, the particles at the very least, um, is amazing. As a, as a water bender, they can change the temperature on the fly of the thing they're bending, and I wonder if that applies to the other benders. Can they, I guess it does to fire, because they can make blue fire, right, which is like a hotter fire, I assume. Yeah. 
Um, I think they could do. I think there was greed in there somewhere, but I don't think anyone actually used it. Yeah. And if you can turn water into fog, can you not? I because I I my answer to this question myself would just be that it's just a really high hard move to do, but pull water out of fog, if you know what I mean. Oh yeah, change fog back into water. Mm. Act as a dehumidifier. I'm pretty sure you could do that. <laughs> I don't see why you. They mention it's possible. We never see anyone do it though. I don't think. Um, yeah, I mean, that that'd be so useful in war. Just. Instead, yeah. of, instead of having smoke grenades, just get some water benders and have them throw fog at the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, just tsunami and freeze. That's the way. That's like the ultimate ability ever. <laughs> tsunami freeze, go. Um, just bring in tons and tons of water and then tsunami and freeze. <laughs> uh, this was, this. we kind of covered this earlier. I just wanted to make sure we, we the thing. Um, I thought it was boring that Zhong Zhong is like absolutely not going to teach Aang. And then a uh, dude shows up and says, you will. And he goes, okay. Because um, it's partly to do with the fact that I consider Zhong Zhong to be quite a wise character uh, by the looks of it. He's very seasoned. He's aware of the the downfall of firebending, and he's obviously been involved with the Fire Nation. Quite a, quite an interesting character, to say the least. And then he's like, really? absolutely not. And then Roku's like, yeah, you will. And he's like, no. Oh. <laughs> I think he's even, uh, I think he's a rebel at that point. Isn't he, isn't he like an outcast or a, yeah, a, a yeah, he is. criminal? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's a, a usually traditionally masters only accept students, are only supposed to accept students when they once they prove themselves. And yeah, that's what I thought that what they were gonna do was have like uh, uh, Ang do something that would have earned. But <laughs> then he just says no, and Roku's like, <laughs> "Hey, you do it." <laughs> okay, that's what uh, kind of should have been done. But I think I don't know, maybe because I think Zhang Zhang was portrayed kind of <laughs> as a jerk or something. I don't know. Yeah, he's kind of an uh, answer, maybe... I guess. Um... I always thought it was like, like, like he's got a huge history that justifies it, you know, like he's he's yeah. gone through some shit. Because obviously he has, because he's turned against his own nation. That's pretty that's pretty big to yeah. fight against your own people for the sake of others. Because you you and your you yourself think that principally it has gone astray. So that's huge. It's huge. Especially for a general like him. I think he was like a, a top tier general or something before he turned tail. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, it's it's more of a, a pompous sort of thing. Maybe it's an ego sort of thing. Oh yeah, I just, uh, I'm clearly talking just from a satisfaction yeah. level. Like, does it make sense that <laughs> this fucking incredibly powerful being just came to you and said you will teach him? Would you agree with that? I was like, yeah, probably. <laughs> You'd be like, oh my god, don't kill me. <laughs> um, I just think that it could have been cool for for Ang to prove himself to Zhong Zhong in yeah. some way. I mean, I would have been really cool. I mean, that's what it should have been done. Usually, traditionally, it should have been that. But I think in this case. He uh, he really bowed to Roku because he's fighting his own people because he believes his people have gone astray and Roku represents a time I think I believe when uh, the the Fire Nation was not had not gone astray and he he probably really respects he's probably like a Roku fanboy and said okay uh, I'll teach him for Roku and I'm pretty sure on Avatar Roku's end he's like okay enough of this we don't have time for this stuff just teach him firebending we need to get this we need to get on with this stuff. <laughs> We need to get to the final, the finish line of this thing. Um, do you remember Heibai in early season one ish? It's before the winter solstice. He's a he's hey a by. he's a spirit who is angry oh, yeah, the, because the forest has spirit been spirit of the forest. Yeah, spirit of the forest. Okay, yeah, I remember. I remember. So this one was weird to me. He um he in one night destroys like <laughs> four. I want to say four houses and a watchtower. I think before mm -hmm. kidnapping Sokka and leaving. They tell us that he's attacked three nights previously. He did that level of destruction in the fourth night. I was just thinking to myself, like, dude, <laughs> leave. <laughs> like, he's he's wrecking, like, the town itself, it feels like he's destroyed a quarter of the town in one night, and he's been there for three others, and I'm just like, is there just one building left? And the weird thing is, when he's smashing them, they're kind of watching it like, hmm... This is awkward. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, dude, that's where you, like, live. And, um, they, they move on to say, that Ag needs to stop him before the Winter Solstice because when he does the when the Winter Solstice comes around, he's gonna be super pissed. He's gonna annihilate the whole place. It's like I think he already has. <laughs> <laughs> so it was funny to me. Obviously, uh, I'm not sure what they were going Great. for exactly. It was weird. I, I just thought it was funny that they man, Ang managed to solve all of this by giving it an acorn and yeah. without context. Like here's the the only reason why the acorn represented hope to Ang is because Katara came to him and said, "Hey, Ang, these are everywhere." 
and they'll grow back. The forest will grow back because there's acorns all over this place. Uh, the game just gave the spirit an acorn and just turned around and left. Like the spirit didn't know that. <laughs> the spirit didn't know that the forest grows back. Apparently, he needed Ag to sort of uh, connect those dots. I just thought it was kind of strange, kind of funny. Mm. Uh, but the thing is, I, I can accept it also because, yeah, maybe he didn't know. I mean, it's not really portrayed as an intelligent spirit. It's more like an animalistic primal spirit. Maybe he didn't know. And maybe Aang giving that spirit the acorn, he being Symbolic the avatar. In the of peace between peace offering. Yeah. Because the, the avatar is basically the emissary, the ambassador to the mm. spirits from the mortal realm. So uh, I think it would be, it's meaningful to the spirit if the avatar gives it to the spirit. The hope, be, the avatar's hope becomes their spirit's hope. So I think that's probably what would happen. This, to me, it just looked kind of funny. <laughs> okay, I got an acorn now. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Do you remember the beach episode? Yes, that's one of the most infamous episodes, I think. Wait, why? <laughs> because, because everyone always refers to it because it, it's, uh, it's the fan fiction episode or the fan service episode. Uh, you that's get all the fan <laughs> Jesus, I, uh, I think it's the worst episode of Avatar by far. I think it's a filler, right? Is it a filler? Just well, hanging I, out. I, I guess you could. Call it. It. Yeah, they're attacked by vagina headman who like blows yeah. them up with his lasers. That shit, man. That <laughs> I was not sparky, prepared. Sparky, sparky, <laughs> I when that first, I was like, <laughs> the funny thing is, I think ER showed it in his videos before, but I've somehow managed to like forget about it because when I saw it, I had no reference. I was like, what in the what? What is this? Like, and it's just like it's like a variation of. Uh, firebending, I guess. He's like, yeah, apparently, it's some sort of like secret firebending technique where you can bend fire out of his brain or something. <laughs> and he, I, it felt uh, <laughs> like it wasn't real when he first did it because I was just like, I was not, <laughs> was not prepared for that. But the thing is, the I guess you could call that the B plot. <laughs> the A plot is um, our our villains who have caused some destruction across the time they've been on this show, being like hyper childish and again you might be like well that's their age and i'm like yeah i know it's it feels incongruent with like how threatening they can be as 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 villains while simultaneously being like these really young teens who are still learning about love and i'm like oh i guess so <laughs> and obviously i'm referencing stuff like the guy kisses azula and then she does like the darth vader speech to him she's like we could take over the yeah. world together <laughs> that he's like whoa i'm out of here and i was like what that part, the hell that part usually reference that part usually reference to show her social awkwardness where she's she's really good at when it comes to business like she's really good when it comes to manipulating people for her own uh, ends or for the ends of the fire nation but she's not really good in person to person like personal relationships just like zuko isn't they're both pretty socially awkward is that Yazula can hide it better because she's a social butterfly when she needs to be. But when it comes to just uh, talking to people, it doesn't really work that well. <laughs> well, there's just so much stuff going on in that episode that, like, threw me for a loop. The um, the acrobatic one who, like, paralyzes, like, eight guys all in a big... Tylee. Yeah, I was just like, wow. Uh, ho hopefully there's no repercussions for that. You could just sort of do that and it'll be fine. When they like wreck the whole place at the end of the episode and finish all like smiley faces and everything's happy, I was just like, "Geez, I get that they're villains, but like, whoa." Um, you know, Zuko's still not quite made it to good guy territory at that point, I guess. Um, yeah, not yet, not yet. He's still kind of evil. And yeah, and then you know, you have like, oh, you're just jealous because I'm hot, and then she's like, "You, you're a freak," and then she's just like crying, and she's like, "Don't cry, I'm kind of jealous." Like oh okay, <laughs> like the dialogue throughout that episode makes me want to kill myself. Uh, the 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 fireplace discussion they have, where they all basically explain their backstories one by one, in a matter of about four minutes. I don't think I've ever seen like a more blunt, uh, way of expositing to the audience exactly how these people feel, and they justify it by being like, "This is the beach that does that. It makes you want to say these things and get a clean slate." And I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's this is them talking. It's uh, because they're supposed to be friends, technically. F technically speaking, uh, Azula is friends with Mai and Tai Lee. Uh, they're just not traditionally friends. They went to school together, I think. Well, but, yeah, uh, I mean, I still remember because it was just it's yeah. that blunt. It's like she grew up with a whole family of people who look similar to her, so she wanted to kind of go acrobatic mode and join the circus style thing to become individual because she hates the idea that. Like she'll she'll never be able to stand out from the crowd. Next one, um, she was like an only child and constantly did everything her parents 
said she should do, acted accordingly, and she's lived well because of it, and that's why she's reserved and doesn't have outbursts. But she does at the end of that sentence because <laughs> that's when she's revealing her things. Azula is upset because the mum never loved her as much as she loved Zuko, despite the fact yeah, that she was like called her powerful. Monster, cause, yeah, because Azula was a she was a monster. She was a, she is a sociopath pretty much. I mean, she burns dolls. She probably torture animals as she she wanted to. I don't know. She's she's she was a pretty crazy kid. Mm -hmm. Very manipulated from uh from day one, pretty much. She's a very scary person. Very scary person. So, but she is socially awkward. Like she can't really handle real relationships. So. Uh, her her relationship between Mai and Tai Lee are, is held together by fear, and you see that why I think I think at the boiling rock where they finally betray her because they're finally not uh, they've they've much of the courage, or I think Mai even says this. So she found something more than she fears. She loves Zuko more than she fears Azula. Mm -hmm. That's how she breaks free. Uh, but there's essentially other than that, they're friends technically speaking, as as close of friends as you can be with someone like Azula. And so they just hang out together. They, they talk because they're at a beach and uh, this big conversation. I think it's kind of like a finally they're able to relax sort of thing. I like the fact that Azula, when they're fight, when playing volleyball, <laughs> Azula instantly points out everyone's weaknesses. Like this person was hurt here and go back over here to exploit their weakness. <laughs> yeah. Like I just thought it was so goofy because she's, she's like that woman is walking awkwardly on that right leg that she probably had childhood <laughs> trauma. And I was just like, I, uh, okay. Exploit it. <laughs> exploit yeah. that childhood trauma. You know, like the, the Darth Vader speech, like, okay, now we are a couple. Now you will join me in conquering this world. It's like, oh, never yeah. mind. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't come here for that. <laughs> Cover for this mess. You didn't pay me enough for that. I'm out. Um, <laughs> uh, do you remember again about the anthology episode? Uh, Toph is like what I would call kind of single dimensional. She, uh, and this is the thing, I really like Toph, and I think that. In the same way that Jack Sparrow is, like the, these are characters that are very static, but they're so entertaining that it doesn't really matter. Yeah. The, um, they drop like an anvil of development on Toph in the anthology episode. They reveal like that she, she's like, I don't care how people see me because she's she's blind, she doesn't know anyway. But like she gets made up and then she's made fun of for it, and she reveals that like that does hurt. And and like I was I was like oh my god like this is this is intensely important I want to know more about this and it's like in a one off fifth of a one episode I was like what the hell I mean they kind of built it up a little bit they kind of hinted at it a little bit since her first introduction to the show where she's um she's trying to break out of this of by becoming a fighter and mm -hmm. her parents are coddling her and coddling her and coddling her and she hates that she hates being uh, treated special or being mocked or made fun of uh, because it hurts. She's she's tough on the outside, and she's oh, yeah, really yeah, tough yeah. when it comes to physical, physical, physical. There's so much more like, like that should have been like a thing, like a whole. Oh arc yeah, you of, mean like they shouldn't have they should have developed on it more. You mean? I I mean that's my like crack. Yeah. Seeing characters yeah. <laughs> develop over a significant issue over time, it's like oh, give me. Um and yeah, I I like I said I like Toph, and so seeing that in the anthology episode, I was like, oh my god, expand this into a huge episode, maybe even more <laughs> than one. Unfortunately, Toph is a really really reserved character. She's a uh, She's, she's tough. <laughs> she's mm -hmm. She has guards up all the time at all times. But there's a one other part I liked where she talks with Iroh. I don't think she even knows he's a bad guy or her enemy. But she just has a nice little heart to heart talk with Iroh, which yeah, is kind no, of strange great. for her character, which is good, but really good for her character. Um, Do you remember when they fight Azula? in um like a, a like a dusty almost like a western town yeah the, the western town thing yeah let me try and find a few as it well it takes what five of them to beat her like, to, to, to defend her off well i think it i think it was that point where she realized i need to get some help <laughs> there's a couple of things about that that whole scene and it's kind of stuff i've been alluding to before as well um so our whole team is pretty much assembled, and they're all anti-Azula, which is good stuff. Um, though it's like, where is Toph? Toph should be here, right? She was with Iroh, and it's like, oh, she is, and look at that. She spun the ground to make her slip over. Toph, why are you not capturing her? Capture. Just, just puncture her down into the ground in any way, shape, or form, like you always do, like she does in the Black Sun <laughs> episode. But no, she just fiddled with her and then sort of stands there and they're like oh hey Toph and then she starts running away again so it's like all right yeah I guess and then he's like oh hey now she's surrounded what's she gonna do 
And, um, yeah, I guess I'll just do this sort of one at a time, because this scene really bugged me. Um, I, <laughs> I'll tell you something I really like. I really like that Iroh, for a moment, looks at all of the kids to see that they're okay. I'm assuming, right? Because that tells... I think that's a good thing, that he's, like, concerned about all these these kids fighting. Yeah. She notices that, and so she goes to attack him. And she's successful. Um, why didn't Toph do anything? Look at the amount of movement she's doing. Like, look, they don't even re react. <laughs> Like, all of them do, but Toph doesn't because she's blind. But, like, Toph, yeah, she's blind. grab her. And then what they do in response is she fires dust at him. At her, sorry. Like, Toph, what are you doing? And this is the thing. <laughs> Toph is so powerful that I think it kind of fucks up uh, a lot of the minutiae of a lot of fights and episodes. Because you have to nerf her a lot in order for things to happen. Because, like, all of them bend their respective abilities against Azula, and she somehow manages to blast them all away. Look at that, man. She's a prodigy. No, no, my <laughs> point isn't that she shouldn't be able to do it. I guess if we, like, fine, I guess she can do it. But, like, that should have yeah. fucked them up. <laughs> like, that's, look at, look at yeah, what it did. Kind of should have. Like it's like a bomb. And she's just gone. I'm not exactly sure how, but it's fine. She flipped away. And then, um, another thing that bothers me about this, right? So he's, like, super upset. Iroh just doesn't die from this. He's hit, and, and we see him next episode. He's got a bandage on. He's okay, which... He, like, he's he Iroh. He has tons of hit points. Yes. Um, the problem, however, is Zuko's, like, upset, naturally. And Kitara, being someone who can heal, is like, I can, uh... Right. And he's I, like, no. Well, she, says, no. she says, I can help, right? Which isn't exactly clear on what she means. And he says, no, go away. I think yeah. it's completely out of character for Katara to just accept that and go. I think she'd be like, I can literally heal him, you ass. Let me do it. But no, she just leaves. And I was like, oh my god, Katara, why'd you let people die all the time? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I think at that point, it was the humanity. Let me just... I think it's like a problem with Discord or something at this at this point. Mm -hmm. Not sure what Discord does act up every once in a while. It freaking, it updated itself while I was streaming EFAP. I was like, oh, thanks. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's what's happening now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the last thing I think I heard you say was you were going to talk about... Yeah, I think at that, at that point, it's... I think she can she can connect with the humanity because... Iroh, she can kind of tell that Iroh to Zuko was like... Katara and her mother, like he, she, might be able to see that he's he's also prideful and doesn't want help from an enemy or someone he considers to be an enemy, even though she knows she has the best the best of intentions. You know, I, I, what I need is for her to insist. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, I think she's that altruistic. Katara cares to mm -hmm. help good people. Um, I get that he was like, get out of here. Rah! It's just like, I would. It would only be that if she made it clear she can actually heal him, and then he actually threatened to kill her, that she would have to... Like, that would... I would accept it then. But, um... Even then, I think that they would just be like, Zuko, fuck off, she can heal him. Uh, Toph would probably insist, to be honest with you. It's possible. Toph would, like, grab Zuko with rocks and just be like, go away. Like, you're getting him, you know. But, uh, yeah. Um... I, I would assume that, uh, that, that at that moment... So because Zuko had shot flames at them as a warning, that uh, it's kind of like a rabid dog at the moment. <laughs> it's Katara oh, probably. Totally. It's just. That, I just. You know, I would. I would you know, imagine their perspective is Zuko doesn't understand that we can help this person. We just need to help him understand that because he clearly thinks that we're a potential danger. Right. Um. Why would Azula suspect that Aang survived her lightning attack? Because um, this is this is gonna this is a double criticism, right? So first of all, mm. she tells Ozai that she wasn't the one who hit Ang and killed him. It was actually Zuko. Actually, this is a triple criticism. So first of all, she has to just hope then that no other soldier reveals the truth of the matter. Secondly, that um, Zuko would go along with it instead of just revealing the truth because he's he's not one to hold on to lies like that. Uh, thirdly, she says she does it in case Aang survived, which I don't understand how in the world she would ever expect that to be a possibility. Zuko would, because he knew about the Healy Juice, but she didn't. And for some reason, she just suspects it. And then finally, 
She says she's doing it in case the Avatar is alive, therefore she wouldn't look like an idiot when uh, Zuko, Zuko will instead. He'll look like the failure. But I was like, but you're advocating that he was successful, so you would have screwed up as well. So like the whole the whole thing just doesn't sit right well with me from Azula. I guess because she she used the attack. She was the one who killed or was supposed to kill the Avatar in the first place. Yeah. Uh, I, I would assume that maybe she knew that she didn't uh, strike a killing blow, and that Which, well that she Avatar did right because the we find out that the only reason he's alive is the super healing juice. Yeah, the super healing juice. But she, she might have said that maybe. Maybe that didn't kill him. Maybe because she said that she suspects, right? That she suspects that she killed him. Maybe it's uh, in terms of maybe maybe it's an, not a lethal attack, or maybe it is a lethal attack. It's it's it could be either one. You know, have the, in other movies you have um, uh, heroes get shot or something like that, and the villains think, well, go let's go find them because they might not have died from that. It's maybe a, it's an if and or it's an or. Maybe mm. they died. Maybe they didn't. That, was, that that strike should have killed him, but maybe it didn't kill him because it's the Avatar. He can survive more than more than uh, most people probably can. I still think that um, I don't see why she wouldn't re see that Ozai would think she's an idiot too, because she's she's celebrating the fact that Zuko was successful too, and mm. she was there. So you know what I mean? Like I don't. <laughs> Just like yeah, a weird yeah. separation. I was just like, what do you think that's going to do, Azula? Like, you're still going to be a dumbass <laughs> as well. Um, do you remember the, the Zuko Azula fight in the finale? Katara's just standing in the arena, but to the side. Oh, and yeah. it makes oh, her like a huge, obvious target. And I was just, myself, I was thinking she must be in some kind of safe area because Zuko wants to fight Thingy alone. Which, by the way, I think is really stupid because this is about saving the world, not about your ego. But he needs to do that, apparently. Which is the same, by the way, for, they say, like, Aang has to be the one to face uh, Ozai alone. And I was like, why? This is about saving the world. This isn't about, can the Avatar defeat the Fire Lord? Like, it's it's like, no, 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 we need to get everything to help Aang do this. Toph, go with him. Toph, please go with him. Toph, go with everybody to defeat anyone ever. I feel like that would be the, the key to most battles, but... Yeah, they, they do that sort of logic and it really frustrates me where they're just like, no, it has to be you versus him. The way it has to be. It's an anime trope actually. It has to be this it has to be this way. Like if you've ever seen the, the labyrinth, all the all of her friends want to go with her at the very end, and she goes, No, I have to do this alone. Why? <laughs> Why? Because that's how it's done. <laughs> oh. Well if that how if that's how it's done, then that's how it must be. It's it's kind of that logic. And yeah, if, so if Katara's not going to help Zuko in the fight, it's like, Katara, get, hide behind something so that she can't randomly fire lightning at you. <laughs> She's like, oh no, lightning. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was going to mention earlier as well, I think we I mentioned it, it was, but like, I don't know why she Katara didn't open with the tsunami um, uh, in the finale of season two. She's like, oh no, she's trying to whip some people with a water whip. And it's like, hey, if you have uh, tsunami powers, I would... That, that's the one I'd be going for. That would be my... Tsunami Freeze. Tsunami Freeze. Tsunami Freeze is... That, that's just... I'd become a water bender and just use Tsunami Freeze all the time. <laughs> that would be my thing. I mean, they, they never... As far as I know, the show never, like, tells us that it costs anything to bend. Oh, uh... Is it? Or that they need to eat sometimes. Um, I'm trying to remember if they ever get exhausted from bending. Know, I mean. it, probably, it, probably, it probably takes exertion, but uh, it seems that they can... Been relatively without consequence. Kind of, yeah. I'm the, trying the, to think the of the harder techniques. The harder techniques doesn't really cost them too much more, just, as long as they know how to do it. It's fine. Mm. But that's fine with me. It's, it's just uh, it's just a matter of knowing what techniques to use, and what time and in what situation. That's really the uh, the thing that really tests them. Coming coming back to Zhao, um, the defense for this that even I would suggest is going to be, he's an idiot. Um, <laughs> he is, kind of, yeah. He's really dumbass. Uh, where is it? The deserter. Going to be sharing some clipperoonies with you again. Um, sorry about the, the format for this. It's so awkward. <laughs> it's just like, this is the best I could do. <laughs> you, all right. I really like that he, uh, he hurt Katara while firebending. I thought that was uh, that, that was excellent because it shows uh, his flaw, his personality flaws, and that he can make mistakes, and they can uh, 
messed things up so badly that he actually hurts people instead of thinking that he killed Chewbacca in, in Transport. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, him, no. him coming back in the next scene. So, <laughs> so he thinks, like, how do I destroy the ships? Uh, because the Fire Nation are chasing them, uh, us with them. I know. I will jump on them, and as Zhao attacks me, he will set them on fire. And, like... <laughs> When I was watching this for the first time, I was like, oh, come on, like, really? He's just setting them on fire? Um, but it was made worse by the fact that he has no idea, by the way. Not until Aang reveals it to him in about two minutes from now. He doesn't realize he's even on his own boat. He's that, like, dense. <laughs> um, I'll, obviously, I'm, I'm just playing the clip, but uh, you're, you're gonna get it in a second, because Aang is like... You've been defeated, and he's like, "You've not even landed a single blow." And then he's like, "Take a look," or something like that. And just watch Zhao's reaction to realize like what he just did for. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I, I was just like, Jesus, how are you with this rag? You're like Hux. <laughs> how did you manage to fuck that up? Yeah, he's kind of, he's an idiot. He's self-absorbed. He is self He's very self-confident. I know that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's possible that he, it's fitting to his character. So more, like, more accurately to say, he's it's fitting for his character to get so absorbed with uh, conquering the Avatar and bringing back the Avatar so they can get all the rewards and defeating Zuko's one yeah. chance to come so... back that he would be so focused he wouldn't notice that he's attacking his own ships that's i could see that happening with my suggestion would just character. be ang is redirecting his fire and he doesn't realize where it's being redirected to until it's too late if you know what i mean he's shooting it at ang yeah. specifically and ang is yeah. throwing them back in different areas and and maybe zhao is almost convinced that like ang is just so bad at this he can't even deflect it back at him and he doesn't realize because maybe his back is facing his own ships and it's not until it's too late that he turns around to realize those fireballs weren't actually missing. You know, that sort of thing. Instead of he's yeah. on his boat, he is firing balls at his own boat, <laughs> and then he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I, understand, I understand where you're coming from. I just, I just think it's, it is still fitting with his character that uh, well, he this would be is, so self-absorbed that this is he a would character be so focused on conquering Amazon. Who is told he's going to usher in what is essentially the apocalypse if he kills the fish, and that he just does it. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, he is kind of an idiot. Really he, is. He's, yeah. he's, character, he's characterized as that from the beginning. He even got, he even lost to Zuko because he's so pompous that he just thinks he can take out Zuko with no sweat at all. A guy, a prince who has been a uh, razor focused on training every second of the day so he can capture the Avatar. And he thinks that he's this is going to be a walk in the park. And he gets defeated by by Zuko, and he's dishonorable enough to try to stab him in the back. He's kind of he is an idiot. He is. That's his character. He's kind of a an idiot made idiot made stupid by his uh, his ego and how focused he is on uh, being the prideful one, the best one, and being the one who's on top of it all. Um, just to I'll, I'll try and run through. Uh, do you remember that that creature that can smell people and pretty much no matter where they are? Oh yeah, that one with the, the bounty hunter. I thought the dialogue lady. was so hilarious when they're like, here is Aang's <laughs> stick, where is Aang? It sniffs it, and the lady says, your friend doesn't exist. And uh, this is when Aang is on the Lion Till, and they're like, doesn't exist? He's dead? And she goes, no, 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 he's not dead, he just doesn't exist. <laughs> and like, I wish I had like a screenshot of my face, I was just like question marks all over my face. <laughs> I was like, what? How does, how does she rec reconcile that? All you need to do to fix this is have her say he's out of range. He's so far away that we can't actually trace a scent. That's it. Instead she says he doesn't exist. I want her to tell me. I want to jump into the universe and ask her what that means. Uh, just for her to be like, he no longer exists upon this plane. Also, I was like, what the? Why are you so comfortable with that process, that explanation? Um, also, I feel like the Fire Nation would have captured all of those things since they're the most useful animal like that ever existed for what they essentially want to do, which is chase people. Mm -hmm. oh my god. I don't know. Maybe they just didn't. <laughs> yeah, they just didn't. Maybe, maybe she only has, um, she has the only one, or maybe it's a, it's a rare animal. Who knows? That's what, that's what I got from it. It's like mm -hmm. a rare animal that only she really has. 
or there's so few or there's so like they're, they're from an exotic part of the world that no one has explored yet or something um yeah uh zuko and may's relationship i had no fucking clue that was even going on and <laughs> i was just blown away with the fact that they started up i was like whoa yeah. And the, they started kissing every once in a while. Like, yeah, yeah, and they, they the, it's quite a payoff, kissing. too, because she betrays Azula for that relationship, and I was just like, damn. Yeah. And that's on top of the fact that they gave us a short story about Zuko finding love in Ba Sing Se. <laughs> I was just like, did. what the hell? Yeah, that threw me. He, uh, he, goes to, he, goes to like, uh, he takes her out on a date. With, they, and they kiss, they and I thought they were going to develop that, but I realized, as I probably should have faster, an anthology episode is going to be forgotten. Yeah. Didn't work out too well. Not for Zuko, because he's Zuko, and nothing works out well for him. <laughs> um, do, you the the guy, do you remember the guy in the library who wants to stay there to read while it's all being engulfed in sand? Remember that? He's like the... I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. He's like the dude who comes along with them, and they're about to leave while Toph is struggling to keep it from being like completely engulfed by sand. And he, he's like, no, I want to stay. There's so much knowledge in this library. I could read forever. And there's this shot where he's reading a scroll. And there's like several piles of sand building up around him. Uh, because the whole place <laughs> is going to be buried. And I was just like, what? In the... and, and you might be like, who cares? It's just some random dude. I'm like, no, I know. It's just so silly. Like, why, why would a person do that? I just, yeah, it's fine. It's just like, okay. He's so dedicated to his uh, studies yes. that he didn't really care. I I give you. Ever, I think I saw a long time ago an anime called Outlaw Star because it was on, uh, it was on Toonami, and there was one professor who didn't care. He just wanted to, as long he didn't care if he died, as long as he found out the knowledge that he was searching for. That knowledge is more important to him. This knowing is more important to him than giving it out or getting, mm -hmm. getting famous on the knowledge. So that could be that could have been his personality too. Um, I thought it was just a funny coincidence that they turn up right before Azula is crowned Fire Lord. It reminded me of Shrek, where they're like, I object. <laughs> with the Duloc, or <laughs> Farquaad. I object. Um, yeah, and I guess the only other thing off the top of my head, because this is the thing, I didn't rewatch the show. I think we'll try and talk a bit about the positives before we close this off as well. This will be the last criticism off the top of my head. Um, but, 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 like, uh, do you remember Boomy has a civilization, a city, he decides he's going to let the Fire Nation in because he figures that's the best way to do it without like causing too much trouble. And then once his time comes, he's going to break out and save the whole city from the Fire Nation. Right. So why wouldn't he just repel the Fire Nation regardless? Because if the worry is they will come back, they will be coming back regardless <laughs> of when he picks them out. Um, well, obviously, when did, when did he break free though? I forgot. He, what, he did I, it on the Black Sun episode, so there was still a whole significant portion of a season left before the Fire Lord is defeated. Mm -hmm. So, so if he did it on the Black Sun. That means they have no no bending ability. So I guess he. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, what I'm arguing is that mm -hmm. he breaks the bridge to the city once right. he's forced them all out. And by the way, he's an amazing earthbender. He picks up like he's, he's, I think buildings. He's like the strongest one ever. <laughs> yeah, and just flings them out, and and so I'm just sitting there like, why couldn't like surely you guys can put up with a, a full scale war for many years with the kind of power you have? Um, oh, yeah, I, I, when I when I was rewatching the first season, I was like, this it must be a real pain to besiege an Earth Kingdom city because they they, have yeah, they can just rebuild with no gates. Yeah, they can just and they they can open a gate anywhere in the wall, so you have to keep a constant eye on yeah. every inch of that thing, and this because. The, your traditional siege is just a bunch of gates that you can keep an eye on, but in an Earth Kingdom city, it's anywhere. Anywhere can be an opening. It's almost impossible to siege one. No wonder Iroh didn't do it. Um, so yeah, I guess I would be very concerned about letting my city be taken by the Fire Nation when they've been very, very overt about killing benders. Oh yeah. Or capturing them, putting them in horrible circumstances. So you're like, what's the alternative? Defend the city? It's like, yeah. And I think he proved on the Black Sunday that whether or not they have firebending, he can do, he alone can defend that city very, very well. He could throw enormous boulders at whatever machines they may have. Uh, they're already he, on. He, like, can, he, can, he can bend with his face. He, he can bend with his, with his face, that is true. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just found... That whole thing's strange, and uh, I guess, 
I guess yeah, I guess that's it. That is that is pretty much it. I can't remember what his plan was. I haven't seen. I didn't rewatch that episode. But... Well, he was just hoping to. My best faith interpretation is he wanted to create as little like conflict in his city as possible until the time comes that he absolutely had to. But mm -hmm. it just makes me wonder about what he really thought would happen to his his citizens. And that, was it worth it, I guess? And that, surely, if the worry was the Fire Nation would return with that, uh, if the Fire Lord stays, we never actually see that even happen, so. It's all very... I have lots of questions. Um... But yeah, I do want to say, I think the voice acting is, like, fantastic. I think a lot of the animation works pretty well. I, um, I like a lot of the writing, what I might call writing scaffolding. Like, the... Mm -hmm. What is there? There's like a really there's like like the operation man. There's like a body, but it's got loads of holes and 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 maybe organs in the wrong place. <laughs> Just like I still I like absolutely what they're going for. And this is this is why the scale of good bad is a little bit useless until you uh, you know try and be more specific. This is worlds away from something like TLJ, but I also uh, do I I don't want to say that this is like great content to me. I feel like this is, um, I, I try and want to, I, I w would rather save that sort of classification for other things, because I just, uh, I think this one makes, it has a lot of, uh, a lot of things are pushed in directions uh, arbitrarily and, and luckily. Um, I think a lot of the character work is, is like, good in ideas, and then the, just the execution needs uh, more, more time, because there's a lot of what I would call filler episodes, while simultaneously having some ideas that happen way too quickly and need a lot more breathing room. Um, obviously the tough one I was talking about, like the whole, you could make like an arc out of the Zhong Zhong thing. I feel like all of the the bigger benders could have had a way bigger influence on Aang. Um, the, uh, just, just diff different high points, different big payoffs, and then just rules being clearer to me. Uh, but again, I still think like the show, I, I could totally see why someone would love this show. I, I do get that. Um, but but I don't know, uh, after after sort of going through all of them, I just, that would be my experience as well as uh, obviously a lot of stuff I haven't mentioned that is good and a lot of stuff I haven't mentioned that I also have problems with. I just felt mm -hmm. like a lot of the individual episodes had the smaller, you know, like the throwing the scroll on the candle, like that sort of thing was happening right. here and there enough times that I was getting frustrated because, um, and you know, they're, they're better problems to have than constantly assassinating all of your characters that have lasted for 40 years, you know, like, I, <laughs> I understand that. I just, um, I think a lot better, I think. Yeah. What do you, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> it's that not only just killing off your characters, but just killing off the personalities, all that good stuff. All the things you loved about him. <laughs> and I think I, just, I still think that Avatar: Last Airbender is a pretty, it's a very masterful work altogether, considering everything together, how it flows from one point to the next, doesn't uh, really meander. It goes, it goes in different directions, but at the end of the day, at the end of the seasons, they all it all builds up to a few things. Like in the first season, they're trying to get to the North Pole, and along the way, they have a lot of trials and tribulations, and then at the end, at the end of the season, they get to the North Pole. And it's not what they wanted. It's not exactly what they were hoping for. And um, there's a huge confrontation with the Fire Nation at long last with their with the enemy, uh, Admiral. What's it? What's his name? Zhao. Mm, yes. Or, or Zhang. Whatever his name is. I forgot. But uh, it's overall the narrative is speaking. They have like a a lot of complexity in the characters. A lot of there's not just a two dimensional villain. As, as far as the main villains go. So you have a three-dimensional Azula where she seems like this a manipulator, an evil manipulator, but she, you learn that she has problems and she has uh, weaknesses and she has her own uh, priorities and uh, flaws and everything. Same thing goes for pretty much all the main characters. The only one that's really two-dimensional would, would be Ozai. He's just a bad guy. Mm. Uh, which is which is fine, but he's uh, every they they focus their narrative structures on everything else. They focus their, their narrative character development on everyone else on the, the you know the Zulas, the, the the Mai Ang, and the gang. I think they call it the gang for as as a group. And 
all the stories, all the fleshing out, the world building, all that good stuff. So narratively, narratively speaking, as a whole, it's it's a complete cycle. You have the cycles of Aang and his development over time, Sokka, uh, Katara. All of them have their own uh, cycles of development. Maybe the least of all might be Toph, but she does change a little bit. She does open up. She goes starts off as someone who is standoffish and becomes someone who trusts friends more and trusts other people more. And narratively, it's sound. And it's, uh, it tells a, a great story, great development. It, every time it ends, it ends on something huge. It ends on something that really changes the game. And I think it's a it's nice, uh, tight story with only three seasons. So you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there's so much, there's a lot of good things about it. The relationships, the, the, the trials they go through, the things they develop. It's, uh, it's overall fantastic work. And there we have it. <laughs> That's because uh, what I, what I was trying to uh, obviously achieve mm -hmm. with this was to um, have my grievances aired while having someone to advocate for the show, and I think the, the people who are looking for that have have got hopefully what they want. Because I um I'm really not passionate about Avatar, so I don't um, have much of a drive to do anything else. I was just I was hoping to talk about some of these things and uh, move on to whatever else. Because I'm not going to make a video on Avatar, I, uh, nor am I... I might reference it, you know, in, in, in a positive or negative light in future, who knows. Um, but I don't... Right. Like, like a, I don't have a, a need to sort of uh, go on, go in-depth and out. You know, like with Star Wars, I get very uh, passionate, because <laughs> I watched that when, since I was super young, um, which and all the way up to now, and I just... So I'm fully invested. Well, this I, I literally saw once, and it was after many recommendations. I really don't have an attachment to it, so... But I know people wanted to hear what my issues were, so hopefully that's um, that's been done, and they've been presented to uh, somebody who very much likes the show and and defended uh, to different degrees. So yeah, um, I guess thank you very much for having this conversation. Do you want to um, talk a bit about your uh, well, anything you want actually? You can maybe talk about your channel. And just cover. I mean, just cover uh, literaturedevil.com. Oh, not no, literaturedevil.com, but literaturedevil. <laughs> On YouTube, there is a literaturedevil.com. It's a blog, but uh, it's I scarcely update it. I want to update it more, but mm -hmm. it does exist. I do still own the domain. <laughs> I'll say that. But I literature devil on YouTube, and I cover uh, story development. I cover different uh, things like Star Wars comics. Uh, I talk about story theory, narrative the narrative theory, character development, and uh, are we watching movies wrong? That was one of the oh. recent ones I put out. Well, I mean, we are. <laughs> let's, let's, let's yeah, ob obviously, about. we're watching movies wrong. Uh, we're just uh, we're just terrible at watching them, which is why Ryan Johnson is actually a genius. We're all just dumb. Mm -hmm. We're all just dumb. Um, we have to learn how to watch movies. We need to watch. We need to have a class where we can learn how to watch movies correctly. So yeah, there'll be a link to uh, Literature Devil's YouTube channel in the description, as well as the um, the was it a was it a GoFundMe that we talked about? Oh, there's a. Indiegogo, the comic Indiegogo, for Doctor Alpha, yeah. Miracle Child. Yeah, still, still in demand. Still um, in demand. And and I'm sure we'll have you back on EFAP uh, in the near future, especially with uh, everybody's probably going to be staying in now. <laughs> nice and comfy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah thanks a lot for uh, for coming on and talking for this long. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, hope you enjoyed all, and we shall see you next time. <laughs>